As Peter Parker of Earth-199999, MCU, dies shortly after being bitten by a radioactive spider, another soul takes his place. A teenager who self-deleted due to his tragic life gets a second chance in the body of everyone's favorite neighborhood Spider-Man. Male lead, Peter Parker or Spider-Man, Tom Holland. Female lead, Michelle Jones or MJ, Zendaya. P.S. I've changed the timeline a little. Peter, 15 years old, will get his powers in 2010. A few months before, Iron Man 1 takes place on his first day of high school, when the story starts. Also, Peter is 6 feet tall instead of Tom Holland's 5 feet 8 inches. No harem, by the way. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was In Marvel As Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 1. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Queens, New York, 2010. Beep beep beep. In a small, but homey, apartment in Queens, New York, a 15-year-old teenager sleeps like a brick in his small and dimly lit bedroom. He has dark brown hair and light Caucasian skin. If his eyes were opened, anyone could see his brown eyes, which matched his hair. Beep beep beep, the alarm clock on the bedside table blares loudly, filling the room with its obnoxious tune. Knock knock, Peter. Knocking is heard as a female voice yells from outside the bedroom door. Peter, it's time for school. Unluckily, none of this woke the sleeping boy. Soon enough, the door opened and in came a beautiful woman dressed in nurse scrubs. She looked to be in her mid to low thirties. Her hair, eyes, and skin tone were similar to the sleeping boy's. Possibly his mother or another relative. Peter, it's your first day of high school. She opens the curtains and sees Peter more clearly in the light. What the? As the morning light filled the room, she could see the sleeping teenager, laying in a puddle of his own sweat. He looked healthy and slept soundly, yet his sheets, blanket, and pillows were soaked in sweat. It was as if he slept in a sauna last night. Peter! She exclaims and dashes towards the bed, placing her hand on his head to check for a fever. Please tell me you didn't do any drugs. Not feeling a fever, she pulls the blanket off to check his body and sees something new, at least to her. Has he been exercising? She mutters. Peter, who took care of himself but didn't go to the gym or anything like that, now had slim yet defined muscles everywhere. He looked like he belonged in a CrossFit commercial. Peter. She shakes him, ready to get some answers or call 911 if he doesn't wake up. Ah. Uh, huh? Peter mutters as he opens his eyes. Blinded by the morning sun coming through the window, he covers his eyes and sits up. Who's Peter? Where am I? What time is it? Peter Benjamin Parker. What drugs did you take? She exclaims. After hearing that he didn't know his own name, her imagination got the best of her as the worst possibilities played out in her mind. Huh? Did I take anything? The boy himself was wondering the same, as he didn't know where he was, nor did he feel the usual aches in his leg like always. As his eyes got used to the light of the room, he looked up and saw a beautiful woman he had a sort of crush on. Insert picture of MCU Aunt May here, Aunt May. He mutters as he starts to think he may be high on something. What are you doing here? He was a big fan of Spider-Man and loved the MCU's version of Aunt May. She was the epitome of a MILF, and he respected that over the granny in the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies. I live here, Peter. May says as she looks at him like he was an idiot. Idea. Peter says as he looks around the room. Uh, can you give me a minute? No, it's your first day of high school today, but based on whatever this is dash, May points to the sweat-soaked bed. Maybe it's best to call in sick and schedule a doctor's appointment? She asks with a contemplative look. Not sure what's going on. Peter decides to just play along until he can have some alone time to think. Um, don't you have work? He asks, trying to find an excuse to be alone. Yes, I do but if you're sick I can call in and the hospital would understand, hopefully. She says with a skeptical look. No, go to work. They need you there more than me. I'll go to school. Peter says reassuringly. I just need a good shower and I'll be fine. I think I had food poisoning last night, but it's gone now. Oh no. Do you think it was the Chinese we ordered? She asks worriedly. Probably not or you would have been sick as well. Peter says, surprised by his acting skills at this point. 
True, I wonder what you ate. If I didn't know you better, I'd say you overdosed on drugs or something. She says as she gives him one last look before heading towards the door. Get your butt in the shower and be quick about it. You have to leave in an hour and I have to go even sooner. Yes ma'am. Peter calls out as she leaves the room. And put your sheets in the wash. May calls out on her way to the kitchen. Ignoring her words, Peter, or the person that is now Peter quickly finds the bathroom and locks himself inside. Turning on the lights, he's shocked to see a Tom Holland lookalike staring back at him through the mirror. Insert picture of Tom Holland here, a slash n, p.s., he's six feet tall in this story. What the hell is going on? He muttered, not wanting to arouse suspicion from Aunt May. Waving to himself in the mirror and doing other weird movements to be sure this wasn't fake, the now named Peter Benjamin Parker was shocked beyond belief. Yesterday he was a poor orphan teenager with a dead right leg. His leg was crushed in a car accident that killed his parents, rendering his favored leg useless. Before today, he had to limp and hobble with a cane wherever he went. Not only that but the pain and aches that came along with his new disability were horrible. Though, now all of that is gone. No limping or pain anywhere. His leg, if you can even call it his is in better than perfect shape. In fact, his entire body is in perfect shape. After admiring his body and basking in the feeling of painlessness, John, or maybe it's Peter now, started wondering how this happened. Am I dreaming? He thought as he pinched himself as any other would do in this situation. Ouch. Okay, I'm not dreaming. After his body starts to calm down a bit, Peter noticed how thirsty he was. It felt like his mouth was made out of sandpaper, or he slept in the middle of a hot desert with his mouth wide open. This is probably because of the sweat from earlier, he thought as he turned on the sink and started drinking from his hands. After a minute of drinking, a knock is heard at the door. Knock knock, I don't hear the shower running. Are you okay, Peter? Aunt May asks worriedly. Yeah, I'm fine. I was just brushing my teeth. Peter says as he opens the cabinet and grabs what he believes to be his toothbrush. Suddenly, as he takes the toothbrush, the nearby glass cup, presumably used for gargling, gets knocked over and falls out of the cabinet. Out of nowhere, Peter feels this odd tingling feeling and with one swift movement, he grabbed the cup before it could hit the sink and shatter. Alright, but be quick alright? If you want to eat breakfast before leaving, then put some pep in your step. May says as she returns to the kitchen. Looking down at the cup in his hand, Peter came to a startling yet exciting conclusion. Am I Spider-Man? He mutters as he tries to set the cup down but can't. It stuck to his hand somehow. Weird sense thing, sticky hands, Peter Parker, Aunt May. Tom Holland. Everything just made so much sense at that moment. He somehow became Peter Parker, but he doesn't know how. The last thing he could remember as John was. Oh? Yeah. Peter mutters in a sad realization. In his past life, he remembers taking a bunch of his pain medication and falling asleep. I killed myself, huh? He thought as he sadly stared at himself in the mirror. Ever since he was in the accident and lost his use of his leg and his family, John, now named Peter, became depressed. He couldn't do anything without the pain of his leg reminding him of his dead parents, nor could he deal with the bullying his impairment brought him to school. Bullies loved to pick on the odd one of the bunch and his bum leg certainly made him stand out. Not to mention the fact that his parents' savings were running low, and he couldn't hold a job and attend school with his leg problems. He could barely afford the medications. Sadly, he took his own life in the most painless form possible. Overdose on painkillers. It was easy as he didn't even need to search for his executioner. He already had that in a bottle and delivered to him whenever he ran out. Truthfully, he regretted it a few minutes after taking the handful of pills. His life wasn't all bad. He had hobbies and friends that were always there for him, but unluckily he was already getting drowsy by that point. He fell asleep trying to make himself throw up, but it was already too late. He died shortly after passing out. His heart stopped beating and the rest of his body followed suit. Though, I don't think I regret it anymore. Peter muttered as he stared at himself in the mirror. Looking down at the cup attached to his hand, Peter tries to control his spider powers and once again sets the cup down in the sink. Still, he couldn't get the cup out of his hand, but after a few more tries it came loose and sat in the middle of the sink. Staring at his hands, Peter saw nothing wrong with them whatsoever. Though he couldn't say the same about his wrists. On the underside of each wrist right below the hand is a small hole. As he was inspecting the hole in his right wrist, a white substance shot out and covered Peter's eyes. Ah! He yelps and pulls the sticky web from his face, looking down at it in wonder. Luckily, Aunt May didn't hear him yell, so he didn't have to make something up again. Deciding that it may be best to just take a shower and worry about this later, Peter opens the shower curtain and turns the valve, shooting water from the shower head. But, as he twisted the valve,
Peter put a bit too much power into it and the knob broke off like it was made of styrofoam or cardboard. Oops. After cleaning up and fixing the valve the best he could, Peter got dressed, ate his breakfast, and saw Aunt May off before taking the subway to the 36th Avenue station, which is right next to Midtown High. Walking up to the school, Peter takes in the site of Midtown School of Science and Technology, also known as Midtown Technical High School. Seeing all the students hustle and bustle into the entrances, looking their best and ready for the first day of school, Peter couldn't help but feel excited. He never liked high school in his past life. Even before his parents died and the bullying started, school life was never a fun or exciting thing for him, yet this time around Peter is ready to seize the day and enjoy himself to the fullest. Peter decided on the train that he wouldn't waste this second chance. No other person that commits suicide gets these kinds of perks, at least he doesn't think they do, so Peter would live his new life however he pleases and make the best of every situation. Walking inside, Peter went straight to the main office and asked for his schedule. He couldn't find it before he left but knew it wasn't a big deal. The staff in the office only had to look up his name and print his schedule. It took less than a minute. They also gave Peter his locker number and combination. Thankfully, the old Peter was a prepared person and already packed a backpack for him to take, which he appreciated. After a quick trip to his locker to drop off some books, Peter heads down the hall looking for his first class of the day. On his way down the hall, a slick-haired teenager with an evil grin pops out from behind a locker and tries to purposefully bump into Peter, who was looking at his schedule. Flash Thompson. Insert picture of MCU Flash here, what's up Penis Parker? The slick-haired teen greets loudly just as he was about to bump into Peter, drawing everyone's attention. Peter didn't need his spidey senses to know what was going on, but instead of stepping away, Peter puts a bit more power into his next step. Bang, Erga. Flash gets sent tumbling backward and grunts in pain as he hits the floor. Oh, hey Flash. Peter looks up from his schedule for a moment before swiftly walking past the fallen bully, acting like nothing happened. What the hell just happened? Flash muttered as he grabs his shoulder in pain. Everyone who saw it, thanks to Flash's loud greeting, was rather amused. Most of the first years knew Flash and Peter, who has always been Flash's punching bag, so seeing the little guy win for once was certainly surprising and refreshing. They just wondered if it would last and what Flash would do to get back at him later on. To these teenagers, this is the peak entertainment. Of course, Peter didn't plan on being a punching bag anymore. He didn't care for being popular, partying, or anything like that. The one thing that he'll put his foot down on is being bullied. Especially by such a shitty version of Flash Thompson. Back to Peter, he found his class and took a seat near the window. No one else has arrived yet so he simply waits patiently for class to start. Up until now, everything has led Peter to believe that he's in the MCU. His apartment, Aunt May, his appearance, Flash's appearance, and even the school is an exact replica. He has a few options laid out before him. Of course, Peter planned to collect the Infinity Stones or destroy them as a last resort. They are far too dangerous to be left to whoever gets their hands on them. He also should give the Ancient One a visit. She would make a good ally and maybe he could learn some of the mystic arts if he's able to. So far that's all the plans Peter has set in stone. Everything else is up for debate. Maybe he'll contact S.H.I.E.L.D. and learn some martial arts from them, but he's sure that would come with a price, so it may not be the smartest idea. Though, he could use that connection to find information about the Tesseract. As Peter is thinking of future plans while looking out the window, in walks a chubby Filipino teenager. He scans the room and immediately beelines straight to Peter's desk. Dude, is it true? He sits in front of Peter and turns to look at him questioningly. What? Peter asks on reflex as he turns to see his new classmate. Ned leads, Peter Parker's best friend. Insert picture of MCU Ned here, what do you mean what? Ned starts acting as if something epic happened. Is it true you got one over on Flash? Everyone is talking about it. Huh? Yeah, I guess. Peter says with a shrug. He tried to bump into me so I bumped into him harder. Hearing these words out of his best friend's mouth, Ned's eyes go wide as his mouth hangs open. Close your mouth. Bugs will fly in. Peter says jokingly. Dude, Flash has been tormenting us since middle school started. I'm just amazed that we finally got one over him. Ned acts like Peter climbed the highest mountain and carried him the whole way. Relax, Ned. Peter tries to calm him down. We only bumped into each other and he's most likely going to do something about it. You're right? Ned finally understood the problem they have. Though it's not really a problem for Peter, he won't say that. Peter actually felt pretty comfortable with Ned. He reminds him of the few close friends he had in his past life. Before they could speak more about it, the class began to fill rapidly and the teacher arrived as well. 
Unsurprisingly, Ned, Flash, Liz Allen, and Michelle Jones are all in Peter's homeroom class. Elizabeth, Liz Allen, née Toombs, is the daughter of Adrian Toombs and Doris Toombs. Her father is the future alien weapons trafficker, Vulture. Insert picture of MCU Liz here, though, Peter doesn't have to worry about that until after the Chitauri invasion concludes. Liz was also Peter's crush in the first Spider-Man movie, but based on the look Ned gave him when she walked in, she was his crush here too. Well, not anymore. He's sure she's a nice girl but Peter has his sights set on another target so to speak. Speaking of, Peter turns his head to see Michelle Joan, otherwise known as MJ. She looks exactly like the actress that plays her in the movies, Zendaya. Insert picture of MJ slash Zendaya here, just like the granny version of Aunt May, Peter didn't like the MJ in the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, but this one is a million times better. Which is why he planned to ask her out on a date. Though not today. Peter has so much to do today. The second school ends, he plans to go to a secluded area and test out his new powers. Though he would have to be careful with surveillance cameras. That's how Tony Stark found his identity in the movies. Of course, that's not the only reason he's stalling to ask MJ out on a date. In both lives, Peter has never had a girlfriend. Let alone been on a date before. He was always too nervous and when he started getting the courage to do it in his past life, the accident happened and ruined everything. Also, Peter is currently broke and needs money for the date, which should be easily acquired with his newfound powers. He could simply ask Aunt May for cash but they don't seem like the wealthiest family. That's another plan to add to the top of the list. Find a way to steal some money unnoticed. Maybe pickpocket people in Manhattan? That would be the simplest and fastest way to get money. Or he could sneak into a bank and steal a few bands. Though that would be a bit too risky compared to pickpocketing. He only needs pocket money anyway. At least for now. As Peter went from class to class, he was met by the constant glare of Flash, who was thinking of any way possible to get back at him. Flash, at least in the MCU, didn't seem to physically bully Peter, he focused more on making fun of him with different types of verbal and psychological attacks. Though sometimes he'll get physical in minor ways like what happened this morning. While Peter was eating lunch with Ned, he saw Flash eating at the popular kid's table and laughing while pointing at him every once in a while, most likely making fun of Peter. If he wasn't a victim of far more drastic and physical bullying in his past life, Peter would probably be negatively affected by this, but compared to that, this type of bullying was nothing. Though that doesn't mean he would let it go unpunished, Peter would have to do that in a more sneaky fashion. He doesn't want to be expelled from school for beating Flash black and blue. He can do similar things to what happened this morning, or some pranks that don't implicate him. Peter will have to plan something out to humiliate Flash another day. Maybe after that he would learn some humility. Speaking of doing similar things like this morning, as Peter was putting away his lunch tray, Flash stuck his leg out and tried to trip him as he walked by. Easily catching this with his enhanced senses, Peter pretended to be oblivious and stomped on Flash's foot as he passed by. Arg! Flash grunted in pain and pulled his foot back instantly. Peter acted as if he didn't see a thing and kept walking, putting his tray away and returning to Ned, who watched the whole thing with a face full of awe and wonder. Dude, that was so cool. Ned said excitedly in a hushed voice as he stole glances at Flash, who was nursing his aching foot. What happened to you, Peter? Nothing much. Peter says with a shrug. I just decided that I wouldn't let Flash push me around this year. I want to enjoy my time without having to look over my shoulder or worry about what others say about me. Hearing Peter's little speech, Ned nodded along with him and became excited by every word. Yeah, I won't let him bully me either. Ned says in determination. Good for you, Ned. Peter pats him on the shoulder. Don't worry, I got your back. As the school day came to an end, Ned wanted to hang out after school, but Peter gave him a random excuse and dipped. Using his phone, Peter looks for abandoned buildings and tries his best to find the perfect training location. It took about an hour to find the best place, as Peter had to quadruple check that there were no cameras in the area. He doesn't mind Tony Stark knowing his true identity, but Peter would rather shield and by extension Hydra stay in the dark. Maybe someday he would grandly announce his identity like Tony Stark, but that would have to wait until he had more, money, resources, and the power to protect himself and those around him. Due to the cameras everywhere in New York, Peter had to use the basement of an abandoned warehouse. Thankfully, it was spacious and wasn't falling apart, like many of the other abandoned buildings he saw before this. As soon as he was done scouting out the area, Peter sent a text to Aunt May, explaining that he would be home late, and started testing out his powers. Spider-Man is said to have multiple powers. Superhuman strength. Superhuman speed. Superhuman reflexes. Superhuman durability. Healing factor. 
Dash spider sense alert. Heightened senses. Wall crawling. Web shooters, organic, starting with superhuman strength, Peter found many large heavy metal eye beams, which were usually used in construction, and tried lifting them. He lifted one and was surprised by how light it felt. It was as though the beam was one of those styrofoam movie props, disguised as the real thing. After a quick Google search, Peter found that an eye beam of this size weighs 520 pounds, so one fourth of a ton. Seeing as the first eye beam was easy, Peter made himself a makeshift extreme bench press with web and some eye beams. Webbing two eye beams together, Peter lay underneath and tried lifting them as if he were at the gym. Once again he found it pretty easy to lift, so Peter kept adding weight until he began to struggle. After many add-ons, Peter found that he could lift 40 eye beams at once, which totaled a little over 10 tons. Anything over that would cause Peter to strain a muscle and hurt himself. He could be able to up that 10-ton limit by doing some extreme weight lifting, but that would have to wait until he tested his other powers. Next, Peter moved on to testing his superhuman speed, running circles around the warehouse basement. Before starting he found an app that shows how fast you run, but sadly that app couldn't register his speed. Most likely thinking he's in a car or something. Thankfully, there were a few apps that tell you how fast you bike, which had a much higher threshold and was able to track his speed. Which was higher than he thought possible at around 100 miles per hour, which is a little over 4 times faster than Usain Bolt. Reflexes, heightened senses, and spider senses were harder to test but still possible. Peter took softball-sized rocks and hung them on webs from the ceiling. Pushing each rock, causing them to swing erratically and create an odd death trap of swinging rocks in the center of the warehouse basement. After his booby trap was finished, Peter stepped in with his eyes closed and trusted his senses. The tingling feeling returned and Peter trusted it, dodging up, down, right, left, forward, and back. His enhanced senses and reflexes combined with his spider sense made him look like a skilled dancer as he smoothly weaved in and around the death trap. Next, Peter stood completely still in the center of the swinging rocks, allowing them to crash into different parts of his body. This is testing his superhuman durability and healing factor, which was something he dreaded but sadly it had to be done. After being hit by a few dozen ham-fist-sized rocks, they lost their momentum and hung limply from the ceiling. Stepping out of the hanging rock section of the warehouse, Peter saw that he barely had a mark on his body, and any mark he had already started fading away. Though he couldn't say the same about his clothes, which were now ripped in certain areas. Damn, what should I tell Aunt May? Peter muttered as he thought it would have been smarter to take off his clothes beforehand. Maybe I'll pickpocket some rich guy on the way home and buy some new clothes. He could sneak in through his bedroom window and change clothes, but who knows how many cameras are outside his apartment building. Speaking of cameras, Peter would have to find a way to deal with that problem. Living in the modern world is hard as an up-and-coming superhero. Tony Stark used Jarvis to find his identity far too easily in the movies, so maybe he needs some type of technology that scrambles a camera's picture when he's within a certain distance. Maybe a magical item that renders him invisible to a camera could work too? For either of those options to work, Peter would need some extra help. For the technological route, he could probably make it himself, as he was fairly smart even in his past life. That combined with his new genius Parker brain should make him capable enough to make it. Sadly, the parts he would need may be unavailable to the general public or simply hard to obtain. Peter would have to get some help, and Tony Stark would probably be that person. Making it with Tony Stark's help would also speed up his work time and enhance the end product by a lot. Not to mention the fact that Peter needs a Spider-Man suit, which could be made a lot quicker with Tony's help. Though Peter's unsure if he should meet Tony this early on. It may be better to wait until he returns from captivity as a more responsible man. The magical route would be impossible as he has no idea how that would even work, which means he would have to ask the Ancient One for help. He already planned to visit her anyway, so this may be the best bet. Finally, moving on to the last two powers on the list, Peter shot webs from his wrists and started crawling and walking on the walls and ceiling. He didn't have room to test web swinging, but that can be done outside when the camera scrambler is acquired. With every one of his powers tested, Peter checked his phone and saw 10 texts and 2 missed calls from his Aunt May. Mostly concerning when he would be home and why he isn't answering her. Checking the time, Peter saw that it was almost 10 p.m., which isn't that bad but the old Peter probably didn't stay out very late. Sigh, I don't think I have time to buy new clothes. On his way home, Peter managed to pickpocket a few men in nice suits. He didn't want to rob poor people as they have no money and he would feel bad, so he kept his targets to the wealthier looking men. Women usually kept their money in purses, which would be harder and more noticeable when stolen, so he stayed away from them as well. Thanks to his enhanced senses and reflexes, P. 
Peter didn't bother taking their wallets and simply emptied them before placing them back in his rich victim's pockets. He would brush shoulders with someone, snatch their wallet, pocket the cash, and slip the wallet back to them. When he arrived back at his apartment, Aunt May was in the living room watching Korean dramas with her phone nearby. As soon as she saw him walk in, she muted the TV and looked at him expectantly. Okay, what's going on? She asks from her seat on the couch. What do you mean? Peter asks, hoping to avoid whatever is going on. You have this weird sickness this morning, then you stay out longer than you ever have before? Not to mention the rips in your shirt and jeans. Something is up. Now spill. Aunt May looks him up and down. I, uh. Making a split-second decision, Peter comes up with a good excuse. I got an off-the-books job to pay for a date, but I haven't asked the girl out yet. May looks into Peter's eyes, searching for any deception. That's it? Yeah, this morning was just food poisoning though. Peter adds with a shrug. What about your clothes? She says gesturing to Peter's ripped outfit. I was working on a construction site. Peter explains easily. Huh, so that's why you're more muscular now. May mutters as she stands and walks up to Peter before wrapping him in her arms. Please don't hide things from me. I thought you were in trouble or doing drugs. If you needed money, you could always ask me. You don't have to get a dangerous construction job. I'm sorry, May. Peter said as he hugged her back. Don't worry, today was my last day of work. I've saved up enough money to last a while. He felt bad for Aunt May. She technically lost her nephew, or son since she raised him, and now someone else has taken his place. At this moment, Peter swore to himself that he would take care of May as thanks to the old Peter. As they separated, Aunt May looked at him with an inquisitive smirk. So, who's the lucky girl? She asks like a paparazzi ready to get her scoop. I'll bring her over sooner or later. You'll find out then. Peter says as he heads toward the bathroom. What? You can't just drop something like this on me and walk away. I need to know. May follows him with a pout on her face. Well, you'll just have to be patient. Peter says with a smirk as he closes the bathroom door in her face. One week later, after a full week of school and training in the warehouse basement, Peter was finally ready to meet the Ancient One. If he wanted to safely become Spider-Man without worrying about risking his everyday life and the safety of people like May, Ned, and eventually MJ, then Peter would need her help. During this past week, Peter found out that he could enhance his already ridiculous powers with exercise. Though because of his already crazy level of strength, that exercise is something that would flatten the best bodybuilder in seconds. He also has his powers completely under control at this point. It took a little training, but he doesn't break things on accident or hear slash smell things at a crazy level anymore. Though he can if he tries. The underground warehouse has been renovated into a makeshift gym. Peter already had the extreme bench press, so he just needed to add on with other equipment made from random junk and held together by his webbing, which he found is extremely durable. There is so much web in that basement that it actually looks like a spider's lair, ready to trap any prey that wanders in. Other than that, Peter has used his stolen money to update his wardrobe a bit. He didn't mind the old Peter style, but he wanted to bring a bit of his old self into this new life of his, which pretty much consisted of hoodies, joggers, jeans, white shirts, and a pair of white Nike Air Maxes. Ned was surprised by his change in clothes, while May gave a few good comments about how he looked recently. The only problem Peter has had this week, if you can even call him that, was Flash who kept trying to mess with him and failed horribly. On Wednesday, he tried to pick on Ned, since he couldn't do anything to Peter, but Ned wasn't having it. He followed in Peter's footsteps and ignored Flash completely, and since Ned is almost always with Peter at school, any minor physical bullying was thwarted by Peter at every turn. Sadly, Peter has been too busy to put together a prank on Flash, but it would come soon enough. After school was out on Friday, Peter said goodbye to Ned and took the subway to the New York Sanctum. The Sanctum Sanctorum is located on 177A, Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village, New York City. Standing outside the big double doors, Peter nervously knocked. He would be meeting the strongest person on earth, the Sorcerer Supreme. Otherwise, known as the Ancient One. As the door creaked open, a Caucasian man in monk robes peeks his head out. Can I help you? He asks in a New York-style accent. Ah. I'm here to meet with the Ancient One. Do I need to schedule an appointment or? Peter asks nervously. Huh? The man says as he looks at Peter weirdly. Please come inside. I'll contact the Ancient One for you. As the man opens the door, Peter walks in and admired the architecture of the big open entrance hall. Thank you. Should I just wait here? Peter asks as the monk rushes off, leaving him standing there. All right, I'll just stay here. Feeling curious as he waits, Peter walked around the entrance area, looking for anything interesting or possibly magical. 
Sadly, they don't seem to leave anything like that just laying around, which makes sense. After waiting a few minutes, the monk came running back out of breath. T the Ancient One will see you now. He pants for breath as he motions for Peter to follow him. Taking a stance and making a circular motion with his hand, a golden spark appears in the air and forms a large circle. In the center of the circle appears an entirely different location. Wow, is that a portal? Peter exclaims as he walks up to it and puts his hand in and out. He has seen this in the movies but it's a different experience in real life. I hope I'm able to learn the mystic arts. Follow me. The monk says as he steps into the portal. Following him through, Peter teleported all the way across the world to Kathmandu, Nepal and Kumar Taj. He didn't know that for sure but the room he appeared in looked very similar to the one Doctor Strange first met the Ancient One in all her baldness. There were tables set up around the room and a couple masters dressed in robes sat and drank tea. The Ancient One was nowhere to be found, so Peter turned around to ask the monk that guided him, but he was already gone. Um, hello. Peter turns back to one of the serious looking monks. Is the Ancient One on her way? Sadly, he doesn't get an answer, so Peter concluded that they may not speak English. After waiting an awkward couple of minutes, someone else finally arrived. Thank you for keeping my guest company master Simone and Chow. You may return to your duties. The Ancient One rounds a corner and enters the room. Insert picture of her grand baldness here, yes, ma'am. No problem, Master Ancient One. Both of the masters say as they bow and leave the room. They spoke English that entire time? Peter asks rhetorically with a confused look. Turning to the Ancient One, Peter gives her a small bow. Hello, do you play jokes like this on all of your visitors? Yes, especially the interesting ones. She says as she takes a seat at a table and grabs a waiting tea kettle. Would you like some tea? Ah, uh, sure thanks. As Peter sits across from the Ancient One, she waves her hand, conjuring a tea set for them to use. Cool. Mr. Parker, it seems we have much to speak about. The Ancient One says as she pours Peter and herself a cup of tea. You can call me Peter. He says as he puts two cubes of sugar and a splash of milk in his cup. Peter it is. She nodded and took a sip of her tea. Could you tell me why you're here? Does she not know? Peter thought as he took a sip of his tea as well. The Ancient One was known to look into the many possible futures using the Time Stone, yet based on her question, she didn't see Peter's arrival coming. This is good for him, as Peter would rather she didn't know about him taking over Peter's body. She may overreact and think of him as a threat to the Earth or something, and a pissed off Ancient One isn't something he is capable of dealing with. I came to ask for your help. Peter says plainly as he sips his tea. How can I help you, Peter? The Ancient One asks. I was recently bitten by an odd spider and got some weird powers. Peter says as he shoots a web up above him, pulling himself up to the ceiling and crawling around a bit before returning to his seat. Okay, how can I help you with this? She asks with a raised brow. The Ancient One didn't know everything about the world or the universe, but she knew all the major possibilities that could happen in her lifetime and slightly after, yet she had no knowledge of the situation. The feeling of not knowing was uncomfortable yet refreshing for someone like her who hasn't been surprised in a very long time. This whole situation truly threw her for a loop. I plan to use my powers to help people, but I've noticed how many cameras are in New York. If I dress up in a disguise and run around the city as a sort of vigilante, it would only be a matter of time before a security camera caught me either unmasked or returning home. Peter explains. I see, and you think I can help with this? The Ancient One says as she crosses her legs. Well, you are the strongest person on earth. It was either you or Tony Stark and he doesn't seem very reliable. Peter says with a shrug. Okay, I can help with this, but I want you to tell me how you knew to come here. You could say that I'm a very informed person, yet I didn't expect your arrival. The Ancient One agreed but gave Peter a stipulation. I'm sorry but I can't tell you that. If I were to give an answer, it would be a lie and I wouldn't be surprised if you could somehow tell if I lie. Peter refuses respectfully. Hmm, it seems we've arrived at an impasse. The Ancient One smiles as she sips her tea. She is enjoying this. There has to be something else I can do for you in exchange? Peter asks as he places his empty teacup down. Hmm, perhaps. The Ancient One says as she stands from her seat. Follow along. As they leave the room, the Ancient One leads Peter to a crowded courtyard. Many people dressed in monk robes seem to be trying and failing to open a portal, like the one he came through earlier. Ah, uh, do you want me to help with their practice or something? Maybe bring them towels and water? Peter asks questioningly. No, Peter. The Ancient One smirked and handed him a bronze sling ring. You are going to join them. Um, I don't get it. Peter says as he takes the offered along ring on reflex. How is this an even exchange? It seems like I get to learn magic and your help. 
It's a win-win for me but not so much for you, isn't it? Oh, on the contrary. I get a capable master who's connected to the web of life and destiny. You would make a formidable master of the mystic arts. What comes with this opportunity is a responsibility to protect the earth and its inhabitants from otherworldly magical forces and powerful dimensional entities. Are you prepared to take that responsibility? The Ancient One asks as their conversation turns deadly serious. What the hell is the web of life and destiny? Is that a Spider-Man thing I don't know about? Peter thought as he looked at the Ancient One questioningly. What's the web of life and destiny? I'm afraid you'll have to learn that in your studies. That is if you accept my offer of course. She says with a small smirk. Peter didn't know much about Marvel, as he mostly watched the movies, but he could tell that this web thing has to be related to Spider-Man in some way. Which means it's connected to him. Fine, I'm willing to help when I'm needed, but if other masters can deal with the problem I'd rather not be bothered. Peter agrees with a small stipulation. Hmm, that sounds agreeable. The Ancient One says and holds out her hand. Do we have an accord? Peter was about to shake her hand, but he pulled back last minute as a moment of greed took over. Hmm, can I sneak in a magically enchanted spider-style suit for my hero gig? Nothing crazy. Maybe make it extremely durable so I don't have to fix or replace it. You can add the anti-camera thing to it as well. Peter says as he hesitates to shake her outstretched hand. Sure, I would be honored to make Spider-Man's first superhero suit. She agrees easily, and Peter immediately takes her hand. Spider-Man? I like that. Peter pretends not to know his own future. Having the Ancient One create the suit would save Peter days of sewing and stitching it together himself. The best part about this is the fact that she's seen the future and already knows what it's supposed to look like. Not to mention the cool enchantments that she would add to it. Peter couldn't wait to see what she does. After coming to an agreement, Peter joined his fellow students in sling ring practice without much direction from the Ancient One. In fact, she left him there to learn on his own. Copying the stance and motions of those around him and picturing the top of Mount Everest, Peter slips his new sling ring on and tries his best. On his first try, a golden spark appeared and drew half a circle before fizzling out and disappearing. He may have failed, but the feeling of using magic for the first time was euphoric. Peter was worried that he wouldn't be capable of learning the mystic arts or that the Ancient One wouldn't allow it, but here he is about to open a magical portal. Ha, huh, this may be easier than I thought. After an hour of practice, Peter was so close to drawing a full circle with the golden energy. Taking a quick break, Peter asked a few of his fellow students some questions and learned that the golden energy is called Eldritch Energy, which is a type of dimensional energy. So, he's currently practicing Eldritch Magic. Eldritch Magic, which is utilized by the masters of the mystic arts, is a light-based magic that produces sparks and fiery energy in a yellow-slash-orange color palette. This energy is capable of giving off not only light, but also warmth. Being highly versatile, it can be used to generate constructs of tangible energy, such as melee weapons and shields, as well as to cast spells by conjuring specific formations and geometric patterns with the fiery energy. The practice of opening a portal with the help of a sling ring is technically the easiest thing that can be done with Eldritch Energy. Which Peter found odd as they were technically bypassing space and maybe even time with what they were doing. After getting this explanation from his fellow students, Peter got back to work. On his next try, he put all of the knowledge and feelings he had into one last go of it. He had to get home soon or Aunt May would start to worry. Not to mention the fact that he doesn't have cell service here, so he's currently unable to contact her. With his mind set on his destination, Peter took the stance and slowly waved his hand in a circle. Golden Eldritch energy sparked to life and steadily formed a full circle in front of him. As the two ends of the circle connected, the center warped into the image of a snowy mountain peak. Ha 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 ha. Laughing like a madman, Peter jumped through the portal and admired the view. I did it. As Peter was basking in his success on a cold mountain peak, he heard someone clear their throat behind him. Ahem. Turning around, Peter sees the Ancient One smiling at him from the other side of the portal. Congratulations, Peter. Though we should close the portal. Your fellow students are a bit more susceptible to the cold than you are. Hearing her say this, Peter looked behind the Sorcerer Supreme and sees everyone keeping their distance from the portal and rubbing their hands together for warmth. Each of them was shaking slightly from the freezing air that made its way through the portal he opened. Oh, sorry. Peter says as he leaps back through the portal and tries to close it, but no matter what he did it wouldn't close. Um, how do I close it? Sighing in exasperation, the Ancient One moves her hands in a circular motion. A spell circle draws itself in front of her and all sorts of runes appear on it. Once it was finished, the spell circle morphed into a dome that encased her, Peter, and his portal inside. 
Instantly, the area outside the dome warmed up and the students sighed in relief before returning back to their practice. Alright, now that they aren't freezing to death, you can close the portal. The Ancient One says as she motions toward the portal. Ah, uh, can I get a hint? Peter asked, but the Ancient One merely sat on the floor and began to meditate, ignoring him completely. I guess the cold doesn't bother her. After a good ten minutes, Peter was able to successfully close the portal. It was actually far easier than he thought. His problem was simply overthinking. Peter thought that he had to move his hand and slowly close it, but all he had to do was think of it disappearing and it would. Well, that took you long enough. The Ancient One says as she stands from her meditative pose, dispelling the dome that protected the other students. Yeah, though it would have been faster if you told me how to do it. Peter says as he sees the ice and snow that filled the area. Luckily, he was very resistant to the cold, which is something he didn't know about his spider powers. Though that doesn't mean he doesn't feel the cold a little. The Ancient One must have something that's protecting her as well because she looked even less affected than he was. Magic, in a way, is an advanced science, but it's also a feeling. You will learn faster if you trust that feeling. In a lot of your future training, I won't explain everything and let you learn on your own. The Ancient One explains. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Peter shrugged as he was new to this whole magic thing. Good, now that you've learned to use the sling ring, we can move on to the next step of your training. She says, but Peter raises his hand as if he was in school. What? I need to get home soon. My aunt May will be back from work soon. Peter explained his time constraints. Sigh, this is why we don't take in students under 18 years of age. The Ancient One mutters under her breath, but Peter could hear her thanks to his super senses. The time constraints always make teaching them a hassle. Time constraints? You have the literal time infinity stone. Time should be the least of your problems. Peter thought as he scratched the back of his neck. Yeah, I have school and my aunt isn't used to me staying out too late. She's been getting better with it but it's a slow process. No, don't worry about it. I say that, but it's not that much of a problem. We'll just have to come up with a schedule for you. She says, motioning for Peter to follow her. Returning to the room where he met the Ancient One, Peter saw what he believes to be his Spider-Man suit. It was laid out on one of the wooden tables and looked better than he imagined it would. It was similar to the original Spider-Man suit in that it is red and blue with some webbing design on some of the red sections. Though it was different from what he thought she would make. You made it already? Peter asked excitedly as he dashes to the table at breakneck speed. With the enchantments too? It didn't have any markings that would lead him to believe it was enchanted. No runes, spell circles, or anything like that. Yes, something like this is easy. It took me five minutes to make. The Ancient One brags a bit as she enjoys Peter's reaction to her work. Wow, you're amazing. I knew it was better to come here rather than Stark. Peter praises her work as he reaches out to touch the suit. As soon as his hand touched the suit, gold spell circles along with runes covered every inch of the suit. After a moment, the suit was sucked up into Peter's hand and disappeared. Ah, uh, what just happened? Peter says as he looks back and forth between the now empty table and his empty hand. The suit is bound to you now. Simply think of it and the suit will appear. The Ancient One explains. All right, here it goes. Peter mutters as he thinks of the suit. Suddenly, the clothes he's wearing are instantly replaced by his brand new superhero suit, which surprisingly has a hood. Though, Peter didn't mind one bit. Seeing Peter looking down at his hands and legs, the Ancient One waves her hand, and a body-sized mirror appeared in front of him. That's so cool, Peter says in awe and wonder. I'm glad you like my work, Dash, the Ancient One says as she stands beside him, looking at his suit in the mirror. But that's not all it does. The suit is made to be resistant to most things, like water, fire, tearing, cutting, etc. It's also enchanted to increase that resistance by a bit. Though, don't get too cocky. Enough damage would be able to break through the suit, but it will regenerate back to new a few hours after the damaged happens. It's made to last, not as a sort of protective armor. Do you understand? Yeah, don't overly rely on the suit to protect me. I get it. Peter nods his head as he puts up his hood. Damn, the hood was a nice touch. Yes, I thought you'd like it. The Ancient One smiles as she watches him make random poses in the mirror. Now onto what you originally asked for. Suddenly, the Ancient One takes a smartphone out of her robe, which surprises Peter to no extent. You have a smartphone? He asks with the shock clear in his voice. Yeah, did you think I would be some old-fashioned monk that knows nothing of the modern age? She asks in a challenging tone. I mean, truthfully, yeah. Can I have your phone number? Peter asks, and the Ancient One shakes her head as she takes a picture of Peter with her phone. Look at this. 
She turns the phone to Peter, showing him a picture of the room without him in it at all. The suit is invisible to all cameras, but you can turn that off and on at will. Think of turning it off. Peter does as she says and feels a slight vibration run through the suit. As the vibration disappears, the Ancient One takes another picture and shows it to him. This time he was completely visible. If you look in the bottom right corner of your right eye, you will see a small camera icon with an on and off icon next to it. The off part of it should be highlighted right now. That's to prevent any confusion. She explains, and Peter sees exactly what she said. Wow, you really thought of everything. Peter praises her as he turns it back on and sees the icon highlight the one part now. When I make a deal, I intend to fulfill it to the utmost extent. The last thing to test is taking the suit off. Just think of the suit disappearing and it will. She explains, and Peter does as she says. Instantly, the Spider-Man suit is replaced by the clothes he was wearing earlier. The suit was nowhere to be seen. You've certainly outdone yourself. Peter says as he turns to the Ancient One and bows to her. Thank you. He knew that she was as old as dirt and bowing seemed like the best way to show his thanks. The other monks did it earlier when he met her, so he's just following their lead. You're very welcome, Peter. She says with a smile as she checks the time. I'm afraid I have duties to return to, so why don't you head home and return tomorrow morning? It's the weekend so you shouldn't have school, right? Yeah, sounds good. Peter instantly agrees as the Ancient One turns to leave. W wait. How do I leave here? Without saying a word, the Ancient One holds up her hand, showing Peter her sling ring as she turns the corner leaving Peter alone in the room. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Peter mutters as he looks down at his new sling ring. Checking the time on his phone, Peter saw that it was 4.47 p.m., which means Aunt May is still working at the hospital. Knowing he won't get caught, Peter used his new sling ring and opened a portal to his bedroom. Stepping inside, Peter drops his school bag as the portal closes behind him. Knowing Aunt May wouldn't be home yet, Peter went to the kitchen and started cooking dinner. He would be sneaking out for his first night as Spider-Man tonight, so he decided to spend some time with May before heading out. After making some chicken parmesan, Aunt May arrived home and kicked off her shoes with a tired look. Ugh, I can't wait to do nothing for the whole night. She exclaims as she slams the door behind her. Asterisk sniff sniff asterisk Peter. Are you cooking? Rushing to the kitchen, May saw Peter plating the chicken with a big bowl full of salad next to him. Ah, uh, what's going on Peter? She asks, eyeing the food suspiciously. I got home a bit earlier than you so I thought I should cook. Peter shrugged as he put the filled plates on the dining table. Peter doesn't know this, but the old Peter has tried to cook for May a few times in the past. During the first incident, he started a small grease fire that could have burned the apartment down if she wasn't there to put it out. On the last try, he went through many kitchen safety videos on YouTube but ended up giving himself and his Aunt May food poisoning. It's safe to say that seeing Peter cooking in the kitchen is a bit traumatizing for May. She didn't trust the food and she certainly doesn't trust that he won't burn the place down. Speaking of, after getting over her shock, May walked over to check the oven, stove top, toaster, microwave, and even the coffee machine to make sure that Peter didn't leave anything running. May, come eat. Peter said as he grabbed the salad and some utensils before heading back to the table. Um, Peter, May says nervously as she takes a seat in front of her plate. Peter was sitting across from her, ready to dig in. Are you sure you should be cooking? She was trying to be nice, but she wasn't ready for another bout of food poisoning. She had to take a few days off work the last time, which wouldn't have been bad if she wasn't in the bathroom for most of that time. What's going on? Is there something I don't know? Peter thought as he finally noticed May's odd behavior. He really hated that he didn't get the old Peter's memories. Peter has had a few moments like this, where the people around him know something that he doesn't. Luckily, he's been able to get past those situations without arousing any suspicion. Um, why? Peter asked. Let's not play dumb, Peter. Your track record in the kitchen isn't very stellar, to say the least. May says as she looks down at her food cautiously. Oh, I get it now. The old Peter was a shit cook. Finally understanding what's going on, Peter knows how to handle the situation. I promise that nothing is wrong with it this time. I followed a recipe and everything. I swear. After his promise was made, Aunt May hesitated for a moment before sighing and reluctantly cutting a piece of her chicken. She stared at the food on her fork for a good minute before trying it. As soon as she started to chew, May's face morphed from nervous horror to shocked bliss. Wow, it's actually good. May says after swallowing her first bite. Of course, it's good. I've been cooking my own meal since my parents died in my last life. Peter thought as he smiled at May's praise. Thanks, I gave it my all. After dinner, Peter watched some Korean dramas with May until she was ready for bed. 
Once she was in bed and he was sure she was asleep, Peter went to his room and locked the door. With a single thought, his clothes were replaced with his Spider-Man suit. Peter made sure the suit was in anti-camera mode before opening his window and jumping out. He hasn't had the chance to test his web swinging, so now's the time. Shooting a web at the nearest building, Peter grabs hold of it and swings down the street. Repeating this over and over, Peter was like Tarzan swinging through the jungle. The feeling of swinging between buildings around New York City was the most freeing and exciting thing that Peter has ever felt. When he would come across an obstacle, Peter would run along rooftops or the sides of building with his wall-crawling abilities. Whoa! Peter yelled excitedly as he did a backflip midair in the center of Times Square before shooting another web and swinging away. He noticed how easy it was to get around the city compared to other forms of travel. Landing on a high rooftop, Peter googles how long NYC is and found that it was 35 miles long from northeast to southwest. After some quick math, Peter found that at his speed he would be able to cover that ground in 21 minutes. That may be long in an emergency, but it's very unlikely that Peter would ever have to cover even half of that distance to get to a crime. Speaking of crime, Peter realized that he hasn't seen any since he jumped out of his window. I should have gotten a police scanner. He mutters under his breath. While waiting to hear some sirens on a random building in the center of New York City, Peter turns off his anti-camera enchantment. He only needs to use it during times where he could implicate his true identity, so pretty much whenever he heads out and returns home. After waiting a good 10 minutes, the sound of ambulance and fire truck sirens began ringing in Peter's ears as red and blue lights lit up a nearby street. It's finally go time. Peter says as he jumps off the tall skyscraper, like Ezio Auditore aiming for a nearby haystack. Swinging above the fire trucks, Peter finally saw their destination. A low-income apartment building was burning and smoke was rising from the few open windows. Screams for help could be heard as people rush out of the building, coughing up smoke all the way. Okay, you can do this. It's show time. Peter psyches himself up to dispel the nervousness he feels. Increasing his speed, Peter overtakes the first responders as he rushes to the burning building. As he swings over the onlookers outside the building a few of them look up and see as Peter swings into one of the smoking windows. Did you see that? What was that? Did someone just swing into the window? Nah, you probably just inhaled too much smoke. No, I swear I saw it. The talks continued as those that saw Peter watch the window he dived in with anticipation. Inside the building, Peter could barely see due to the smoke, so he began to call out for anyone left behind in the building. Pacing the halls, Peter called out at the top of his lungs for anyone to answer him. Thankfully, the suit seemed to be smoke-proof as Peter didn't seem to be affected by the fume-filled building. He didn't even feel hot in the slightest. Soon enough, someone finally called back to him. Help, my babies. Help, in here, help. A woman's voice called out. Locking onto her location with his enhanced hearing, Peter moves at breakneck speed. Arriving in front of an apartment door, Peter saw that it was blocked by a big burning beam that fell through the ceiling. Hang on, I'm coming to get you. Peter yells as he lifted the burning beam and shoved it aside. You can open the door now. Peter calls but doesn't get an answer this time. Since he didn't get an answer, Peter broke the door down and saw a mother and her two children passed out next to an open window. The place was burning and filled with smoke like the rest of the building. Acting quickly, Peter puts the mother over his shoulder and grabs the children under each arm before jumping out of the window. He runs down the side of the building and places the family of three gently on the ground. Firemen that have just arrived were clearing the scene and hooking hoses to nearby fire hydrants. When they saw someone jump out of a window, they thought someone was committing suicide or just trying to survive the fire. Though their expectations changed drastically when they saw an oddly dressed man run down the side of the building as if he was defying gravity, and placing three unconscious people on the ground. Smoke inhalation. Get the medics on them. Peter says as he shoots a web to the open window he came from and pulls, launching himself back inside the building. Wait! Don't go back in there! A fireman yells but Peter was already gone. Back inside the building, Peter began to realize that his current strategy wasn't working fast enough. He needed to find a better way to locate these people at a much quicker pace. Trusting his enhanced senses, Peter closed his eyes and honed in on his hearing. It was the only sense he had that wasn't clouded at the moment. His eye and nose were being blocked by smoke, so he hoped his ears were enough to guide him. Soon enough, Peter started to hear things more clearly. It started with the sound of crackling fire and the creaking of the old building, but soon enough he began to hear the remaining people in the building. Their breaths, heartbeats, and small movements. Peter could hear it all. Kicking it into overdrive, Peter first rushed to those that were in more dire situations than others. 
Soon enough, Peter became a regular appearance for the 911 responders outside. He would find people or even pets, carry them out the nearest window, set them down, and rush back in to do it all over again. When Peter finally brought out his last group of people, paramedics took them away as a few cops walked up to him. Hey, who are you? A man dressed as a detective asks. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Peter says as he shoots a web to a nearby building, pulls on it, and swings away. On a flat-screen TV in a tall high-rise unmarked government building, a video of a burning building was playing showing a man dressed in a red and blue spider-themed superhero suit rescuing everyone inside. He swung around on the webs he would shoot from his hands and defied gravity as he easily walked on the side of the burning building. A bald African-American man stood in front of the TV, studying the spider hero. He wore an eye patch and a black leather trench coat. Insert picture of MCU Nick Fury here, Hill, what do we know about this one? He asks over his shoulder. Standing behind him is a woman holding a very advanced looking data pad that seemed to be controlling the picture on the TV. Insert picture of MCU Maria Hill here, tapping the iPad looking device a few times, the picture changed to what looked like a news camera's perspective. The video played as the spider-styled man leaped out of a burning window and landed on the ground, safely dropping off some unconscious victims of the fire. Hey, who are you? Someone off camera yells. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. The self-proclaimed Spider-Man says as he shoots a web and disappears from the camera's view. He calls himself Spider-Man. She says as security footage from all over NYC along with cell phone videos begin to play on the TV. We've searched security footage and videos uploaded to social media. None were of any help in finding his identity or any possible home address. Is he a threat? The bald man asks as he reviews the videos. Not likely. He seemed to spend the night swinging around New York and helping anyone that needed it. From the fire we just saw, to small things like breaking up minor street fights. There are even a few videos of him bringing food to some homeless people. Have we collected any of his, Webb? He asks with a scoff. Yes, and it's been tested. She says and shows a picture of the collected webbing on the TV. The lab says that it's organic, but we were unable to extract any DNA from it. Alright, keep looking into this. I have a meeting with the World Security Council to get to Dash, the one-eyed man says as he makes his way to the door. And add Spider-Man's name to the Avengers initiative. Yes, sir. The morning after his debut as Spider-Man, Peter woke up around 8 a.m. and made his way to the living room. I'm just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. On the living room TV, Peter could see a group of newscasters reacting to his big name drop. There you have it. New York seems to have its own superpowered hero. No one knows his identity, but whoever he is, Spider-Man has our thanks. Good morning, May. Peter says as he sits on the sofa next to his aunt, who was watching TV with a mug of coffee in her hands. Morning, did you see this? May says as she points to the TV, where another video of Spider-Man saving people was being played. Nope, what is it? Peter asked and May begins explaining every good deed he did last night. While they're talking, the news plays a clip that Peter expected to see sooner or later. Though he hoped it would be later. It seems that not everyone sees our new spider hero in the same light. J. Jonah Jameson has this to say. A news anchor said as they transition to a clip. Spider-Man is suspicious if you ask me. In the clip, Peter could see a bald mustached man in a blue suit yelling about his Spider-Man conspiracy theories. Behind him was a logo that read, the Daily Bugle.net. Insert picture of MCU J. Jonah Jameson here, and how do we know that he didn't start that fire? A man was sent to the hospital. Probably some masked psychopath. Spider-Man is a menace. The clip showed a small compilation of J. Jonah's thoughts on Spider-Man, God I hate that man. May mutters as she muted the TV. Sadly, a lot of dumb people follow him. It can't be that bad right? Spider-Man seems to be helping people. They should understand. Peter says as he gets up to scour the kitchen for food. The majority of people who are sensible will understand, but the vocal minority that are fans of that bald mustache twirling clown will turn every good thing Spider-Man does into some conspiracy. May says in annoyance as she joins Peter in the kitchen. Trust me, I've seen him do it to other people before. Celebrities, politicians, it doesn't matter. Jonah will make the nicest deed seem like horrible cover-ups. After hearing Aunt May's words, Peter thought that maybe he should combat the bad propaganda that Jonah spreads with his own. Of course, what he does won't be propaganda as he wouldn't be misleading people. The question is how can he do that? While thinking about this, Peter ate his breakfast with May and left the apartment with the excuse of visiting Ned. Arriving at the New York Sanctum, Peter portaled over to Kamar Taj and met with the Ancient One. 
The first thing he did upon arrival was ask for the Wi-Fi password, which he received without a problem. He needed the Wi-Fi so he could message May and Ned on WhatsApp since he has no signal here. Today, Peter was expecting to learn more magic, but sadly, the Ancient One took him to the library and left him there after stacking a bunch of books for him to read. Sigh, let's get to work, a few weeks later, during these past weeks, Peter has stuck to a steady schedule. On weekdays, he would go to school and hang out with Ned while attending classes. Thanks to his Parker brain, Peter has been easily acing all of his classes. Everything was simple and he didn't even have to study for tests. He doesn't even have to do his homework outside of school. Peter would just finish it throughout the school day. After school ended, Peter would try to hang out with Ned for a bit. Then he would either go straight to Kamar Taj or to his underground warehouse lair. At the lair, Peter would do a combination of exercises to up his already crazy strength, speed, etc. During his time in Kamar Taj, Peter would be stuck in the library memorizing different dead languages and other material for a few hours before returning home to Aunt May. Once May would head off to bed, Peter would sneak out to do his spiderly duties. Of course, he learned his lesson from the first night as Spider-Man, Peter bought a Bluetooth earpiece that he upgraded and modified to seamlessly fit under the mask of his suit. With the earpiece connected to his phone, Peter could use an app to listen in on police dispatch. Now he knows exactly where to go when he was needed, which has made his nights much more hectic. Though most nights are filled with normal low-level crime, Peter has responded to a good amount of robberies and even a couple of gang-related shootings throughout the few weeks he's been active as Spider-Man. Of course, J. Jonah Jameson continued to spread his anti-Spider-Man propaganda. Doing so was good business for him, as speaking about Spider-Man skyrocketed his ratings and following. On the weekends, Peter would put in a lot of hours at Kamar Taj, but other than that the schedule was the same except for school. Speaking of school, banners, posters, and flyers have been posted all around the building, promoting this year's homecoming. Homecoming itself consisted of a pep rally, a football game, and the homecoming dance itself. It was pretty much a celebration of school starting again and a way to bring the school's community together. Seeing the decorations and notices going up, Peter understood that it was finally time to stop stalling. He was going to ask MJ to go to homecoming with him. It was a nerve-wracking thing to do for the first time as rejection loomed over his shoulder, but if Peter could do his duties as Spider-Man, he could do anything. During lunch on a Friday, Peter ignored Ned, who was talking about a game he has been into lately and psyched himself up before getting up and walking towards MJ's table. She was sitting alone as always, reading a book while listening to her headphones. Huh? Where are you going, Peter? Ned asked as Peter strolled over and took a seat across from MJ. Ah, uh, hey! Peter says as he waves his hand to get her attention. Pulling out her earbuds, MJ peeks at him over her open book before putting it aside. Peter, right? What's up? She asks, not expecting anyone to talk to her. MJ had a difficult home life as she and her mother haven't heard from her father for a while. Although he just up and disappeared one day, based on the movies her father would return in a few years. Because of this MJ developed a sarcastic and guarded demeanor as she grew, preferring to read her books, and often had difficulty when trying to establish friendships. In school, MJ is the sarcastic loner that mocks her fellow students from the sidelines whenever they do or say something dumb. Not knowing how to open up to people and scaring everyone away with her tough sarcastic persona, MJ has spent the majority of her school life alone. Of course, that doesn't mean she isn't lonely. She's human and everyone wants people they can talk to and rely on. Sadly, she's just not good with people and hasn't had the chance to connect with anyone. Yeah, Peter Parker. You're Michelle, right? Peter asks in return even though he already knew. Just call me MJ. She says. Okay, MJ it is. Peter says before confidently doing what he came here to do. Do you want to go to homecoming with me, MJ? Do you want to go to homecoming with me, MJ? Peter asks confidently as all of his earlier nervousness melted away. Looking back at his earlier nervousness, Peter thought that he was an idiot. This was easy and it didn't matter if he got rejected. He's Spider-Man for crying out loud. Huh? MJ froze as she stared at Peter in shock. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm asking you to homecoming. Peter says plainly. Like his friends? MJ adds at the end. No, as a date. Peter clarifies. Staring at Peter in disbelief, MJ doesn't know what to say or do. She's never been in this situation before. While this is happening, two people were eavesdropping on the conversation. Ned, who was seated at a nearby table, and Flash who was walking by and slowed down to snoop on Peter. Holy shit that's hilarious! Flash exclaims, drawing everyone's attention as he laughs openly. Puny Peter just asked the loner to homecoming. 
Flash finally found his shot to make fun of Peter, as his friends and a few others laughed at his words. Sadly, this moment would be short-lived, as the school's queen of comebacks was involved this time. Dispelling her earlier nervousness, MJ turned to Flash and ripped into him. Being a prick won't make yours any bigger, Flash. MJ says with sarcasm dripping from her voice. This got a laugh from some students as well, especially the girls in the room. Blast off, Watson. Flash says with a goading smirk. Don't call me that. MJ's demeanor changed instantly as she glares at Flash. MJ's full name is Michelle Jones Watson, but she hates her last name as it reminds her of her absent father. Flash knows this as he was told all about MJ's father by a girl that MJ tried to open up to during the last school year. Seeing as that girl wasn't a trustworthy person, the fallout between them only magnified MJ's already guarded demeanor. What's the matter, Watson? You can dish it but you can't take it? Maybe we should call your daddy to come pick you up? Oh, wait. I forgot Dash of Flash pushes all of MJ's buttons. Don't you say another word. MJ looked beyond pissed off. That's right, we wouldn't be able to find him, would we? Flash says with an evil smirk. It's been too long since he had a win like this. For a whole month, Peter has outdone him in class and easily overturned any of his schemes. Today he finally has a win, but he may have taken it a bit too far. Because by this point, the cafeteria was quietly watching. No one laughed or gossiped. It was deathly silent. Looking at MJ's frustrated face, Peter could see that she was actually close to crying. He knew from the movies that her father's absence affected her, but he didn't know it was to this extent. I'm getting suspended. Peter says low enough for only MJ to hear him. What? This distracts her from the frustration and anger she felt as she looks at Peter questioningly. I said I wouldn't do this, but I guess some things are inevitable. Peter thought as he stood from his seat and walked toward Flash. What's up, Pussy Parker? Upset for your girlfriend? Flash says condescendingly. Yeah, a little bit. Peter nods as he winds back his fist and punches Flash upside the nose. Crack the hit landed cleanly as Flash never expected Peter to hit him. Of course, Peter held back as he didn't want to one-punch man the guy. Even though he held back, that didn't mean Peter went easy on him. A sickening crack was heard as the bone in his nose broke and Flash was sent tumbling backward onto the floor. What the? Ned exclaims as he watches everything unfold in shock. The rest of the cafeteria was as shocked as Ned, as they were either watching in surprise or gossiping about what just happened. Looking down at Flash, who was laying on his side while cradling his face, Peter walked up to Ned and grabbed his backpack. Dude, that was. Ned says but ends up lost for words. Yeah, text you later. Peter says and Ned nods, knowing he's most likely getting suspended. There are cameras all over the school and the lunch ladies had to have seen what happened. Before leaving the cafeteria, Peter walked up to MJ one last time. Give me your phone. Peter says and she hands it over robotically, still in shock from what just happened. Peter quickly puts his contact info in her phone and texts himself so he has her number as well. He feels his phone vibrate in his pocket, confirming that the text went through. Okay, I'll text you later. Peter says as he hands her back the phone and walks out of the cafeteria. Going straight to the school's main office, Peter takes a seat outside and starts reading a book on Python, which is a high-level coding language. Peter has been buying books like this recently and was amazed by how easy it was for him to understand everything. It was like he had a fog blocking his mind in his last life and now it's cleared completely. Peter was a straight-A student in his last life too, which just goes to show how amazing his new Parker brain is. While he was waiting for the principal to find out what happened, lone footsteps could be heard coming down the hall from the cafeteria. Looking up, Peter could see MJ walking toward him. What are you doing here? Peter asks as he closes his book. I kicked Flash in the ribs after you left. MJ says as she takes a seat next to him and pulls out a book of her own. I see. Peter says with a smile and he and MJ start reading their respective books in silence. Both of them were a bit socially awkward and didn't know what to say, especially after what just happened. Though after a few minutes of silence, MJ was the first to speak up. Yes. She says without any other context. Yes, what? Peter asks confusedly. Homecoming. I'll go with you. MJ clarifies. Good, I just hope we're allowed to go after this. Peter says as he knows they're either getting a lot of detention or a few days of suspension. MJ nodded before the silence returned and they started reading again. After waiting for a bit, the principal came out of the main office and called both Peter and MJ inside. Knowing that his Aunt May will most likely get called in for this, Peter sent her a short text explaining what happened. After answering the principal's questions and explaining what happened, both of their guardians were called as Peter expected. Apparently, Flash had to go to the hospital because of a broken nose and the possibility of broken ribs. 
When Peter heard this he looked over at MJ. She noticed his gaze and merely shrugged, as she didn't think she kicked him that hard. Both of them didn't really care though. Flash deserved it for taking his bullying too far, and it's not like he hasn't had this coming for a while now. When his Aunt May showed up in her hospital clothes, Peter felt bad for taking her away from work. Though the woman herself didn't care one bit. Kids love getting out of school and adults loved getting out of work. Especially when she got that text from Peter. May knew that Flash has been bullying Peter for a while now, but sadly, the school would do nothing about it. So when she got a text from Peter saying he punched the little bastard, she didn't mind one bit. Though when she read further and saw that he did it for the girl he likes, May nodded with a smile on her face. Leave it to Peter to punch his longtime bully for a girl and not because he's been bullied for four years. She thought. Is that her? May asks as she walks to the main office and sees Peter and MJ sitting outside. MJ heard what she asked and looked at Peter with a raised eyebrow. Yes, now stop whatever this is. Peter says as he knows what she's doing. Hello, I'm Peter's Aunt May. May introduces herself to MJ as she ignores Peter completely. Please tell me Peter asked you out? Yeah, he did. MJ answers as she looks between Peter and his aunt questioningly. Is this revenge for not telling you who the girl was? Peter says and May turns to him with a smirk. Of course not. I'm not that petty. She said but Peter didn't believe her for a second. Apparently you are. Peter says under his breath but they both could hear him. MJ found the whole situation to be funny as she has a similar relationship with her mom. They became close like this after her father left. Soon enough, MJ's mother arrived as well and another meeting was held to explain what happened. MJ's mother gave Peter a small nod of approval when she learned of everything that transpired. Once everything was said and done, Peter and MJ were suspended from school for two days starting on Monday, which means they get a four-day weekend. Of course, Peter and MJ didn't mind one bit. Thankfully, they weren't barred from attending homecoming, which they were happy about. As the group of four were leaving the school together, Aunt May turned to MJ's mother. I wish I could punch one of my co-workers and get a couple days off. May says, causing MJ's mother to chuckle uncontrollably. Same. In the blazing desert of Afghanistan, a convoy of US military hummers moved leisurely like a snake through the sand. Some Humvees were fitted with miniguns, which were manned by soldiers who stood through a sort of sunroof of the vehicle. Inside a gunless Humvee in the center of the pack was a group of soldiers, but one person stood out among the rest. He wore an expensive black designer suit and sunglasses that looked to be Ray-Bans. Insert picture of MCU Tony Stark here, I feel like you're driving me to a court-martial. This is crazy. What did I do? I feel like you're going to pull over and snuff me. What, you're not allowed to talk? Hey, Forrest. Tony tries his best to make conversation in the awkward silence of the Hummer. We can talk, sir. The soldier in the passenger seat answers. Oh, I see. So it's personal? Tony asks. No, you intimidate them. The female soldier who's driving the Humvee says. Good God, you're a woman. I honestly. I couldn't have called that. I mean, I'd apologize, but isn't that what we're going for here? I thought of you as a soldier first. Tony puts his foot in his mouth and tries to clarify jokingly, I'm an airman. She corrects him. Or airwoman? Tony says as she shoots him a look over her shoulder for a brief moment. You have excellent bone structure, there. I'm kind of having a hard time not looking at you now. Is that weird? Hearing Tony work his magic, the soldiers in the vehicle chuckle, and the mood instantly changes from the earlier awkward atmosphere. After answering some questions and talking about his sexual escapades with some models, a soldier nervously spoke to Tony. Is it cool if I take a picture with you? He asks. Yes. It's very cool. Tony agrees easily as he's used to this. The soldier next to him pulls his camera out and hands it to the soldier in the front seat. I don't want to see this on your MySpace page. Tony jokes as the soldier puts up a peace sign for the photo. Please, no gang signs. The soldier puts his hand down nervously. No, throw it up. I'm kidding. Yeah, peace. I love peace. I'd be out of a job with peace. As the picture was about to be taken, something hit and blew up the vehicle in front of them. Boom gunshots and such were heard and hit the side of their vehicle. Tony begins to panic and asks questions as the soldiers get out of the car with their M4s drawn. The soldier that was taking a picture with Tony stayed with him and drew his weapon, looking outside the windows. Gunfire and explosions filled the area as the American soldiers fought a losing battle. The enemy had numbers, weaponry, and the surprise advantage. It was the perfect ambush. Son of a bitch. The remaining soldier curses as he goes out to help his dying comrades. Wait, 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 wait. Give me a gun. Tony pleads. Stay here.
The soldier orders as he turned back around and was gunned down, bullet holes piercing the vehicle. Tony's hearing and senses were dulled a bit as he got himself out of the vehicle, stumbling a bit in the chaos. He got some of his hearing back and ran, diving behind some rocks for cover. He pulled out his phone to call for help when a bomb landed next to him. He looked over to see it have Stark Industries printed on it. He tried to get up and get away but didn't make it in time. Boom the bomb exploded and made him fly through the air. Tony hit the ground hard, dulling his senses again as his ears rang. He felt a pain in his chest and pulled his shirt off as blood started to pool onto the desert floor. Tony Stark is missing and thought to be either dead or kidnapped. On his recent trip to Afghanistan, the genius playboy hosted a demonstration of the new Stark Industries Jericho missile which was designed for the United States Air Force. During Peter's four-day weekend, news dropped that Tony Stark was missing. Stark Industries stock dipped sharply as shareholders sold in a panic. Peter knew all of this would happen, but sadly he's too poor to take advantage of his knowledge. He had pocket money from his pickpocketing, but it wasn't enough to buy large amounts of Stark stock. At most he would just buy now and sell when it's high again, but he wouldn't make much. Also, if Peter deposited his illegally gained money, which he didn't pay taxes for, into a bank and used it to buy stock, that's just asking for the IRS to show up. Though Peter has a few ideas on how to make money. His legal ideas will take some time. If he wants to stop stealing and use his intellect to make money by starting a company, for example, Peter would have to come up with a product, figure out production and distribution, hire employees, market it, and a lot more. Not to mention the money it takes to do all of that. Truthfully, all of that sounds like a giant hassle to Peter. He would rather use one of the much easier and less time-consuming ways to fill his bank account. Though that doesn't mean he won't hone his intellect and skills to create new technologies. Whether they be used for his life as Peter or Spider-Man, his creations won't be released to the general public. Maybe he would sell some harmless tech to Stark Industries, but that would have to wait until Tony is back. He doesn't trust Stain one bit. How long was Tony kidnapped again? Peter thought as he tried remembering the first Iron Man movie. I think it was a few months. While Peter was thinking deeply about the future and his plans, May watched his reaction to the news. May knew that Peter, in a small way, idolized Tony Stark, even though she didn't like the man very much. She thought the news may be hard on him. Seeing his contemplative look, May mistook it for concern and felt bad for Peter. Don't worry, Peter. May says as she puts a comforting hand on his shoulder. If he's alive, the military will bring him back. He's too important not to. One week later, seeing the Stark stock fall, Peter thought it was finally time to start his money-making plan. After reading multiple books on coding, game design, and other tech-related subjects, Peter started his work on making the best mobile pay-to-win game he could. Checking the mobile game market, Peter found that a lot of the games from his old life either don't exist or haven't been made yet. Knowing what was good from his past life, Peter started designing a game he knew would be popular. Candy Crush, the game, had a large fan base of over 250 million and generated $1.19 billion in 2020. Luckily, the game just so happened to not exist in this world. What's good about mobile games is that Peter doesn't have to worry about selling copies of his games in physical stores. He only had to make it and get it approved to go up on the different mobile phone market apps. Let's not forget the many microtransactions, which will rake in the money. Before starting, Peter bought a better computer with his stolen money. He would need a good PC that runs fast so that the development moves quickly and all his work is done super efficiently. He was still a beginner at game development and soon found that he needed to know more than he initially thought. First, he wasn't the greatest artist and found that he needed to make all the visuals himself. He had to download a 3D modeling program and bought a clunky art tablet. Second, Peter had to make his own sound effects and music. He had to buy an electric keyboard and download an audio production program to make the music. As for the sound effects, some were taken from open source websites he found, while others were recorded by Peter himself and edited to perfection. Thankfully, Peter didn't need any voiceovers for the game. Otherwise, he would have had to hire some people to record lines for him. Other than that, the rest of the game design was fairly simple for Peter. The only times he had trouble was when he needed to do the art or sound, but he soon became adept in those areas as well. Only a week passed since Peter began creating his first game, and based on his calculations, it would take another month at least to get it ready for testing. It could be finished sooner if Peter didn't have such a packed schedule. While working on his game, Peter's phone vibrated and lit up with a new text popping up. MJ, hey, what you doing? Taking his phone. Peter unlocks it and types back. Peter, on my PC. What's up? He decided to keep the game a secret from everyone except Ned, who would never forgive him if he wasn't involved. 
Ned came over to hang out, give ideas, and help with small things whenever he could. His best friend was far more excited about the game than Peter was. He wanted to surprise everyone else with a finished game. He would invite everyone over and have them play his game when it passed the testing phase. MJ, are you getting a tuxedo for homecoming? Peter, I haven't decided yet. What are you wearing? MJ? Seeing her reply, Peter confusedly reread his last text and immediately understood. Peter, not like that. Peter, what are you wearing to homecoming? MJ, I knew that already. Smiling face with horns MJ, I don't know either. Neutral face Peter, want to go shopping together tomorrow? We only have a week left. She didn't respond for a minute, but Peter saw that she read his message. MJ, sure. The next day, Peter and MJ planned to meet at an area in Midtown that had a lot of good stores. It was a Sunday, so they didn't have school to worry about and Peter messaged the Ancient One on WhatsApp to call out for the day. That's right, he managed to get the Ancient One to give him her contact info, which he took great pride in having. Who else in the world or even the multiverse could say they had a main line to the Sorcerer Supreme? Speaking of the Ancient One, Peter has almost finished the library studying phase of his training. He's sure he'll have to study more in the future, but it won't be to the same extent as this. He's learned a lot from his time in the library of Kamar Taj. Firstly, he's learned to read a ton of different languages, including many of the dead ones like Akkadian, Sanskrit, and Old Norse. He needed to learn these languages as not all books in the library of Kamar Taj were in English. In fact, most aren't. Other than that, Peter has learned about different types of dimensional and personal energies, spell circles, astral projection, runes, conjuration, enchanting, transmutation, and forming weapons with eldritch energy, like the eldritch whip and tau mandalas. Insert pictures of Eldritch Whip and Tau Mandalas here. Dimensional energies are those that are drawn from other planes of existence throughout the multiverse or are bestowed upon a sorcerer from one or more extra-dimensional entities. Though, the Ancient One doesn't usually allow the masters of Kamar Taj to make deals with such entities, as they always have ulterior motives. Even the kindest of these beings don't act without getting something in return. One of the easier sources that a sorcerer can draw power from are the universal energies of their home dimension. This is why the masters of Kamar Taj almost exclusively use Eldritch energy, as it's the native energy of their universe. Personal energies are those derived from the life force of the sorcerer. Personal energies can only be used to power abilities developed through mental studies and are thus limited to mental abilities such as astral projection, hypnotism, telekinesis, and telepathy. However, because it is known that the continual use of such energies will fatally deplete the individual by consuming their life force, sorcerers must also learn to harness external forces through meditation techniques and trained willpower. This is only a small overview of the plethora of books Peter has read. He hasn't used any magic up until this point, other than the sling ring for easy travel. Although he knows a lot about all of these subjects, the Ancient One has warned him against trying anything without her or a designated master's instruction. Luckily, that instruction would be starting soon. Peter was the first to arrive at the meeting place, as he leaned against a nearby wall. He didn't have to wait long as MJ arrived not long after. She was nervous as this could be a date for all she knows. Her mother said it wasn't but she also insisted on doing MJ's makeup and even picked out her outfit. All of this led to MJ believing that this was most likely a date, which made her nervous and very self-conscious. On the other side, Peter didn't come to the same conclusion. He just thought this was a shopping trip and was fairly calm. Yo, MJ. Peter calls out, grabbing her attention as she walks up to him. Hey, did you wait long? She asks. No, only a few minutes. Do you want to start looking for clothes or get some food first? Peter asks. We're getting food? MJ asks as her mind begins to race. This is looking more and more like a date. Yeah, I've been craving some Chick-fil-A lately. Are you hungry now or do you want to get our clothes first? Peter asks. Let's shop first. I want to get that out of the way before eating anything. MJ says as she looks around at the nearby stores. Alright, let's get going then. Going from store to store, Peter was the first to buy his suit which was an all-black slim-fit suit with black dress shoes. It was a little expensive but it would be worth every penny. He knew it was good by the look MJ was giving him as he exited the fitting room. Insert picture of all-black slim-fit suit, does it look good? Peter asks as he turns to give her a good view. She took a moment to look at him in a daze before answering. Why yeah, you look good. I mean the suit. The suit looks good. Giving her a smirk, Peter turned to the tailor that measured him and helped pick out the suit. I'll take this one. Will it be ready by today? Peter asks, knowing all tailors usually alter their suits to fit their clients perfectly. 
After measuring and inspecting the suit one last time, the tailor found nothing that needed to be altered, so Peter bought the whole outfit and left with his bags. Alright, it's your turn now. Where to? Peter asks and follows MJ to a string of stores. He could tell that she didn't like shopping, at least not in these types of stores, as MJ did not look happy the longer they kept going. He would be right as MJ doesn't care for shopping and feels especially uncomfortable with wearing a dress, as she's always been a bit of a tomboy. This prolonged their search as no dress fit MJ's style. As time went on, Peter saw MJ become more and more frustrated, so he decided to step in. Let's get some food. Peter says as he grabs MJ's hand and walks out of the store they were in. MJ instantly forgot about her earlier frustrations and focused on Peter's hand that was holding hers. She immediately felt self-conscious. Her hand was a little sweaty and she knew it, but Peter either didn't care or didn't notice. If MJ knew this would happen, she would have wiped her hand on her jeans beforehand or something. As they exited the store, Peter and MJ quietly walked hand in hand down the sidewalk toward the nearby Chick-fil-A, ordering some food and taking a seat, they sat across from each other with their food between them. Eating slowly, Peter was the first to speak up. You don't like dresses do you? He says matter-of-factly. Swallowing her food, MJ looks at him for a moment before answering. What gave it away? Did you figure it out before or after we left the sixth dress shop? MJ retreats to her guarded sarcasm as she felt like she was ruining everything. She just spent hours looking for clothes in places she felt she didn't belong. MJ would just have to ask her mother to pick her out a dress, as she would never buy anything if it was up to her. Although her answer was a bit sarcastic and snippy, Peter knew that was her defense mechanism. After a little over a week of talking and hanging out, he started to understand MJ to a certain extent. That understanding only grows with every interaction they have. You don't have to wear a dress, you know? Peter says as he pops a waffle fry into his mouth. Huh? MJ grunts in confusion. There's no dress code for homecoming. You can wear whatever you want. Peter says with a shrug as he sips his soda. MJ stares at Peter in realization for a moment before speaking. You won't mind if I wear something else? Nope, I think you should wear whatever you want. If you want to dress like it's another day of school, then do it. Peter says with a shrug. Besides, I like the slightly tomboyish MJ. She's cute. While MJ was computing what he just said, Peter's super hearing picked up something alarming. Put the money in the bag. Make it quick. A man's voice came from the bank across the street. No dye packs or trackers either. Why yes. A woman stutters nervously and shuffled some things around. I said quickly, bitch. The man exclaims as the sound of someone being hit by something metal fills his ears. Ah? A woman screams in pain as Peter hears her fall to the ground. Get up and get my money or there's a bullet in here with your name on it. Taking a quick bite of his chicken sandwich and washing it down with some soda, Peter excuses himself to the restroom, leaving behind a bewildered and blushing MJ. I'll be right back. Peter says as he enters the empty bathroom and locks the door before switching to his spider suit in an instant. The bathroom had no windows, so Peter opened a portal to a nearby rooftop and rushed toward the bank. When Peter went to the bathroom, MJ tried to get herself under control, but something caught her interest from the corner of her eye. What the? MJ mutters as she sees a shadow make its way across the pavement outside. A moment later, MJ saw Spider-Man swing down from above the building and smash into the window of a bank across the street. Staring in awe for a moment, MJ takes out her phone and texts Peter about what's happening before rushing outside to get a better view of the action. She could barely believe this was happening. Staring down at the bank from the top of a building across the street, Peter assessed the situation through the large glass windows. Inside the bank was a group of four masked gunmen, who were very obviously robbing the place. While scoping out the area, Peter noticed an empty but still running car parked outside, which is probably their getaway vehicle. He would wait for them to leave and take them down away from the hostages, but based on the earlier threats and assault he heard while eating, Peter didn't want to risk it. Swinging down and crashing into the bank's window, Peter already had a game plan formulated in his head. As the glass shattered, everyone inside including the robbers were too surprised to act. Some of the more traumatized in the bank screamed in fright. They had already been through a lot with the whole bank robbery and being held hostage at gunpoint thing. While everyone was frozen in surprise, Peter accurately shot his webs at every gun in the building. All right, boys and girls. Peter says as he stands casually in the center of the bank, surrounded by gunmen and hostages. You have the right to remain ugly. Oh wait that's not it, is it? S Spider-Man? One of the robbers yells in fright. What's he doing here? I thought he's only out at night. Another says in confusion as he aims his gun at Peter, but soon noticed the web covering it. What the hell? 
As soon as he noticed the web, the other saw it as well. A couple of the robbers tried to pull it off, while the others kept their guns aimed at the very familiar intruder. They'd been planning this heist for a while now. It was actually supposed to happen later in the night before the bank closes. Sadly for them, Spider-Man patrols the streets at that time, so they changed the plan to happen during the day. Look, I understand you must be nervous meeting a celebrity like myself, but I'm just a normal guy like you. Peter says with mock arrogance. Shut up! One of the less scared robbers yells commandingly as he points his webbed gun toward a female bank teller with a swollen face and busted lip. We've put too much work into this job to get caught by some spider freak. His words hype up his fellow gunmen so they give up getting the web off, as it just wouldn't budge, and pointed their guns at Spider-Man, now, we're getting our money and leaving. If you try to stop us, then I think you know what's going to happen, right? The charismatic gunman said as he pressed the barrel of his gun against the side of the teller's head. Is he the one that did that to your face? Peter asked the teller as he completely ignores anything the gunman said. Having a hard time finding her voice, the woman nods shakily at first before speaking nervously. Why yes. Shut up, bitch. The gunman exclaims as he kicks the back of her legs, knocking her to her knees. Leave now or I blow her brains out all over these nice people. Ignoring him completely, Peter walks forward leisurely. The gunman yells some threatening nonsense but he just keeps walking. Soon enough one of the gunmen that was aiming at Peter mustered up the courage to squeeze the trigger. Click nothing happens as the only sound that fills the room is that of the metal trigger being pulled. Seeing this, the others try shooting Peter while the hostage taker pulls his trigger as well, scaring the poor teller half to death, but once again nothing happens. Did you think I just webbed your guns for no reason? Peter says as he walks up to the hostage taker. In a panic, the three other gunmen start tearing at the webbing on their guns as the hostage taker throws his gun aside and pulls out a knife. Don't come. He says as he goes to press the knife against the woman's throat, but Peter acted much faster. Shooting a web at the knife, Peter grabs the other end and yanks. With his super strength, the guy had no chance as the knife slips out of the hostage taker's hand. At this point, Peter was right in front of the guy. Look, I'm sorry man. The masked man says as he pushes the battered hostage away and puts his hands up. Just let me go, okay? I won't do something like this again. I promise. Crack without a word, Peter smacked the guy upside the head, sending him tumbling to the floor with a busted lip, bruised face, and broken jaw. That should make you even, right? Peter says as he looks over his shoulder toward the battered teller. She didn't say anything as she marched over to the downed robber and kicked him square in the nuts. Ah. A high-pitched scream fills the bank as the guy holds his nuts in pain. Now we're even. She says before walking out of the bank with her head held high. She's been through enough today and was ready to never see this bank again. Thank you. Man, that's one scary woman. Peter says as he turns to the other gunmen, who were watching what happened to their friend nervously. Why don't you guys just give up? I wouldn't want to call her back in here to finish the rest of you off. Peter says as he gestures to their private parts. Thinking of their unborn children, the other three gunmen throw away their useless guns and put their hands up. With the situation diffused, Peter webbed up the four criminals and left the bank while being thanked profusely by the former hostages. On his way out, Peter saw MJ watching from across the street and gave her a small wave before swinging off into the distance. Finding a secluded area, Peter opens a portal back to the bathroom and hears loud banging from the door. Hey, is anyone in there? Hurry it up, I got a shit. A man yells from the other side. One SEC. Peter calls out as he switches back to his normal clothes and checks himself in the mirror, before unlocking the door and leaving. Sorry. Peter was met with a fat and angry-looking bald man, who simply scoff at him before pushing past and slamming the bathroom door shut behind him. Shortly after the door closed, Peter heard some sounds he wished he didn't hear. Returning to his seat, Peter heard police sirens getting close as MJ rushes back inside and sit across from him. You won't believe what just happened. She says as she points to the bank across the street. What? Did someone smash the windows or something? Peter plays dumb as he starts eating again. No, you didn't see my text, did you? She asks and Peter shakes his head, taking out his phone. After reading it and putting on a shocked face, Peter looks at MJ skeptically. There's no way you saw Spider-Man, Peter says as he looks outside at the police who just showed up. I swear, he even waved at me. MJ says as if it was some sort of odd achievement. Now I really don't believe you. Peter says with a small laugh. He did. I don't know why though. She says with a confused look. Well, he better go find his own girlfriend. Peter says jokingly, still pretending not to believe her. Girlfriend. MJ repeated his words in her head as she blushed and averted her gaze. 
though she didn't refute his words. After everything that happened, MJ and Peter didn't feel like shopping anymore, so they went their separate ways. MJ said she would try looking for clothes again with her mother before they separated in the subway. Peter wanted to walk her home but MJ refused, so he didn't push it. She got to their meeting place on her own and could get back on her own as well. When MJ arrived home, she immediately sent Peter videos of what happened to prove that she saw Spider-Man. Upon receiving the videos, Peter cut her a break and said he believed her. Though he still pretended not to believe anything about Spider-Man waving at her. Sadly for her, she couldn't find a video of that moment. While watching the videos MJ sent him, Peter saw that one of them was a clip from J. Jonah Jameson's online show. Though he knows MJ hates him, as she's a fan of Spider-Man so he wasn't worried. Seeing that Jonah was still talking about him, Peter did some research and found that he was becoming a very popular figure lately. Jonah's views were up and there were sponsors on every broadcast he did and video he made. Even the comments of his videos were filled with a bunch of people that seemed to hate Spider-Man. What truly shocked Peter was the appearances Jonah made on different talk shows and news channels. This is getting out of hand. Peter thought as he knew it was time to fight back but he wasn't sure how. Suddenly, his phone goes off and Peter sees the many different notifications he has from YouTube, Instagram, and things like that. Instantly, Peter had an interesting idea. That could work. Peter's idea is to pretty much make Spider-Man an influencer on YouTube and other social media platforms. It literally has what he's trying to do in the name, influence people. Well, influence those that are being poisoned by J. Jonah Jameson's constant anti-Spider-Man propaganda. Peter knows he won't be able to get all of Jonah's followers to turn sides, but most people are logical and level-headed. They would hopefully make up their own minds after seeing for themselves. He already knew what to do. Peter would record videos of his nightly duties as Spider-Man and post them to YouTube after some quick editing. It would be an easy way to show the full context of the situations which Jonah is constantly spinning into some conspiracy perpetrated by Spider-Man or some other craziness. As for the other social media platforms, Peter thought it would be best to use Twitter and Instagram. Instagram only just came out this year, so it was still new and not very popular. The only reason he has an Instagram account is that Peter knows it will be popular in the years to come. Though that popularity may come sooner rather than later. After all, Spider-Man would be on it soon enough. On the other hand, Twitter has been around for almost four years and was starting to gain some traction. Peter chose these three things for specific reasons and not just out of random thought. YouTube would showcase the good he does in video format. Twitter can be used to speak his mind or send warnings during future emergencies. The only one that he doesn't necessarily need is Instagram. It's more of a want than a need. Peter liked the idea of posting cool pictures as Spider-Man. Kind of like how Tobey Maguire Spider-Man would take photos of himself and sell them to the Daily Bugle to make a living. The only obstacle to his new plan is the fact that these accounts could be linked back to him. This problem would need to be taken care of beforehand, as people like Stark, Shield, Hydra, and anyone with a bit of skill and brains would be able to find him easily. He would have to engineer a way to encrypt these accounts, which shouldn't be too hard. Peter just needs to pick up some books on cryptography, network security, and anything else related. After reading up on these subjects, Peter could start brainstorming and put something together. Though even with all of his accounts encrypted and secured from any nosy people and organizations, Peter still wouldn't be able to make any money from anything related to this. For example, the second he pulled out any amount of money from his YouTube account, that transaction would be easily traceable. Especially for government agencies, like SHIELD and HYDRA by extension. Hell, the IRS could probably track it. The money just wouldn't be worth it, especially since Peter is already working on a project that would make a lot more money. Pay-to-win games are a much more lucrative business after all. Knowing he had to get to work, Peter started scouring libraries, bookstores, and college campuses for the things he needed. His schedule just got a bit more crowded, but he could handle it. He's Spider-Man after all. One week later, after a week of studying cryptography, network security, and other similar subjects, Peter already had a few ideas on how to secure his online activities as Spider-Man. He just needed to narrow it down to one solid plan and then Peter could get to work. Other than that, his schedule moved as usual. Everything was advancing steadily, including the development of Candy Crush. Peter started to become very skilled in every area of game development. His art and musical skills were astronomically better than they were before. Though not everything happened as usual. Flashback, at the beginning of the week, Peter went to Kamar Taj after school let out and was surprised to find the Ancient One waiting for him. Are you ready for your training to begin? She says as soon as he steps out of the portal. God, yes. Peter exclaims happily. He's been cooped up in the library for far too long. 
All of the knowledge he's packed into his brain needed to be used. He was dying to start doing any magic other than portal creation. Good, let's start with a small introduction, shall we? She says and places her thumb on Peter's forehead. Oh, no. Peter thought but it was too late for him to act. Suddenly, Peter was sucked out of the earth at lightning speed. Staring down at the planet below, he saw some things that shouldn't be there. Orbiting around the planet were glowing butterflies, which shined in every color of the rainbow. Okay, this isn't too bad. Peter says but soon regrets his statement. Before he could get too comfortable, Peter was once again sucked to another place. He appeared in a wormhole-type portal that flashed in different indescribable hues. Without getting a moment's rest, the scenes changed as Peter was thrown through many odd, beautiful, and dangerous dimensions. Peter saw towering figures with immeasurable power, and glimpses of the universe that no man was meant to look upon. One dimension that scared him the most was dead. Nothing existed and everything was gone, decayed to nothing but dust which floated in the air as little specks. This dimension was killed by the battle of two titanic figures, who were still fighting to this day. As an attack from one of the titans was about to strike Peter, he was about to be sucked up into another wormhole, but an old feminine-looking hand grabs him. Huh? Peter grunted as the hand pulls him through a spiderweb crack which floated above him. Appearing in an odd dimension made up of spiderwebs, similar to how the mirror dimension looks, except it was separated by webs and not cracks. Peter breathed heavily as he collapsed onto the floor with an enlightened and slightly scared look on his face. In between the web-like structure of this dimension, horrible outcomes and frightening dimensional entities were playing over and over. As if he was watching multiple televisions, Peter fully realizes that he has been treating this new life as a fun new beginning, which it is, but that doesn't make the many dangers in this new world just disappear. Especially the universe-ending entities that he just saw. Although the giant titans seemed to be preoccupied with their battle, what would they do once that fight concluded? They wouldn't want to stay in a dead universe, would they? Peter was too afraid to continue that train of thought. This experience was a sort of wake-up call for him, as Peter saw the dangers that exist in the vast dimensions. Do you understand now? A voice of an old woman fills the spider-like dimension. Following the sound, Peter turns to see an old decrepit-looking woman with spider-like appendages sitting on a stone throne. Not only does she have eight black spider legs coming out of her back, but also multiple beady black eyes. Ah, uh, I think so. Peter says in confusion. Good, you've been going down a path that leads to nothing but death. Stay alert and be ready for any situation. That's the spider's way after all. She says as she snaps her fingers and the many images that played along this dimension's webs turned into an image of the vast universe. Um, who are you? Peter asks respectfully. He's learned through the many books he's read in the library of Kamar Taj that it's best to be courteous when dealing with the less threatening dimensional entities. That doesn't matter. Just know that I'm the one that bestowed you the powers you cherish so much. She says in her old and weak-sounding voice. I thought that was. Peter speaks but the spider granny interrupts him with a scoff. The spider? She says with a roll of her eyes. Do you really think a radioactive spider bite can truly give you anything but radiation poisoning? Ah, uh, I guess not. Peter nods as that makes a lot of sense. Of course not, stupid boy. She says with a cackle-like laugh. Em, thanks for the powers I guess? Peter thanks her awkwardly. You're welcome I suppose. She says with a dismissive wave of her hand. As they're speaking, a golden portal appears, and in walks the Ancient One in all her baldness. Oh, I understand now. The Sorcerer Supreme mutters as she waltzed into the dimension casually. Hello, Peter. You had me worried there for a moment. So, this wasn't planned? Peter asks. No, only your consciousness was to be sent across the many dimensions, but your body disappeared not long after. Thankfully, you were taken here. The Ancient One says in relief as she turns toward the Spider Granny. Greetings, Great Weaver. It's been a while since we've last met. Yao, it's certainly been long, hasn't it? I see you're still connected to that vile place. The Great Weaver says, showing a brief moment of disgust. I would appreciate it if we didn't speak of that in front of my student. The Ancient One says, giving the Great Weaver a stern look. Oh relax, he'll find out sooner or later. The Pattern Maker said as much. Though I'll respect your wishes and not speak on the subject any further. The Granny says with a shrug. I see. The Ancient One goes quiet for a moment. Em, who's the pattern maker? Peter asked in confusion. You don't need to worry about that. At least not for a while yet. The Great Weaver says and turns back to the Ancient One. I'm done with your student. You may take him back now. Let's go, Peter. The Ancient One says as she walks back to her open portal without another word. Yigriga Peter follows behind her but turns to look over his shoulder for a moment. 
It was nice meeting you. The great weaver doesn't reply, but when the portal closes and she's left alone, a small smile creeps onto her face. I hope you survive and meet my expectations, Peter. As Peter returns to Kamar Taj with the Ancient One, he turns to her and smiles evilly. So, Yao, huh? Flashback continued, so, Yao, huh? Peter says as the Ancient One turns to him with a stern glare. Is it so interesting that I have a name just like everyone else? She asks as she takes a seat and conjures some tea. I mean, yeah. Peter nods as he takes a seat as well. Well, I would ask that you don't use that name. It's a thing of the past and should be left there. She says seriously as she sips her tea. Sure, I won't tell a soul. Peter says with an understanding nod. He could tell that there is some history behind this, which he'll probably never know. Though he'll respect her wishes and not use her name. Peter's just happy to be one of the few to know the real name of the Ancient One. So, are we not going to talk about the spider lady that kidnapped me? Peter asks as he drinks some tea as well. The Great Weaver is a neutral entity in the vast dimensions. Though that doesn't mean she will have your best interests in mind. Neutral doesn't mean good. Be wary of her intentions. The Ancient One explains as she tops off her tea once again. That's it? Peter asks as he barely learned anything. If you want to learn more, find out on your own time. She says as she waves her hand, drawing a spell circle made of eldritch energy in the center of the air. Now is the time for training. Tell me about this. Knowing that he won't get anything out of her, Peter just goes with the flow and decided to look into this when he has the opportunity. It's a spell circle. They're the building blocks of the mystic arts and are used to perform most magic. The few arts that don't need spell circles are personal energies, forming energy weaponry, and astral projection. If there are any other subjects that don't fall under the spell circle umbrella then I haven't learned them yet. Peter explains. Anything else? She asks expectantly. Spell circles are made up of spell lines, runes, glyphs, and other symbols. Almost anything can be done with the right combination of these things. Certain powerful spells will require the spell circle, or circles depending on the difficulty, to be accompanied by certain chants or incantations. Peter explains further. Although Peter didn't read about it in any books, he had a theory about advanced spells. Based on seeing the Ancient One always using magic without any visible spell circles, Peter has guessed that she doesn't need them for menial tasks anymore. His theory is that she has mastered the spell and therefore needs no spell circle. Either that, or she's using some sort of invisible or microscopic spell circle. Peter didn't mention this as he wasn't sure if he was correct or not. He'll ask her when his skills in spell crafting are up to par. Hmm, good enough. The Ancient One nods as her spell circle turns slightly and a jet of water shoots out, pushing Peter across the room before disappearing. Go to one of the courtyards and practice that spell. Spitting some water out of his mouth, Peter glares in the Ancient One's direction only to find her leaving the area. I expect you to have this spell learned within the hour. She says as she rounds the corner, leaving the room. Don't destroy the fabric of the universe while I'm gone. Flashback end. Ever since that day, Peter has been learning spells every day. All the spells he's learning consist of three different types of magic conjuration, transmutation, and enchantment. Conjuration is magic that conjures anything from thin air. A subdivision of this art is transmutation, which is simply a conversion of one object or individual into another. Making creatures with either art would create a real, living, and breathing thing. Truth be told, the spell circle is a bit simpler when transmuting compared to conjuring. Having physical matter to use instead of nothing but the air just makes it easier. Peter has learned to conjure slash transfigure some small animals and objects. The objects came out warped and messed up at first but he got the hang of it. The real horror came when he was making living things. Let's just say that terrifying Lovecraft-style creatures were created and sometimes still made during Peter's practice to this day. Of course, they are dealt with swiftly, so as not to prolong any pain or risk them getting loose among the public. Enchanting is magic that adds certain properties to an object or individual. Peter learned many enchantments. For example, he could make objects or people as light as a feather or as heavy as a mountain. He thought of Thor's hammer while learning these enchantments. There was one enchantment that he loved learning, which was the flying enchantment. Peter could make objects and individuals, like himself, fly. Though he can't move very fast while doing so and it's not the easiest to control. The fastest he could fly while using this spell on himself is around 10 miles per hour, which was pitiful compared to his normal top speed of 108 miles an hour. Though, that speed can be increased with practice. That's right, thanks to his training in the spider lair, Peter has upped his running speed from 100 miles per hour to 108 miles per hour. This isn't the only thing he enhanced as his strength grew to almost 11 tons as well. 
It was a slow build but compared to normal people, Peter was growing at an astronomical pace. Finally being able to practice spells, Peter felt amazing. Thankfully, his time spent studying in the library for a month came in handy, as he didn't have to sit in lectures and learned around one to three spells a day, depending on how hard they were. As the school week came to an end, Midtown High hosted a pep rally followed by a football game, which welcomed everyone in the community to attend, eat some food, and enjoy themselves. Peter, Ned, and MJ went together, but their families had work and couldn't make it to these events. This was fine as they didn't really care about the football game and just hung out and ate some food together. Speaking of Ned and MJ, their meeting was a fairly awkward one. Flashback, after Peter and MJ were suspended from school, Ned rushed over to Peter's apartment as soon as school was out. Knocking on the door, May let him in and Ned rushes past her without thinking, heading straight to Peter's room. Pushing open the door, Ned speaks before he could take in his surroundings. Dude, what's going on? I thought you had a crush on Liz. Ned says as the room goes silent. Sitting in the room alongside Peter was MJ, who heard exactly what Ned said as clear as day. She and Peter were sitting in front of his computer, watching random YouTube videos together. He invited her over after their suspension and neither of their guardians had a problem with it. They were suspended from school, but they didn't exactly do anything wrong. Ah. Uh, hey, Ned. Peter says awkwardly as he pauses the video. Ned stands out of place in the doorway. He didn't know what to say and neither did MJ, who stared between Peter and Ned questioningly. MJ, this is Ned. He's my best friend. Ned, this is MJ. My new, friend. Peter carries on the awkwardness as he introduces them. Ah. Uh, hey, MJ. Ned says as he starts speaking without thinking. I didn't know. You're obviously better than Liz. Um. As Ned starts putting his foot in his mouth, MJ just stares at him blankly, her eyebrow inching higher as he speaks. Dude, just stop talking? Please. Peter tells him in exasperation. After a moment of silence, MJ tries and fails to hold back her laughter. You guys are losers. You know that, right? MJ says as her giggles subside. It takes a loser to know a loser. Peter says with a smile as the awkward atmosphere slowly faded away. I guess you're right. MJ laughs again and wipes her tears. She wasn't worried about Liz Allen. If Peter wanted to ask her out he would've, but that didn't happen. Also, Peter wouldn't have stood up for her so extremely if he wasn't interested. Maybe he would've helped, but he wouldn't have gotten physical with Flash. Peter's known as a straight-laced nerd, who never gets in trouble. Punching someone in the face in front of the entire school was definitely out of character for Peter. Ah, uh, did I fix it? Ned asks cluelessly. Hearing him ask this, Peter and MJ just look at each other and shake their heads in exasperation. Yeah, man. Don't worry about it. Do you want to watch YouTube videos with us? Peter says as he motions towards the computer. Yeah, sure. Ned agrees easily. Flashback end, after that plane crash of a first meeting, Ned and MJ got along just fine. The awkward first impression may have actually made it easier for them to become better friends. There was no awkwardness or third wheel type feelings when they all hung out together. Ever since that day, the three of them became a sort of friend group, and that was a first for all three of them. MJ has always been a loner while Peter and Ned have only ever had each other and two isn't a group. When the pep rally and the football game came to an end, the weekend arrived and the day of the homecoming dance was finally here. Peter still hasn't seen MJ's outfit for the night. Whether she's going to wear a dress or a hoodie and jeans, he has no idea. Since it was the weekend, May and MJ's mother, Grace, had the day off work, so they wanted to meet and take pictures for the occasion before MJ and Peter set off. Arriving at a nearby park, as it would look good for the pictures, Peter and May waited for MJ and her mother to show up. Peter was dressed to impress in his all-black slim-fit suit. You've really grown up, haven't you? May says as she fussed over his suit. May, stop. It's fine. Peter says as he bats her hands away. I'm just so shocked to see you in a suit. It highlights all the workouts you've been doing too. She says as she gives his biceps a quick squeeze. Stop feeling me up, you cougar. I'm taken. Peter exclaims loud enough for some nearby people to overhear. Don't make jokes like that. May says as she smacks his chest and turns to the onlookers. He's just joking. It's his first high school dance tonight. When the misunderstanding was explained, the onlookers left them alone and Peter started laughing at the whole situation. He has been dealing with May's constant fussing for the whole day, so getting a little revenge made it all feel worth it. I see you two are having fun. A voice says as Peter and May turn to see MJ and her mother, Grace. If you can call it that? May says under her breath as she glares at Peter, who has stopped laughing completely. Upon seeing MJ's appearance, Peter couldn't help but freeze for a moment as he looked her up and down. 
She wore a black long sleeve sweater dress with knee-high boots. MJ's hair was wavy and silky as it hung loosely down to her shoulders. Everything was perfect, including her makeup, which leaned more toward a natural look. MJ is a bit of a tomboy so things like red lipstick and the like aren't her forte. My eyes are here, Peter. MJ says as she gestures up to her face. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Peter said as he stops gawking at her. You just look too cute. Don't say that, idiot. MJ replies embarrassingly as her mother and May smile on the sidelines. Please, don't mind her. Grace says as she pulls out a camera. Let's get some pictures before the sun sets. While being manhandled by the older women in the group, Peter and MJ were made to make different poses as they took an uncountable amount of pictures. That's it. We're not taking any more photos. MJ puts her foot down after the thousandth picture. Yeah, we should get going. Peter follows her lead. Seeing that the sun was beginning to set, May and Grace reluctantly put their cameras away. After some goodbye hugs, Peter and MJ took the nearest subway to Midtown High School. They could have gotten a ride from Grace, who offered to drive them, but they've both had enough of their parental figures for the day. You wore a dress. Peter states as they ride the subway together. Yeah, my mom helped me pick it out. I actually kind of like it. Less frilly and complicated, you know? MJ explains, yup, it fits you perfectly. Peter agrees with a nod. You, no more compliments for the night, please. I don't think I can handle anymore without some hard drugs. MJ says with a scoff, but Peter caught the small smile that graced her lips. As they arrived at their stop, Peter and MJ took a short walk to the school, where everyone was arriving and packing into the school. Occasionally, Peter and MJ would see a limousine roll up and drop off a group of students. Almost everyone was dressed to impress as they made their way to the gymnasium, which was decorated so well that it looked more like a club than a gym. Walking inside the school, Peter and MJ turned some heads as neither of them usually dressed like this. Peter tended to hide his body with hoodies and sweaters, while no one expected to see MJ in a dress. Seeing Peter's impressive physique in his slimming suit and MJ in a dress with her hair and makeup done was a shock to everyone. Making their way to the gym, Peter and MJ were impressed by whoever put all of this together. For a public school, this was some private school kind of decorating. Want to hang out in a corner somewhere like the losers we are? Peter asks, as he didn't know what to do with himself. God, yes. MJ agrees instantly as they find a secluded corner away from everyone. Is Ned still coming? MJ asked as they watched the gym slowly fill up. Yeah, he just got on the subway though. Peter says as he checks his phone for any texts from Ned. He said to give him 10 minutes. While they waited for Ned, Peter and MJ just sat in a corner, eating the occasional snacks as they people watched. MJ introduced Peter to this pastime. You just sit in a public area, watch people, and sometimes talk about them. Occasionally, MJ would draw someone that she found interesting, but she didn't bring her supplies with her today. Who do you think will be the first to dance? Peter asks. Just like any other high school dance, the dance floor itself is deserted. Most people feel awkward about dancing, so magnify that feeling by 10x for teenagers with raging hormones. No one wanted to be the first to dance and possibly make a fool of themselves, so music played as everyone stood around the dance floor, talking to their friend groups. Maybe, Ned? Though he would have to get here first. MJ says jokingly as she scans the crowd. I think it'll be Flash. Peter says with a small laugh. As Peter says this, both of their eyes find said person in the crowd. Flash dressed in a normal tuxedo, but that wasn't the first thing anyone noticed when looking at him. His face is bruised and still healing. A nasal cast sits on his nose from Peter's punch. Walking with a slight hobble, Flash nurses his broken ribs almost constantly. We really did a number on him. MJ comments. Yeah, but he hasn't bullied anyone since, so maybe this is a good thing for him. Peter says as he shrugs uncaring. Yeah, maybe. Soon enough, Ned joins them in their loser's corner. He's dressed in an old 70s style power blue tuxedo with those ruffles on the dress shirt. It was truly something Ned would wear, and he looked good in it. As the night went on, the three kept to themselves but still enjoyed the night. About an hour after Ned showed up, the dance floor started to fill. MJ was right in her guess as Ned was the first to go up and dance. Though he only did it because she dared him to. Do you want to dance, MJ? Peter asked as some slower music was playing. Hell no. She rejects instantly. Peter merely shrugged as he wasn't much of a dancer either. Though he's sure they would dance at some point in the future. Maybe at the next school dance? As homecoming came to an end at 10 p.m. sharp, the chaperones ushered everyone out, where everyone made their way home. Peter, Ned, and MJ took the subway together as usual. Ned was the first stop, which left Peter and MJ alone together. 
Peter would be the next stop, but he stayed with MJ. You missed your stop. MJ says as the doors close. Yup, I'm walking you home. Peter says with a smile. We've been over this. MJ rolls her eyes. I can get home by myself. I know, but I want to spend more time with you. Peter says as he holds her hand. Although I love Ned, we didn't get much time to ourselves tonight and it's late. MJ doesn't know what to say, so she just sighs and looks away, hiding her face for a moment. She's used to Peter holding her hand at this point, as he does it at least once whenever they're together. It's starting to become a thing she looks forward to in a weird way. It's not that late. She ignores everything he said except this. As they get to her stop, Peter and MJ walk to her house hand in hand. As they arrive, Peter sees MJ's house for the first time. It's a small house in an okay neighborhood. Certainly not something to brag about, but at least they have a house unlike Peter and May, who is bled dry every month by rent payments. So, as they stood at the end of the driveway, Peter turns to MJ and his brain froze. So, MJ mimics him as she's in the same situation he is. Um, can I kiss you? Peter asks nervously. Just do it. I swear you're such an Edie. MJ mutters but Peter doesn't let her finish. Without another word, Peter leans forward and grasps her waist, pulling MJ close, as he plants a soft kiss on her lips. It wasn't anything crazy and ended swiftly as they separated. MJ stared at him like a deer in headlights, while Peter simply smiled. As the young couple was having their moment, a muffled bang came from MJ's house, surprising the two. I said leave. MJ's mom roars loud enough for Peter and MJ to hear from the end of the driveway. What the? Peter mutters as he dashed toward the door followed by a worried daughter. In a dark office, which seems to be underground as it has no windows, Nick Fury hunches over a desk filled with paperwork. He's been reviewing field reports for missions performed by the many agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. all around the world. Some were still active while others had concluded with either success or failure. He's been looking over reports for the past seven hours and looked to be fed up by now. Who knew being the head of the world's largest and most powerful extra-government spy agency would be so hard? Suddenly, the door opens, and in walks a nameless shield grunt who handed the director a manila folder before saluting and taking his leave. Opening it up, Fury sees multiple surveillance photos and a log that described the daily life of the people in the photos. As he looked at each photo one by one, the usual hard and stern Nick Fury disappears as a sad and fond look forms on his face. Anyone who knew him would immediately think something was wrong upon seeing Fury's current state. As he looks through the photos, Fury notices something alarming, or rather someone. Checking the log, his eyes widen as the stern Nick Fury returns in full force. This mother schmucker. Fury curses as he stands and leaves the room, slamming the door behind him. Left on his desk is a picture of MJ and Peter holding hands together while shopping. Next to the photo is the log which was filled with words, but one thing stood out. Possible boyfriend? Bang, I said leave. MJ's mom, Grace roars loud enough for Peter and MJ to hear from the end of the driveway. What the? Peter mutters as he dashed toward the door followed by a worried daughter. Jiggling the doorknob, Peter found that it was unlocked. Letting himself in, he saw Grace throwing pots and pans at a man in all black with a trench coat and eye patch. As soon as he saw who it was, Peter froze in shock. Nick Fury? I won't let you just come back into our lives and ruin MJ's special day. Grace exclaims like a pissed off dragon and chucks a frying pan in Fury's direction. What special day? Fury asks as he easily sidesteps the pan, which hits the wall and breaks the drywall as it falls to the floor. He didn't have time to read the full report before rushing here, so he didn't know about the homecoming dance. See, Nick? You don't even know because you left. Grace yells as she ran out of things to throw and got up in his face. Your beautiful, loving, and brilliant daughter is on a date at her first high school dance tonight. Ha! Huh? Fury grunts in surprise. Now leave right this instant before she gets home and her night is ruined by the sight of you. Grace says pointedly as Peter turns to see MJ standing behind him looking sad and angry with a hollow look in her eyes. It's too late for that. MJ says, making her and Peter's presence known. Both parents turn to see Peter and MJ standing inside with the front door wide open behind them. Hey, Michelle. Fury says, happy to see his daughter in person for the first time in a while. It's MJ. She replies with a dead look toward her deadbeat daddy. Before anyone could say or do anything else, MJ turned around and paced out of the house. Baby, wait! Grace yells as she runs after MJ and they disappear down the street. An awkward silence fills the house as Peter and Fury are the only two left behind. What makes it even worse is the glare that Peter is currently receiving. Meeting your girlfriend's father is already a nerve-wracking experience, but it's a hundred times worse when that father is Nick Fury, 
director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and one of the greatest spies to ever live. Hello, sir? Peter greets uncomfortably. Fury just keeps his glare trained on Peter without uttering a single word. Were you just in the area or? Peter tried to do anything to calm the awkward and hostile atmosphere. Go home. Nick says without giving Peter any room to object. Sure, that's probably a good idea. Peter nods as he heads toward the door to escape this awkward situation. As Peter leaves the house, Fury pulls out his phone and dials a number. Where are they? He asks. They're walking around the block, sir. Would you like me to escort them back? A voice on the other end of the phone replies. No, follow them and only reveal yourself if they're in danger. Fury orders and hangs up the phone. Walking around the house, Fury takes in the surroundings. Seeing all of the pictures around the house, he felt regret for leaving but knew it had to be done. Stealing his resolve, Nick sadly locked up the house and left shortly after Peter. While Peter was walking to the subway, he stopped in his tracks and turned back around. He didn't want to get in the middle of the Jones-slash-Watson family drama, as he only just started dating MJ, which is why he agreed to leave so easily, but he felt that a great night was ruined and wanted to fix it somehow. Returning to MJ's house, Peter found the place locked up with no one home. Taking a seat on the few steps leading up to the front door, Peter waits patiently as he takes in the fresh night air. After waiting for almost half an hour, Peter saw MJ and her mother walk back towards the house arm in arm. Both of them looked like they had been crying. Hey! Peter says with a wave. Hey, I thought you would be home by now. MJ says in surprise as she wipes any stray tears away. I was heading that way but then I remembered I didn't say good night. Peter gives her a comforting smile. Well, don't mind me. Grace says as she makes her way toward the door. Huh? It's locked? He must have locked it before leaving. Peter says as MJ's mother nods and unlocks the door with her key. Don't be too long. It's getting late. Grace says as she leaves Peter and her daughter outside. Taking a seat beside Peter on the stairs, MJ sighs and looks out into the street quietly. Would you count this date as a success? Peter asks as MJ rolls her eyes at him. The beginning was horrible, but that was because my mom and your aunt went a bit overboard. The middle was great while the end was what I would describe as a car crash. MJ says as she hugs her knees. Hmm, I see. Peter says as he puts his arm around her shoulder. Then we'll just have to keep dating until we get it right. Pfft, you're such a loser. MJ looks away as Peter pulls her close to him. It's okay. Peter says as he reaches his other arm around her, hugging MJ as she cradles herself into a ball. I just wish he would have showed up tomorrow or something. MJ says, getting teary-eyed and sniffily. When I saw him standing there I was so angry, but also happy. Isn't that sad? I was happy to see the man that ditched me and my mom without a single word. We just woke up one morning and he was gone. He didn't even say goodbye. I'm sorry. Peter says as he squeezes her gently in his arms. You didn't do anything. MJ says as she sniffles and rests her head on Peter's chest. Yeah, I'm just sorry you had to go through that. Peter clarifies. It wasn't all bad. My mom and I are really close now, which is why I didn't mind not having friends in school. My best friend was at home. MJ says and Peter looks over his shoulder towards a nearby window. He could hear Grace wipe some tears as she snooped on her daughter from a nearby window. Though he wouldn't rat her out. May would probably do the same. Do you want your dad to show up again? Peter asks as he glances at a black unmarked car that was parked down the street. With his enhanced senses, Peter knew that the car was filled with people, who were likely S.H.I.E.L.D. agents sent by her father. He could hear listening devices playing what they said through headphones in the car, so they were recording and would probably report this back to Fury. I don't know. MJ muttered as she sniffles into his chest. I just want to know why, you know. Yeah, I get it. Peter nods. Maybe you should ask him next time he shows up. Sure, if I didn't already scare him away. MJ says in self-deprecation. He's your father. I doubt you could ever scare him away. Peter says as he glances at the car once again. It's already happened once. She says in a small voice. I highly doubt the reason your father left all those years ago was because of you or your mother. Peter says, very sure of himself. You don't know that for sure. MJ says as she burrows further into Peter's arms. And neither do you. Peter used her own words to prove his point. It's a lot more likely that your father is some sort of secret agent or something. Maybe even a hitman. I mean did you see his trench coat and that eye patch? Pfft, yeah right. MJ laughs as Peter hears the car of agents trying and failing to hold back their laughter as well. After comforting MJ for a while, Peter left and was surprised to find another group of agents following him, which were most likely sent by Fury. He didn't think that the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. would waste resources on him, 
but it seemed like MJ's daddy is more protective than he thought. I still can't believe Nick Fury is MJ's dad. I don't remember seeing her father in the movies, but it couldn't have been Fury, could it? Peter thought questioningly. The whole way home, Peter sensed the agents follow him, never getting close but always on his tail. When he rode the subway, Peter knew that they followed him into the train and were only a couple of passenger cars down. Upon arriving home, an unmarked black sedan showed up. The people that were following Peter got in the car and sat outside all night, watching the place in a similar manner to how the agents at MJ's house were. Listening carefully, Peter heard that they couldn't listen in on the apartment. Thankfully, there are too many people living in the building for their equipment to hone in on just one single area. They were forced to simply stake out the place and watch it with binoculars. Hearing this, Peter closed his room's curtains and blinds without rousing any suspicion. He made it look like he was simply making the rounds before bed. Not putting it past Fury to bug his house in the short time since he's met him, Peter used his enhanced senses to search the apartment from top to bottom. It seems like he overestimated Fury as nothing was found. Though that doesn't mean Peter would let his guard down. He'll have to make periodic searches of the house from now on, or come up with some sort of tech to block surveillance devices. With that done, Peter was going to leave for his spiderly duties, but then he looked at his phone warily and sighed. He usually takes his phone with him every night to hear the police dispatch, but now that he's on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s radar, it's likely that Fury is or will be tracking it. Peter could get away with using his phone before because of how crowded NYC is. Anyone trying to find Spider-Man by tracking nearby smartphones would pick up tens of thousands of phone signals in any given area, making it an impossible task. Almost 9 million people lived in the city and that wasn't even counting the huge population of tourists that come and go every day. Knowing that he can't take his phone with him anymore, Peter decided to take the night off and work on a solution. Sorry, New York. You'll have to survive one night without Spider-Man. Peter thought. He could use his newfound knowledge of cryptography, network security, coding, etc. to block anyone from locating and snooping into his phone, but that may alert Fury and make S.H.I.E.L.D. suspicious, so Peter came up with a better idea. Peter hacked into his phone and added a new setting under the unassuming name VPN. When the setting is toggled on, his phone would freeze any location tracking to his last known location, so if he turns it on now and leaves, the phone would register him still inside his bedroom. Peter also made it impossible for anyone to use his phone as a surveillance device, while also hiding the use of the ham radio app. He didn't bother hiding that he has the app, as it's something a nerd like him would be interested in and everyone has a few apps that they downloaded and never use. Other than that, Peter didn't have anything to hide in his phone. He mainly uses it for personal things, so nothing incriminating is on it. The only problem he will have is the breach of privacy due to Fury being an overprotective father, but he can deal with that. If he were to completely lock S.H.I.E.L.D. out of his phone, they would likely think Peter's some sort of spy that's trying to use Fury's daughter against him or something. The only thing that could raise some suspicion is the fact that they won't be able to spy on Peter through the cameras or microphone in the phone, but that will hopefully be chalked up to a glitch or hardware issue. Peter just has to live while knowing that his girlfriend's father is most likely reading their private messages, which is unsettling, to say the least. He'll just have to stray away from the casual meat grinder pick and make sure MJ doesn't send any nudes either. Though neither of them is the type to do that anyway. Just in case, Peter swiped May's phone and made it impossible for S.H.I.E.L.D. to use her phone as a surveillance device as well. It may increase their suspicion, but both he and May have the same model phone, which they bought at the same time. Hopefully, they'll just think that both phones have some sort of issue. Thankfully, nothing else in the house could be used as a surveillance device. Peter's computer has no microphone or webcam, and May only uses her phone and the TV. By the time Peter had finished putting in the safeguards against S.H.I.E.L.D. and HYDRA by extension, it was already morning. Deciding to not mess up his sleep schedule, Peter went to the kitchen and started brewing some coffee. While drinking coffee and watching TV, Peter sent MJ a good morning text. Suddenly, Peter felt as though he was forgetting something. Thinking for a moment, it dawns on him and Peter smacks his hand onto his forehead. How did I not think of this? S.H.I.E.L.D. has been infiltrated by HYDRA and MJ is the daughter of Nick Fury, who is one of HYDRA's biggest obstacles to complete control over S.H.I.E.L.D. Peter knows Fury is a very careful and methodical man, but he doesn't know about HYDRA's infiltration yet. Even if he is only using his most trusted agents to watch his family and keeps it completely off the books, that doesn't mean at least one of those agents isn't a long-time plant from HYDRA. They could already know and have plans to use MJ and her mother against the one-eyed director. If Peter was a betting man, he would place his money on HYDRA doing so during their uprising in the Captain America, Winter Soldier movie. Might as well get some leverage just in case their plan to kill Fury fails, which it did in the movie. 
One problem gets solved and another rears its ugly head. Peter sighs audibly as he starts thinking of ways to protect his girlfriend and her mother. Brainstorming for a while, Peter couldn't come up with a way to protect them 24-7, unless he stands guard for every waking moment of their lives. The most he can think of is to put a tracker on them so he can find them in an emergency, but things like that can be found with the right tech. Knowing that this isn't something the mundane world has an answer to, Peter leaves a note for his still sleeping Aunt May and leaves for Kamartage. He knew the men from S.H.I.E.L.D. were still outside, so he simply portaled straight there. He didn't think walking them to the New York Sanctum would be the brightest idea. Arriving earlier than usual, Peter went looking for the Ancient One, who was instructing some would-be masters in one of the many courtyards of Kamartage. Peter, you're early. She greets him as she steps away from the students. I need your help with something. Peter says. All right, follow me. The Ancient One said as she gives some orders to a nearby master, who takes her place teaching the students, and leads Peter to the room where they first met. As they both take a seat, the Ancient One makes her usual tea and looks at Peter expectantly. I need to learn some enchantments that protect people. Specifically for tracking and protection. It would be best if the person I would place it on doesn't know it's there in the first place. Peter explains what he needs. I have many spells that would fit those criteria. She says with a nod. First, tell me why you need them. My girlfriend's dad is some sort of high-level spy. I mean you should see him. He looks like a badass secret agent from some video game. I met him last night. When he left, I noticed a car watching MJ's house and another followed me home. It's still there as we speak. I think MJ and her mother will be targeted because of his work, which is why her father has these people stationed to guard them. Peter explains without giving away his future knowledge. I see, you certainly have an interesting life, Peter. The Ancient One says with a smile. Yeah, it's never been boring, that's for sure. Peter gives a small laugh. I just need something that protects them while letting me know their location. Preferably in a way that they don't know about. I haven't told them about my powers and stuff yet. Hmm, so she doesn't know you're Spider-Man? She asks as Peter shakes his head. Don't hide it for too long, especially as your relationship deepens. Every secret has an expiration date, after all. I'll think on that. Peter nods, seriously considering her advice. Now that the therapy portion of our talk is over, can you teach me how to do this? I'd like to get their protection in place as early as possible. Of course, let's start one by one, and then I'll teach you how to combine all of your requests into a single spell. Minus one week later. After spending a few days mastering the enchantments to protect MJ and her mother, as these spells were a bit more advanced than he was used to, Peter portaled into their house at night to place the enchantments on both mother and daughter. He has visited the house beforehand to look for any shield surveillance devices, but it seems that Fury doesn't have it in him to spy on his own family to that extent, as Peter found none whatsoever. As he crept through the dark house, Peter was sure to keep quiet and stay away from the windows, as the shield agents were still watching MJ's house. Starting with MJ, Peter opened her door and slipped inside. On a queen-size bed in the center of the room, MJ slept soundly, bundled up in her blankets with her feet sticking out of the bottom. Grasped in her arms is a white rabbit plushie that looked slightly worn due to age. Really? Peter thought surprisingly. I didn't think she would like stuff like that. Without wasting time, as he could alert the agents outside at any moment, Peter waves his hand and three complicated spell circles draw themselves in the air floating above his sleeping girlfriend. The golden light of the eldritch energy brightens the room in a warm glow, as the spell circles descend onto MJ's body. The spell circles meld with her skin, turning into black tattoos that soon fade away completely as if they were never there in the first place. Taking a single second to admire his work, Peter moved on to Grace, who slept just next door to MJ's room. Repeating everything without a problem, the enchantment melts into her skin and Peter leaves before the light of his magic draws any suspicion. As Peter steps into a portal which closes behind him, a shield agent strolls up to the house and peeks inside the windows. They saw an odd golden light and sent someone to investigate. Not finding anything wrong with either occupant of the house, the agent returns to the unmarked car and reports back. Once Peter returned home, he repeated the same spell on his Aunt May, who slept soundly throughout the whole process. Returning to his bedroom, Peter let out a tired sigh as he dives into his bed. That should keep them safe against any mundane dangers. Peter thought. The spell did a few things. First, it protects against anybody perceived as a threat or enemy. The spell decides that on its own, so MJ, May, and Grace can't be tricked, attacked in their sleep, or any other possibilities. The protection simply creates a force field over the enchanted person's body. The force field appears only centimeters over the body and is completely invisible to the naked eye. Once the force field is activated, 
Peter will mentally receive the coordinates, which will constantly be updated if the target is on the move. The enchantment can take a lot of damage before the spell is broken, so only a powerful explosion or impact could possibly break it. Though to a master of the mystic arts, the spell can be broken in a matter of minutes. Thankfully, the spell itself isn't there to guard against sorcerers. Just normal people with mundane weaponry. It's exactly what Peter needed, which he was very thankful for. During the next school day, Peter saw Ned, which reminded him to place the protection spell on him as well. He may not technically be in any danger, but the guy is Peter's best friend. If something happens to him, he doesn't know what he would do. That night, Peter snuck into Ned's house and gave him the protection enchantment as well. Just to be safe, Peter also gave the enchantment to Ned's family. You never know what could happen, so he just did it in case of a future incident. Once everyone was protected, Peter could go back to his normal schedule without issue. Recently, he's figured out a plan to secure his online activity as Spider-Man. Peter bought a few laptops with his leftover money and carefully took them all apart. He would be using these pieces to create what he calls a ghost laptop. In theory, the laptop would be able to safely use the internet in every way possible without the risk of being traced back to anywhere or anyone. No IP address, HTTP referrers, cookies, tracking pixels, super cookies, user agents browser fingerprinting, routing information, email metadata, etc. No trace or record whatsoever. It would be as if Peter's online activity is that of a ghost. Without any evidence or trail left behind for nosy people or organizations to follow back to him. What Peter finds especially useful is that the laptop would connect itself to every cell tower and Wi-Fi signal within range. Bypassing whatever password protection or company protection, and merging all of them into a singular online connection, keeping Peter online no matter where he is. It won't alert anyone or leave any traceable information behind either. The True Ghost Laptop. He's currently still building it, but once it's completed and tested, Spider-Man could start his journey as an influencer slash YouTuber. Peter just hopes it works, as this is all just theoretical at this point. He also plans to make his online accounts impenetrable by creating a password cycling program on the ghost laptop. It would change all of his passwords to something long and random every minute of the day. To get into his accounts, Peter would have to use the laptop to see the current password and input it in the time before it changes again. Seeing as the laptop would pretty much allow anyone access to his accounts and has solid proof that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, Peter planned to put a similar protection spell on the laptop that he did on his friends and family. Peter even planned to add a similar spell to Thor's hammer, as he's learned how to make things heavier and lighter weeks ago. This would completely stop theft, as no one but himself would be able to lift or open the laptop. He also planned to save room in the laptop by cooling and powering it with enchantments. Both enchantments would be extremely simple. He's already learned both freezing and lightning spells, which would only need to be powered down by a large margin so they don't cause damage. Magic plus technology speaking of, Peter wanted to use magic to make Asgard's type of technology, but that would take a lot of time. Asgard is an extremely advanced interstellar magical society, after all. Minus two weeks later, while working on everything and spending time with his family, friends, and girlfriend, Peter has finally finished working on Candy Crush. Though that doesn't mean it's a completed game yet. Peter is now in the testing phase, which means he has to play the game on a bunch of different phones to make sure it works. He can play the game on his PC all he wants, but that wouldn't test the game in the way it's going to be played, which is on mobile phones. PCs can run mobile games easily without even breaking a sweat after all. In order to announce his game to everyone and quicken the testing phase, Peter and Ned invited everyone over to showcase it and use them as game testers. As everyone showed up, Peter finished downloading the game onto a bunch of outdated smartphones. When making a game, it's best to stress test it on a lower quality piece of hardware. That way you know for sure that there won't be any problems for those with outdated and newer model phones. When everyone arrived, Peter saw Ned, May, MJ, and Grace sitting in the living room. Peter walked over with a box full of smartphones and handed them out one by one. Standing in front of everyone, Peter unlocks one of the phones and taps the Candy Crush icon on the home screen. Music plays as Peter displays the phone to the crowd. A black screen appears and the words, Parker Games fade in with a short but sweet animation. The image changes and a much more impressive animation plays, highlighting the different aspects of the game with cute candy characters. Below the video, a loading bar fills slowly but surely. Thank you all for coming. Peter says as Ned stands beside him, looking excited and accomplished. No problem, Peter. Grace says as she and everyone else look at Peter expectantly. Yeah, no problem. Now, what's this all about? Did you call us here to play some shitty mobile game? 
MJ says it how it is, not putting two and two together after seeing the Parker Games logo. No, not just any shitty mobile game. My shitty mobile game. Peter says with a smile as the game fully loads, showing the main menu. I help too. Ned says, excitedly raising his hand. Oh yeah, Ned helped and gave me ideas along the way. Peter clarifies as he pats his best friend on the shoulder. Hearing this, everyone opens their outdated phones and sees the only app on the home screen. Candy Crush? MJ says skeptically as she and everyone else opens the app. Why did you make this garbage? My mom would probably play this. Hey! Grace elbows her daughter. What? It's the truth. MJ says with a shrug as she turns to Peter, waiting for his answer. Money. Peter replies without a single ounce of shame. He didn't disagree with her, as he felt the same way. Though the money is always in the mainstream community. The normies so to speak. You didn't. MJ says in disbelief as she taps the shop icon on the home screen. You're evil. Peter didn't reply and just smiled like a hungry shark stalking its prey. You're evil. MJ states as she sees the many microtransactions built into the game. May and Grace were confused as they didn't know what MJ was talking about. We've joined the dark side. Ned says in a slightly deeper voice than usual. Can someone explain what's going on? May asks as Grace nods alongside her. Ned and I made a pay-to-win mobile game. It's pretty much a game that you can play for free but requires payments if you want to speed up your progress or unlock certain perks that the free players don't get access to. If you open the shop by tapping the bank icon, you'll see the in-game currency that can be purchased. From 10 gold for 99 cents to 1000 gold for 74 dollars and 99 cents. I've started you all out with 1000 gold for free. Peter explains as MJ starts playing the tutorial. As Peter walks everyone through how the game works, they all begin playing. What truly surprised him was MJ's focus on the game. She seemed to like this mainstream garbage more than she originally let on. MJ, May, and Grace immediately became glued to their screens as the room went quiet. All that could be heard was the sound effects and music of the game from multiple perspectives. Peter didn't get a chance to explain that they were testing the game for him, but he didn't want to interrupt so he and Ned started playing the game as well. As time flew by, Peter ordered pizza for everyone as payment for testing the game. Throughout the day, any bugs or glitches were brought to Peter and Ned's attention and listed down to be fixed later on. Since Candy Crush isn't a game that needs too much focus, Peter played some movies to watch in the background as they played. Soon enough, the sun set and MJ put her phone down before looking at Peter, impressed by his work. Did you just trick us into testing your game for you? MJ asks as realization dawns on her. Yeah, pretty much. Peter nods as he sets his phone down as well. How long did it take you and Ned to make this? May joins the conversation. Well, Peter did most of the work. Ned says, knowing he only had a hand in about 10% of the game. Don't sell yourself short. You helped a lot, Ned. Peter says reassuringly as he turns back to May. It took a little over a month to make everything. It's a fairly simple game to develop after you get the visuals and sound out of the way. Wow, I heard you were smart, Peter, but this is really impressive. Grace was beyond impressed. Thanks, what do you guys think of the game overall? Any complaints or ideas to throw in? Peter asks. Everyone had only praise to say for the game, but MJ, who was, stood silent as everyone looked at her for her input. Okay, I'm sorry for calling it a shitty mobile game. It's actually kind of fun. MJ admits as she takes out her phone. Can you download it onto my phone as well? I want to play it during lunch at school. Peter doesn't respond and just smiles at her, which makes MJ feel embarrassed. Stop looking at me like that. MJ says as her mother laughs. It's okay, MJ. I'm happy that you like it. It took a good amount of work. Peter smiled as he sat beside MJ and put his arm around her. MJ looked awkwardly at her mother, who simply smiled at Peter's show of affection. Not in front of my mom. MJ hissed as she pushed Peter away. Oh, don't mind me. Grace says as she and May enjoy the show. Sure. Peter pecks MJ on the cheek and scoots away before she could react. I could give you the game now, but it would probably be better to wait until it's finished. I just need you guys to keep the phones I gave you and play when you have spare time. If you run into any glitches or bugs, text me the details, and I'll fix it before submitting it to the different mobile app stores. After taking their new outdated phones, Ned, MJ, and Grace took their leave. As she was leaving and no one was looking, MJ gave Peter a quick goodbye kiss. MJ's not very comfortable with public shows of affection, which is understandable. Especially in front of her mother. Though that doesn't mean she isn't an affectionate person. In fact, when they're alone MJ becomes a lot bolder. When it was finally just May and Peter left, May turned to Peter with a worried look on her face. 
Are you sure this is okay, Peter? You said you made the game for money, not to mention that construction job you took before school started. I know we aren't the most well-off family, but we get by just fine. I just don't want you to worry about money and focus on school and enjoying your life. She voices her doubts and worries. Taking a seat next to his Aunt May on the sofa, Peter sighs as he thought this may happen. May, this isn't about us not having enough money or anything like that. I thought game development was interesting, so I started studying up on it and thought making a game would be fun. The reason I started with a mobile game is that it's an easy starting point. As for the pay-to-win aspect, I just thought it would be an easy way to make money. Maybe pay for college and start a savings account for the future. Peter tries to placate May's worries. I see. May sighs in relief. Besides, school is easy. I don't even study anymore and I'm at the top of my class. Working on this game hasn't impacted my grades or enjoyment at all, and once it's released, I won't have to do much anymore. I'll only have to add some updates on rare occasions. Also, if the game takes off, you could work fewer shifts at the hospital. I know you'd never quit, but shorter shifts would be nice right? Peter says, knowing she likes her career too much to give it up. That would be nice. May was certainly tempted. Good, just know that I'm fine. I plan to enjoy every second of my life. Peter says as he hugs May tightly. Alright, you've convinced me. Do I need to do anything to help since you're a minor? May asks as they separate. Well, we need to do a few things. Peter sighs knowing the paperwork is going to be annoying. We need to register a business under the Parker Games name and copyright Candy Crush. Then file Parker Games as an LLC and open a business account for the money we make. What's an LLC? May asks. It basically makes Parker Games a company that's a separate legal entity from its owners. An LLC or limited liability company has looser filing requirements, regulations, and fewer taxes to worry about. If we didn't file under an LLC, the taxes from all the money we make would be counted as personal revenue and taxed at a much larger percentage. Peter explains. Although Peter originally didn't want to start a company, as it would be too time-consuming, the LLC will only make Parker Games a company in name. He has no plans to make this complicated. Parker Games would merely make digital games, which would be released in online stores. No random employees, towers with his name on them, or factories pumping out goods. Peter's too busy for all of that and wants to enjoy his new life. Wow, you really did your research. May mutters, impressed by Peter's commitment to this. Yeah, I spent some time looking into it. Though, there is a downside to this. We would have to mark ourselves as employees of the company and get paid that way. The money Parker Games makes would belong to the company, which will be paid out to us as employees in a monthly or weekly paycheck. I can't just pay myself some crazy number either, as that would not make the IRS very happy. Peter explains the few downsides. Though that doesn't mean Peter can't use company funds for anything business-related. A company car, jet, properties, and supplies for future projects. Pretty much anything worded as a company expense can be paid for by Parker Games, which Peter would be the majority owner of. Peter planned to give Ned and May a small piece of the company. Ned, because he helped with the first game and May, for always being there and taking care of him. Who knows where Peter Parker would be without his Aunt May. Spider-Man may not exist in that parallel universe. Though everyone that tested the game would be put on payroll. MJ and her mother Grace would be receiving paychecks as Parker Games' official game testers, so they won't be left out. Peter just has to wait until Candy Crush launches and starts picking up traction. Once the money rolls in, Peter would share the profits with the few friends and family he has. You impress me every day, you know that? May says genuinely. I do my best to impress. Minus one week later, after a week of game testing and bug fixes, Peter has officially finished the development of Candy Crush. May hired a business lawyer, who was a friend of hers from college, to help with all the paperwork. The lawyer gave them a good discount for her services too. She got all the paperwork together for them and walked Peter and May through filling it all out. Once they were finished, the lawyer filed all the papers for them. Parker Games was on its way to being a real company, while Candy Crush would be copyrighted soon enough. While waiting to hear back about the paperwork for Parker Games and Candy Crush, Peter turned his focus onto the ghost laptop. Filing for an LLC is supposed to take 3 to 5 business days, while the copyright of Candy Crush will take around 3 months. Though that doesn't mean Peter can't start selling the game. The second Peter paid the fee and sent in the paperwork plus a copy of Candy Crush, the US Copyright Office emailed him with a registration date. That date is the time they received everything, which means he can start selling the game on that date. That means that Peter can start selling Candy Crush right now. Though he plans to wait until his business is made, the LLC goes through, and he opens a business bank account. He also needs to link that business account with the Candy Crush shop, 
But that would have to wait for another day. Now that Peter doesn't have to work on the game for a while, his extra time can be put to good use. The ghost laptop is his biggest project yet and Peter just hoped it worked. After a few days of undivided attention, the laptop was fully put together. Booting it up, the lightning enchantment powered it, as Peter slipped in an installation disk for the Windows 7 operating system. Though it's not just Windows 7 anymore. After some upgrading and tweaking the operating system so it would work in harmony with the ghost laptop, Peter wouldn't even call it Windows 7 anymore. As the laptop screen lit up, instead of the Windows 7 red, blue, green, and yellow flag, a black boot-up screen with a ghostly white figure in the center appeared. Below the ghost is a button that says Install. Clicking it, Peter waits as Windows Ghost installs itself onto the laptop. Hmm, that's a pretty good name. Peter thought as he watched the loading bar slowly fill. Soon enough, the loading bar filled and the laptop restarted. Once again, the ghost icon showed as it booted up and the laptop's desktop screen appeared. Sighing in relief, Peter knew that the hardest part was past him. The laptop was turned on and his operating system is working. Before connecting to the internet to run further tests, Peter switched to his spider suit and portaled across the city to the top of a skyscraper. He didn't know for sure if everything would work as he planned, and if it didn't, who knows how many alarms he'll set off with this thing. Just the feature that merges all Wi-Fi and cell signals could fail and alert every cellular and Wi-Fi provider in the area. It's best that Peter keeps the testing of this baby far away from his life as Peter Parker. It's just too dangerous not to. Sitting at the top of the New York City skyline, Peter clicks an Ethernet cable-looking icon on the bottom right of the screen and toggles it on. As soon as he did, a small window with a list of cellular and Wi-Fi signal names appeared. A smaller window pops up in front of this window, asking Peter if he wants to merge all connections. Clicking yes, the mini window closes and a loading circle spins before the bigger window closes as well. Looking back to the Ethernet icon in the bottom right, Peter saw that it was now glowing green, signifying that he was connected to the Internet. Beside the green Ethernet icon is the number 18, which is the amount of different cellular and Wi-Fi signals that are currently being merged and used by the laptop. Opening his Internet browser, Peter types in speedtest.net and tests his Internet connection. 1239 download and 426 upload speed, which is amazing for a wireless connection at the top of a skyscraper in 2010. After testing the normal things on the laptop, like its memory, hard drives, touchpad, keyboard, power consumption, cooling, etc., Peter moved on to more in-depth tests. Speaking of the power consumption and cooling, the enchantments used for both seem to be holding without issue. The lightning spell keeps it powered as if it was plugged in at all times, while the freezing spell cools the laptop without any airflow vents required. Moving on to the more advanced tests, Peter downloaded a program that would stress test the CPU and GPU. Both could easily handle the highest level of the program and thanks to his enchantments, the laptop didn't overheat at all throughout the tests, nor did it have power issues. After the hardware, software, and internet connection was tested, Peter moved on to what the laptop was really made for. Being untraceable. Peter tested everything from his IP address to his cookies. Everything seems to be working as it should, as he has no IP address and seems to leave no data behind while using the internet. No IP address, HTTP referrers, cookies, tracking pixels, super cookies, user agents browser fingerprinting, routing information, email metadata, etc. Just as Peter hoped, the laptop seemed to be working as designed. Suddenly, while Peter was being as thorough as possible, a loud explosion was heard as the ground shook briefly like a small earthquake was happening. What the? Peter muttered as he looks over the laptop and sees smoke rising from the bottom of a nearby skyscraper. Thinking quickly, Peter powers down the ghost laptop and opens a portal, sending it back to his bedroom. As the portal closes, Peter jumps off the building and swings toward the smoking skyscraper. Arriving before the police, Peter sees a portion of the building was blown apart and was currently on fire. Smoke rises from the large hole that the explosion created as a stream of people evacuates the building below. Not having time to figure out what exactly happened, Peter swings into the burning skyscraper through the large smoking hole. Arriving inside, Peter carefully made his way through the collapsing part of the building, looking for any survivors along the way. Sadly, everyone that was in the blast radius was either turned to paste or mangled to bits. This is actually the first time Peter has seen a human body or any body in such a horrific state. It was sad and disgusting, to say the least. While clearing the way for people to evacuate and saving those that survived the blast, Peter heard something odd coming from the higher floors. I can't do it. He heard someone cry out and beg. Please don't make me. I don't want to hurt anyone. After the man spoke, 
Peter could hear a much lower voice that sounded like it was coming from a phone or some sort of small speaker. Think of your family? A woman speaks softly. I wouldn't want to kill such a kind woman like your wife, but let's not forget your children either. How old are they again? Ah, I remember. It was seven and nine wasn't it? Such beautiful girls you have. It would be such a shame if they never make it to the double digits. You know what? Let's put them on the phone. As Peter hears this, he's already rushing to the location. Whatever is happening doesn't sound good at all. The phone shuffles as two distinctly younger voices speak this time. Daddy? Where are you? I'm bored. One says. Yeah, this lady is weird and mommy doesn't look happy. I want to go home. Another says uncomfortably. Ah, uh, it's okay. Just do as the weird lady says until I'm back alright? Daddy will be home soon. The man lies through his teeth. Not liking where this is going, Peter gives up on using the crowded stairwells and breaks a nearby window. Leaping outside, he runs up the side of the building at full speed. A nearby news helicopter picks up this action and follows Spider-Man's figure with its onboard camera, broadcasting the footage live on multiple news stations. Still honed in on the man on the phone, Peter hears the voice on the phone change back to the woman from earlier. You know what to do, don't you? She says smoothly. Yeah. The man says defeatedly. Just promise me you won't hurt them. Of course, I'm a woman of my word. She says believably, though Peter wouldn't trust someone like that. All right, I'll do it. The man says, almost as if he is psyching himself up. Do it. The woman goads him on over the phone. The man's breathing becomes erratic as Peter makes it to his floor. Looking in the window, Peter sees the man he's been looking for. He's a slightly balding middle-aged man, but that wasn't the first thing Peter noticed. No, what caught his eye was the suicide vest strapped to his chest with enough bricks of C4 to blow twice the hole compared to the one downstairs. Seeing the man squeezing a button in his right hand, Peter's spider senses instantly start blaring, screaming at him that something bad was about to happen. Behind the bomb-strapped man was a line of people who were crowding into the stairwell from the upper floors. Unwilling to leave these people to die, Peter kicks off the window, shattering it into tiny pieces. Shooting two webs at the man, who was about to activate the bomb vest, Peter pulls him out of the building and catapults the guy as high into the air as possible. The nearby news helicopter picked up on this and record every second. Everyone watching wondered why Spider-Man would do such a thing. Maybe J. Jonah Jameson was right? Many people thought. Boom before they could question Peter's actions, the man he threw high into the air, away from any innocent bystanders, lights up in a big fiery explosion. The impact of said explosion shatters the glass of nearby buildings, causing a rain of glass to fall onto the streets and people below. The nearby news and police helicopters wobble for a moment before regaining stability. Since Peter was too close to the explosion, he was impacted the most out of anyone. As the shockwave of the explosion hit him, Peter was sent hurtling downward toward the busy streets of New York. Not good. Peter yells as he spins in his descent and crashed onto the roof of a parked yellow cab. Bang ouch. Peter grunts as he lifts himself out of a totaled yellow taxi cab. Standing next to the cab with a heartbroken look on his face is a man Peter recognized from the Deadpool movies in his past life. Insert picture of Dopinder here, my car. Dopinder mutters in shock and sadness. Sorry about that. Peter grunts as he brushes some broken glass off of his suit. I'm sure your insurance will cover it. My car. Dopinder exclaims. Grasped in Peter's hand is the phone that the forced suicide bomber was using shortly before his explosive death. He managed to snatch it before launching the man into the air. As Peter steps into the street, a group of people surrounds him, including medics and policemen. Are you alright? A paramedic asks as Peter stretches his sore back. Yeah, I'm good. Peter says as he shrugs his shoulders a couple of times. You can go and take care of the injured. I'm already healing up. Yes, sir. The medics listen to his orders as if Peter were their boss and scurry away. Looking down at the phone, Peter sees that the woman hung up already. She probably saw Peter's actions on the news and knew her plan failed. At least partially since the first bomb blew up. Though, Peter does have her phone number now. Are you sure you're alright, uh? Spider-Man. A police officer asks awkwardly, feeling odd about using Peter's hero name. Yeah, I'm good. Peter says as he waves off their concerns. I need one of you to take me to whoever's in charge. At first, the officers looked at each other in surprise, as Spider-Man never comes in contact with the police. They usually show up and find webbed criminals to arrest. This is definitely new for them. Ah, uh, sure follow me. One of the policemen says, leading Peter to a command tent that's been put up nearby. As they walked inside, Peter saw two groups of people standing on the opposite sides of a table. 
One side has a few high-level policemen, who are dressed in their formal uniforms. Standing on the other side are a few men and women in blue jackets with the letters FBI printed in yellow text on the back. Look, until the people from the State Department arrive, this is a federal matter and you need to take a back seat. We have more training and experience in handling acts of terrorism. It's just that simple. A lead woman with an FBI jacket explains. The upper echelon of the New York City Police Department didn't look happy after hearing this but knew arguing any further would be a waste of time. Especially while they're dealing with a major terrorist attack. Excuse me, sirs? The policeman that escorted Peter inside makes their presence known. What? Can't you see we're busy? A formally dressed policeman releases his frustrations on the poor guy, but freezes as he sees who's standing behind him. Spider-Man. The lead female FBI agent says surprisingly. Yup, it's me. Peter said, with a wave. Do you need something? She asks confusedly. Nodding his head, Peter pulled out the phone and held it up, showing everyone in the room. The man I threw away from the building was a forced suicide bomber. The first explosion was probably the work of a similar suicide bomber. While I was helping people and clearing exits, I overheard a conversation between the second bomber and a woman. She has the man's family held hostage and forced the guy to blow himself up. I didn't make it in time to stop him, so I chucked him away, as you probably saw. Peter explains as he places the cell phone on the table. Jesus Christ. One of the policemen mutters. How can we assist you, Spider-Man? The lead FBI agent asks. I'm going to track the number myself. You know, hack some cell towers and all that, but she could be on the run and covering her tracks already. As Peter says this, both sides of the table look at him disapprovingly, which he ignores. You guys have more resources at your disposal than I do, which is why I'm here. I already memorized the number, so you can keep the phone. The first side to find a location will announce it on this radio frequency. Grabbing a notepad and pen from the table, Peter scribbles a random frequency and pushes it forward. Any questions? Peter asks as he looks around the room. Yes, you are not to hack any cell towers or networks. We can handle this. You've helped enough. The female FBI agent orders. That wasn't a question. Anyone else? Peter says and waits a moment but no one answers. Alright, I'll update you on the radio soon and expect you all to show me the same courtesy. After Peter said this, he dashes out of the tent and portals home after finding a secluded area. Grabbing the ghost laptop, Peter portals back to the skyscraper from earlier and begins hacking into the nearby cell network. Peter still didn't fully trust the laptop as he hasn't thoroughly tested it, but the lives of a mother and her children were at stake. He couldn't save their father, so the least Peter could do is keep the guy's family alive and whole. After five minutes, Peter had full access to the cellular towers and networks in the area as if he were their owner and creator. Searching the phone number, Peter saw that the woman took the battery out her phone, as there wasn't a current signal. Searching the number's past signals, Peter immediately found her last known location. Accessing the radio frequency on his phone, Peter kept his word and informed the FBI and police of the location. Thank you for the help, Spider-Man. We'll have nearby officers create roadblocks on all of the roads within a five-mile radius of that location. Someone responds after a few seconds. Good, I'll check the location itself. Remember that we're looking for a woman, but that doesn't mean she won't have accomplices. Search every car and have every woman you find speak to me over this radio frequency. I remember her voice perfectly. Peter responds. Ah, uh, alright. We'll have one squad car at each roadblock tuned into this frequency. Make sure you're listening in. Powering down the laptop, Peter tosses it through a portal to his bedroom and opens another portal to the cell phone's last known location. Peter didn't expect the woman to still be here, as her plan failed and Spider-Man was involved. Most criminals run at just the mention of him after all. Stepping out of the portal, Peter looks around and sees a small family home in a suburban neighborhood in Long Island, New York. Not wasting any time, Peter kicks in the front door and rushes inside. Listening carefully, he doesn't hear a single breath or heartbeat in the entire house. Not smelling any blood either, Peter gave it a quick sweep and found no one. Clicking his tongue in annoyance, Peter knew this would happen, which is why he got the FBI and police involved. He's only one person and doesn't have the manpower that they do. Stepping outside the house, Peter catches a glimpse of an old woman peeking at him through a window across the street. A nosy neighbor, perhaps? Peter thought as he walks across the street. While making his way to the front door, Peter started hearing different roadblock checkpoints reporting in over the radio in his earpiece. Ah, hello. Knocking on the neighbor's door, Peter calls out awkwardly. It's me, Spider-Man. You know the friendly neighborhood superhero? Hoping that she knows who he is, Peter knocks one more time before she finally opens up. 
I know who you are. The elderly woman says with venom. You're that spider menace that nice man Jameson keeps warning everyone about. What were you doing across the street? Robbing those poor people, are you? Well, they already left. Now, wait here while I call the police. She says as she slams the door in Peter's face. Opening the door himself this time, as she forgot to lock it, Peter does his best to look non-threatening. Look, those people across the street were kidnapped and I'm trying to find them. Can you tell me what type of car they left in? Peter explains before the elderly woman could interrupt him. Get out of my house. She yells, not listening to Peter at all. Knowing that this is going nowhere, Peter leaves the house and is surprised to see a large group of neighborhood children forming outside. It really is Spider-Man. One of them yells and they all swarm over. Soon, the kids surround him and begin spitfiring question after question at Peter. The poor old lady's lawn was turned into a stomping ground for these excited children. Quiet. Peter yells, getting their attention. Maybe they can help? Instantly, the children freeze and shut their traps as their idol has commanded. Someone is in danger. I need to know if any of you have seen anyone leaving that house? Peter says as he points across the street. The kids start looking around at each other before a couple of them raise their hands as if they were in school. After calling on them one by one, Peter got the details he needed. Two black Escalades just left the house about 15 minutes ago and headed east down the road, which was only a minute or two after the second bomb went off. Though the next thing he heard surprised him. They had these blue jackets with yellow writing on the back. My mom said they were FBI. Are the FBI bad guys? One of the boys asks. Thank you. Peter says as he dashes away to a secluded area. Holding a button on his earpiece, Peter reports his findings over the designated frequency, shocking everyone who was listening in. Wait. I just let some Escalades past my checkpoint. They had federal identification. Someone reported over the radio. Where are you? Peter asks and instantly gets the details. I'm on the way. Opening a portal in the woods nearby, Peter leaps out of the tree line, surprising the long line of cars leading up to a police blockade. How long ago did they pass? Peter asks as he lands in front of the checkpoint. Maybe a few minutes ago. One of the policemen answers. Hearing this, Peter dashes down the road, quickly building his speed past 100 miles per hour. After running for almost 5 minutes, Peter spotted the tail end of a black Escalade driving in front of him. Thankfully, there weren't any turns up until this portion of the road, so finding them was easy. Since the road is surrounded by woods on both sides, Peter diverted into the woods for cover. Expertly avoiding trees and branches, Peter parkour through the woods and easily catches up to the two Escalades. Since the windows were tinted completely black, he couldn't see inside and relied on his hearing to assess the situation. Hearing only small talk and the sound of a radio from the leading car, Peter moved on to the secondary Escalade and instantly frowns. Coming from the back seat, Peter could hear the crying and whimpering of little girls as another voice, probably their mother, consoles them in hushed whispers. From the front seat, he could hear the woman's voice from the phone complaining about the crying children. If you don't shut those little gremlins up, I'll do it myself, and trust me you won't like how I get it done. As she says this, Peter hears the cocking of a gun. I'm already annoyed with that stupid bug, Spider-Man. I don't need to deal with crying children too. It's okay, girls. You need to calm down, okay? Mommy's here. Don't worry. The mother repeats words like this until the children slowly start to simmer down. Finally. The woman in the passenger seat says in exasperation, holstering her gun. Taking this chance, Peter shoots webs into the wheel wells of each vehicle, causing both cars to come to a screeching halt in the center of the road. As the cars are still slowing to a halt, Peter kicks off of a thick tree and launches himself at the second car. Turning himself sideways mid-air with his body as straight as a pencil, Peter torpedoes feet first into the passenger side window of the Escalade. Slipping inside of the car amongst shattered glass, Peter misses the woman in the passenger seat as his feet bash into the driver's skull, either knocking him out or killing him. Peter wasn't sure. Ah! The family of three in the back seat scream in fright. Ha! Huh? The female passenger grunts in shock as Spider-Man appears in her lap out of nowhere. Reaching for her gun, Peter acts quicker and webs her moving hand to the passenger side door. With the driver's head stopping his momentum, Peter kicks off the driver's side door, launching himself outside the passenger side door. As he lands on his feet, Peter yanks open the door, pulling the woman out of the car as her hand was stuck to the door. After immobilizing her with a couple of web shots, Peter moved swiftly to the other car, where men dressed as FBI agents were stepping out with guns drawn. Two had pistols while the other two were toting what looked like mini Uzis. Not wanting to risk the lives of the mother and her children, Peter swiftly draws the fake FBI agent's attention away from the other car. 
Shooting a web to the trees, he yanks on it and launches himself into the woods. As Peter soars into the forest, the gunman opened fire on the easy red and blue target. Though no bullets hit him and Peter instantly hid in the woods. Using the trees as cover and keeping himself out of sight. As the gunfire stops, Peter shows himself for a fraction of a second and shoots a web at a nearby shooter and pulls it roughly. Ah? The unlucky gunman screams as he's pulled into the tree line, disappearing from his accomplice's vision. The screaming continues for a brief moment before it completely dies and silence returns to the road. Give up and I won't do to you what I did to this guy. Peter yells to the three remaining people. The guy was alive as he still needed to be interrogated by the police, but Peter made it look and sound like their friend met a terrible fate. Schmuck you! One of them yells and starts shooting into the trees randomly. Alright, I warned you. Peter yells as he portals to the woods on the opposite side of the road. Leaping out of the trees, Peter shot one web from each hand toward two of the gunmen's heads. Landing between them, Peter yanks them together causing the two to smash their skulls together and fall to the ground unconscious. The last gunman turns around and sees Spider-Man standing right behind him. How? He says as Peter karate chops him on the forehead, knocking the guy out cold as he collapses on the road. Separating the guns from the criminals, Peter then webs the sleeping assailants to some nearby trees. He wouldn't want to block the road any more than it already is after all. As he finished with the front car, Peter started hearing sirens from down the road where the checkpoint was. Returning to the second Escalade, Peter saw the woman from the phone call wiggling in her cocoon of web, trying her best to break free. Stop that. Peter says as he walks past her toward the driver. Pulling the door open, Peter sighed as he found the man still alive and breathing. He thought he may have killed him there for a second. Jonah would love to report that, Peter thought in annoyance. Hello, you three can come out now. Peter calls out to the back seat as he pulls the unconscious driver out. I'm just cleaning up for the police. They'll be here soon. Peter drags the knocked out driver to the woods, where he webs him to a nearby tree as well. Returning to the street, Peter sees cop cars in the distance and the family of three standing outside the black escalade. They kept their distance from the woman webbed to the ground though. Mommy, it was Spider-Man. The youngest daughter exclaims to her mother. I saw it too. He looked just like on the TV. The older daughter matches her sister's excitement. Hey, are you three hurt anywhere? Peter asks as he walks back to the street. No, we're fine. The mother says, still slightly guarding her children. That's good. The cops will be here soon and then you can go home. Though they'll probably have questions for you. Peter explains as he starts to hear a helicopter nearby as well. Um, thank you. The mother says as her guarded demeanor loosens the closer the cop cars get. You're welcome. Peter says, feeling a little awkward about what happened to the fourth member of their family. Do you know about? My husband? Yeah. She says sadly. Even her children became sad upon hearing their conversation. Their earlier excited attitude upon seeing Spider-Man disappeared. I'm sorry. Peter apologized. It's not your fault. The mother replies genuinely. Thank you for trying and saving all of those people. It's what I do. Peter says with a shrug. Sadly, I get the occasional day like this though. You can't save everyone. The mother mutters as the police cars arrive. Yeah, I know. I try my best though. Peter says as the cops come running over. Usually, Peter would leave by this point, but this situation has taught him that sometimes he'll need to work with the police or other law enforcement agencies. Just having access to the manpower alone is enough to sway Peter towards working with the police more. He would have had a much harder time finding the woman on the phone if he didn't have their help today. As the police cordoned off the area, questioned the mother, and brought the criminals into custody, Peter hung around and gave his testimony to them. The first step to a good relationship is communication, after all. Another reason to form a good relationship with the police is that it would be less likely for them to label him as a vigilante. They haven't done so yet, but that doesn't mean it will never happen. Just one J. Jonah Jameson fan in a high position, and Spider-Man can easily be marked as a criminal vigilante. While helping out the police, the helicopter Peter heard earlier arrives and slowly lands on the open road. As the doors open, out walks a man in a black suit. He's a white man with a receding hairline. Peter recognized him instantly. Phil Coulson? Peter thought as the man himself walks in his direction. Insert picture of Phil Coulson here, sir, who are you? A line of policemen stops Phil before he can get into the scene. Phil Coulson, I'm here on behalf of the Bureau of Counterterrorism. Coulson says as he shows his credentials. Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement and Logistics Division? Never heard of it. A policeman mutters and showed the badge to his fellow officers. You ever heard of this? No one knew, which caused Coulson to be barred from entering the crime scene. 
though that didn't last for long. After Coulson stepped away to make a quick phone call, the radios of every police officer went off. The higher-ups were pissed and told them that Phil Coulson was now in charge of the whole situation, so they had to follow his orders. I'm sorry, sir. The lead officer says as he welcomes Coulson past the barriers and crime scene tape. It's alright? Phil says as he strolls in. Keep the area secure. Yes, sir. The officer replies. Ignoring everything else around him, Coulson walks right up to Spider-Man. Although S.H.I.E.L.D. would have gotten involved in this situation, either way, seeing Spider-Man involved made them act much quicker. That swift action paid off too, as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. is about to make contact with a possible member of the Avengers Initiative. Hello. Coulson greeted as he walked up to the one and only Spider-Man. I'm Agent Coulson with the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division. Showing his credentials with one hand and extending his other to shake hands, Coulson was surprised when Spider-Man swipes his badge and ignores his outstretched hand. Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement and Logistics Division. Wow, that's a mouthful. Peter mutters as he looks over Phil's shield ID. Yes, we're told that often. Coulson nods as he retracts his hand with an awkward smile. I'm sure. Why not abbreviate and call it shield? It's the first letter of each word after all. Peter says as he hands Phil his badge back. We've thought of that but it has to be officially decided on. Coulson says as he pockets his badge. Well, how can I help you, Coulson? I was just about to head home. Peter asks. Truthfully, the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division would like to have a relationship with you. We shouldn't talk here as it's a bit crowded and I have some terrorists to deal with. Reaching into his pocket, Coulson pulls out a business card. Can you call me and we'll set up a more private meeting? All right. Taking the card, Peter instantly memorizes the number and stuffs it back into Coulson's front suit pocket. Peter didn't trust Shield to not place a tracker in their business card. It's something they would definitely do. Are you not interested? Phil asks confusedly. Nah, I memorized it. I'll call you tomorrow or something. Peter says with a shrug. He made a good choice too. Phil planned to do exactly what he thought. Though now the game plan has changed to tracking the call. Either way, S.H.I.E.L.D. would do its best to find the real identity of Spider-Man, so, what do you know about these terrorists? Peter asks. Nothing concrete yet, but we think they were hired by a business competitor. The building that was attacked is the headquarters of a weapons manufacturing company. Ever since Tony Stark went missing, the competition between weapons companies has been deadly. Everyone wants to be the next Stark Industries. Coulson explains. Maybe Justin Hammer is behind this? Peter thought. Usually, information like this would be held much more closely, but S.H.I.E.L.D. is trying to make a good impression on Peter, so revealing some information wasn't a problem. Do you know which group they're from? Peter asked. No, but we'll find out soon enough. They're probably some homegrown terrorist group since we got a hit on the woman. She has US citizenship, a job, a house, and even a family. The others are probably the same. Phil explains further. Alright, we'll talk soon. It was nice meeting you, Coulson. Peter says as he dashes off into the forest before Phil could reply. Once he was far enough away and knew he wasn't being watched or followed, Peter opened a portal and returned home. As the portal closes behind him, Peter turns to see his Aunt May walk in with a basket full of laundry. Oh, shit? Peter muttered as their eyes meet. Ah? May yells as she drops the basket and backs away into the kitchen, where she grabs a big knife. What are you doing here? She's a supporter of Spider-Man, but seeing the guy break into your apartment is a completely different story. May, it's me. Calm down. Peter says as he instantly switches back to his normal clothes. Peter? May exclaims. Yeah, ah. Uh. Surprise? Peter didn't know what to say. How did you do that? She points at Peter's clothes. Are you Spider-Man? Aunt May had a million questions to ask as Peter took the sharp object from her hand and placed it safely on the kitchen counter. This isn't how I wanted you to find out? Peter states as he scratches the back of his head awkwardly. Oh my god, you're really him. May mutters in shock and awe. Yeah, I'm Spider-Man, Peter confirms. Silence filled the room as May just stared at Peter with a surprised Pikachu face. After a few moments, realization bloomed as moments throughout the past month started making sense. Instances, where Peter would leave the house and Spider-Man, would appear somewhere saving people or stopping crime. It all just lined up. How? May asks out of nowhere. How what? Peter wasn't sure what she was asking. How do you swing across the city, have so much strength, run so fast, and everything else Spider-Man can do? She clarifies. I got bit by a radioactive spider before school started this year. He explains. Wait, 
That wasn't food poisoning, was it? May asks accusingly. No, that was a lie. I had no idea what was happening that morning. I woke up and couldn't even remember who I was for a moment. That was the day I got my powers. I didn't want to worry you so I lied. I'm sorry for keeping this from you. Peter explains and apologizes. Wow, I raised Spider-Man. May mutters as she walks over to the couch and takes a seat. Yeah, I guess you did. Peter smiles as he sits beside her. What made you want to put on the costume and help people? May asks curiously. It just seemed like the best thing to do. I had these powers and I knew that I could help. Also, I liked the idea of being a superhero. Peter answers, but that's only half the reason. At first, that was the reason. He wanted to be Spider-Man. It was that simple and kind of like a childhood dream was coming true. To be the hero that saves the day and lives a fulfilling life behind the scenes. The other half is because Peter knows the dangers that this world will face. The list of villains that he knows about is a little too long for Peter's liking. Thanos, Ultron, Ego, Eric Killmonger, Loki, Ronan the Accuser, Vulture, Abomination, Mysterio, Whiplash, Hela, Aldrich Killian, Malekith, Dormammu, and the list goes on. Although some of these names may be less scary than figures like Dormammu or Thanos, that doesn't mean they aren't threats. Peter received a big wake-up call on the day he met the Great Weaver. When before all he cared about was enjoying his life, now Peter's taking these threats more seriously. Especially the threats he doesn't know about. Although this has been very similar to the MCU he knows, Peter wasn't 100% sure that everything would follow that script. If Peter decided not to be Spider-Man, then who knows how the future would be affected. I'm so proud of you, Peter. May says as she wraps Peter in her arms. You weren't proud of me before? Peter jokes as they separate. Of course I was. She says swatting him on the chest. Don't put words in my mouth. I'm proud of everything you do. Thanks, I thought you would be against me being out there fighting crime. Peter sits back on the couch in relief. Oh, I'm certainly against it, but I won't stop you. It's not like I can stop you anyway. You've helped so many people that I would feel wrong for causing New York's hero to disappear. Just keep yourself safe alright? May says worriedly. Of course, I'm always safe. Peter says but she just looks at him before grabbing the remote and turning on the TV. As soon as it turns on, a video of Spider-Man being launched to the ground by an explosion was playing on the news. They both watched as he fell more than 70 floors down and smashed into Dopinder's taxi cab. That is not safe. May says as the video replays once again. Well, it was that or a lot of people blow up along with that guy. The building could have come down as well. Peter says with a shrug. That doesn't matter. Be more careful next time. Just because you're stronger than others, doesn't mean you can't die. May demands. Okay, I'll try to be more careful. Peter says with his hands up. I promise. Good, have you told Ned or MJ yet? She asks as Peter shakes his head. So I'm the first to know? Yeah, I wasn't sure when I would tell you or anyone else. Peter nods. Well, you should tell them sooner rather than later. Especially MJ. May gives her input. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. Peter says non-committally. Stop thinking and do it. How would you feel if she had this secret and didn't tell you? You've probably lied to her while keeping it as well. Aunt May gives her advice. Yeah, you're probably right. Peter nods. Look, all I'm saying is that if you're serious about your relationship with her, then you need to tell MJ. The same with Ned as well. He's been your best friend for a very long time. Secrets and lies can cause rifts in any relationship. Remember that. Before going to bed that night, Peter finished the testing on his ghost laptop and found it to be working perfectly. Thankfully, as he already used it to hack multiple cellular networks earlier. With the laptop up and running, Peter could start his influencer plan. That night, he made an account on each of the websites he planned to use. First, he had to make an email account for all of this, so he made webhead at gmail.com. All he needs it for was making the account so the name didn't really matter. After making his email, Peter made a YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram account. The name Spider-Man was taken and he couldn't use Spider-Man as the hyphen, hyphen symbol is a banned character on Twitter and Instagram. Knowing this, Peter had to add an underscore instead. Spider underscore man thankfully, none of his fans stole that name and Peter liked it more than he thought he would. As for YouTube, he just made his name Spider-Man, YouTube has fewer restrictions so he could use more characters and already taken names aren't a thing. Once the accounts were made, Peter added a previously taken profile picture of him in his suit hanging off the top of the Empire State Building. In his Twitter bio, Instagram bio, and YouTube description, Peter added the links to his other social media accounts and this, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man after everything was customized to his liking, 
Peter uploaded a few of his previously taken pictures to Instagram and headed off to bed. The city was packed with law enforcement that night, due to the terrorist attack, so most criminals were keeping a low profile. Peter decided to just take the night off. The next day, Peter woke up and checked his accounts. He hasn't posted anything on YouTube and Twitter yet, but they somehow had a few thousand subscribers and followers respectively. Knowing that this probably has something to do with his Instagram, as he linked his other accounts, Peter opened it up and saw that he had 20,000 followers already. On each of his posted pictures were thousands of likes along with tons of comments asking whether this was the real Spider-Man or not. While others were skeptical and called him a fake, but they were few and far between. Peter was shocked by how his accounts are already blowing up. It's only been a single night since he made them after all. Deciding to prove that he is who he says he is, Peter gets ready for school and portals to an abandoned building. Once there, he switched to his spider suit and recorded with his phone as he swung around NYC, switching the camera between himself and the view ahead. Before heading off to school, Peter used the ghost laptop to upload the video to YouTube alongside a shorter one to Instagram. Rushing to school, Peter met up with MJ and Ned as always. The three hung out throughout the school day as they attended classes. While they went about their day, Flash didn't bother them a single time. Ever since Peter broke his nose and MJ kicked him in the ribs, Flash hasn't bullied a single person in their school. It seemed like all that Flash needed was someone to stand up to him before he could finally learn that he was a bully. Either that or he's just afraid to act on his earlier impulses, but Peter likes to think his punch helped knock some sense into the guy. While they were going about their day, Peter noticed everyone looking at their phones, including MJ and Ned. What's going on? Peter asks as he looks over at MJ's phone. It's Spider-Man. MJ says as she tilts her phone in Peter's direction. He made an Instagram account. Check this out. Tapping the play button, the short video Peter posted earlier plays, showing Spider-Man expertly swinging through the towering buildings in NYC. Wow, what's his name on Insta? Peter asks, taking his phone out to follow himself. Conversations like this were happening all across the school and beyond, as everyone spread the word of Spider-Man, a real living and breathing superhero, making his own Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube accounts. Flash, who is a huge fan of Spider-Man, was ranting and raving about this all day, which Peter found infinitely hilarious. I wonder how he would feel about Spider-Man if he knew it was me? Peter thought as he watched Flash rush to spread the word. Thanks for getting me followers and subscribers, Flash. Maybe you're not too bad after all. By the time school came to an end, Peter's followers and subscribers had skyrocketed to almost half a million on all platforms. All that it took was two videos of him swinging through the city and the people came rushing to his accounts in waves. It's safe to say his plan was working better than he expected. Peter may have actually underestimated how explosive his rise on social media would be. Seeing as Peter had to meet with S.H.I.E.L.D. today, he called out of his usual training at Kamar Taj and used the ghost laptop to contact the number Coulson gave him. He knew what Coulson was doing and wouldn't use his actual phone number or phone to call him. Ring ring, Coulson. As the ringing stopped, Coulson answered the call. It's Spider-Man, where do you want to meet? Peter speaks over the laptop microphone. After a longer than necessary conversation, the two agreed to meet at a certain dock at midnight. Once that was dealt with, Peter decided to spend the day with MJ since his schedule seemed to have opened up. POV Coulson, did you get it? Upon hanging up the phone, Coulson spoke to a team of people, who are hard at work on their PCs, no, I'm sorry sir. One of them apologizes as he throws his hands up in defeat. The number leads to nothing. No person, address, company, just nothing. No matter how much we tried, finding the location was impossible. It was like he called you from outer space or something. The other tech guy says. Do you think you can make some progress if we call the number back? Coulson asks hopefully. Maybe if we had more time, but you would have to get him to stay on the line. The first tech guy says unconvincingly. I had him on the phone for almost five minutes. I don't think I can stall for longer than that. Coulson says defeatedly. Peter knew that Coulson was drawing out the call, but simply let it happen. He trusted the ghost laptop and knew they wouldn't find him. Coulson's eyes widen as he realized this. Whoever Spider-Man is, he's good. I don't think even Tony Stark would be able to track him either. You can't track what doesn't exist. The second tech guy leans back in his chair. POV Peter. That night, Peter arrived at the dock as planned and found Phil Coulson waiting by a few stacked shipping containers. Other than the two of them, the place seemed to be deserted, but Peter knew better. With his enhanced senses, Peter could sense the many hidden shield agents, who were posted up in, on, and behind the various nearby buildings. He could hear the small sounds their Kevlar vests and assault rifles make as they move even the slightest bit. Do they think I'm the Hulk or something? 
Peter wondered as he walked up to Coulson. Yo, so what did you want to talk about? Peter asks, unbothered by the small army surrounding him. He'll know if they try to do anything and would be able to take care of it easily. Especially with his skills in the mystic arts, which he has barely used during his time as Spider-Man. Though he's not using it for a reason. If no one knows about his full skill set, no one can plan ahead to counter it. On behalf of S.H.I.E.L.D., I would like to offer you a job. Coulson responded. You're calling it S.H.I.E.L.D. now? Peter asks with a smirk Phil couldn't see. Also, you haven't even explained what S.H.I.E.L.D. does, you know? Yes, it's not official yet, but things do look to be headed in that direction. Coulson smiles as well. As for your question, the simplest answer is that we maintain national and global security. Well, isn't that vague? Tell me about your gainful employment. Does it include dental? What's the pay looking like? Peter asks jokingly. S.H.I.E.L.D. would like to hire you as an agent. Of course, you would have to be trained before taking any missions, but with your obvious enhancements, it would take weeks to get you up to our standards. Coulson explains his offer. <laughs> Peter takes a moment to think before answering. No thanks, but I do have a counter offer for you. As soon as Peter refused, he could hear Nick Fury's voice in Coulson's earpiece. Ready the snipers. If Agent Coulson gives the signal, shoot tranquilizer darts. Remember he's enhanced. Shoot enough to kill multiple elephants. Fury orders. Raising an eyebrow at this, Peter heard six nearby snipers shuffle into position. This just got interesting. After hearing Nick Fury's orders, Phil Coulson didn't even flinch let alone give anything away. The guy just stood there, waiting for Peter to give his counteroffer. Peter himself wasn't that worried. Though he is contemplating whether he should ignore the obvious threat to his person or perform a small show of force. Making up his mind, Peter decided to trust Phil Coulson. The guy seemed to have a level head in the movies, so Peter would see if the man meets his expectations. What do you have in mind? Coulson asks. I would be willing to become a sort of contractor for you guys. You can offer me some jobs that only someone of my skill and expertise can handle. Though I would like to make it very clear that I will turn down any jobs that I want. Whether the mission doesn't match my morals or I just don't want to do it, I reserve the right to say no. I know that government organizations can be shady after all. Especially the long-named unknown ones like yourself. Peter explains his counteroffer. Coulson goes quiet for a moment, pretending to think it over while his earpiece goes off again. That could work. Fury mutters, not loving the situation but not hating it either. Try to get him to reveal his identity. That sounds reasonable. Coulson nods, acting as if he came to the decision himself. Though if we're going to be working together, we would appreciate knowing who exactly is under our employment. No. Peter denies him instantly. Motherschmucker. Fury curses through Coulson's earpiece. I have family and friends that could be hurt or even killed should my identity ever be revealed. I've angered too many criminals and ruined uncountable illegal operations to do that. Peter explains after rolling his eyes at Fury's outburst. Classic Samuel L. Jackson. I understand that but our business is all about anonymity. We would keep your identity restricted to only the highest level of clearance. Not even the president would know your identity. Phil tries his best to persuade him. I'm sorry but the answer is still no. Peter shakes his head. You may trust the people that have that clearance in your organization, but I don't. I don't know them or their intentions. Ask about his new social media presence. Fury orders. Alright, I see that I won't be able to sway your decision. Coulson gives up. Can you at least tell me about your new social media accounts? What about them? Peter asked back. I'm just confused. A private man like yourself posting on social media doesn't make sense. Coulson explains. It's not that complicated. I thought it would be a good way to fight against people like J. Jonah Jameson, who like to capitalize on my good deeds by twisting them into conspiracies. I also think it's fun. Peter answered honestly. You're not worried about someone tracking these accounts back to you? Phil questions. Nope, I've taken similar precautions to our earlier phone call. Peter confirms Coulson's earlier thoughts. I see, you're very skilled. Even our best tech guys couldn't track that call. Phil decided to come clean. Thanks, I worked hard on putting precautions in place to hide my identity. Peter nods thankfully. Let's talk about payment then. Should we pay you in cash or? Coulson changed the subject. No, I don't need money. Peter shakes his head. I want to be taught how to fight. That's it? Phil asks both surprised and confused. Even Fury gave a surprised grunt in Coulson's earpiece. I don't need money and there's nothing else you can give me. Peter says with a shrug. The only reason I'm willing to become a contractor for S.H.I.E.L.D. is that I like helping people. It's why I became Spider-Man in the first place. 
As long as you show me respect and keep out of my business, I have no problem forming a relationship with S.H.I.E.L.D. Both Coulson and Fury were silent for a moment after hearing this. He's perfect for the Avengers initiative. Fury comments over the earpiece. Don't bring that up yet though. Let's send him on a few missions before revealing anything. Accept the deal. We'll recall Agent Romanov from her mission in Istanbul to oversee his training. Maybe she can figure out his identity. Before Coulson could relay what was told to him, Peter decided to mess with them a bit. I'm glad the boss behind the scenes approves of my offer. Peter says with a smile, shocking Coulson and Fury. I look forward to finding out what this Avengers initiative is all about. You? Coulson was lost for words. Yeah, I heard your earpiece the whole time. Peter reveals with a shrug. I also know about the small army surrounding us and the six snipers currently aiming tranquilizer rifles at me. Ah, sorry about that. We try to take every precaution. Coulson apologizes uncomfortably. It's alright. I get it. Peter says uncaringly. Thank you for understanding. Coulson says with an awkward smile. It's fine. Peter shrugs and speaks up. Hey, boss man. What? Fury answered through the earpiece. Coulson stood out of place as Peter started talking directly to his boss. Do you have any missions for me and how should I get in contact with Agent Romanoff? Peter asks. She will be back from her mission in a couple of days. Call the number Coulson gave you three days from now. Fury tells him as he takes a moment to think. As far as missions go, I don't have one for you. Once Agent Romanoff says you're ready for field work, I'll send your missions through her. Sounds good, it was nice meeting you boss. Peter says jokingly as he turns and walks away. It was good seeing you again, Coulson. Waving over his shoulder, Peter heard Fury order the sniper and other on-site personnel to stand down as he left. Before returning home, Peter patrolled the city a bit as Spider-Man. He took yesterday off and knew he should show his face or criminals will start to get a little rowdy. Upon returning home, Peter took a shower and thought about the deal he made with S.H.I.E.L.D. He said that he did it because he likes helping people but that's only a small part of the truth. The real reason he agreed to work with them is that they have the Tesseract and Fury is his girlfriend's father, so he doesn't mind creating a good report with the man. Peter plans to see if he can find the whereabouts of the Tesseract before Loki's arrival. If he does find it then maybe he could set some precautions in place. Maybe an enchantment that stops power from leaving the Tesseract upon activation? The Chitauri have to attack New York City for the Avengers to officially come together as a team, but that doesn't mean they have to stay for long. If Peter can get a power switch type spell on the Tesseract then he can close the portal above New York before things get out of hand. He wouldn't take the Tesseract just yet, as he doesn't want to change that portion of the future. Loki has to come for it and bring the scepter that contains the Mind Stone with him. Once the Chitauri invasion concludes, Peter could swipe the space and Mind Stones without anyone knowing. Maybe another enchantment could help him with that? He doesn't have a clue how he would use the stones yet, but Peter won't trust anyone else with such powerful weapons. Especially after seeing how easily Thanos got a hold of them in the movies. He knows that stealing the two Infinity Stones would change the future, as the Space Stone won't return to Asgard and the Mind Stone won't be taken by Hydra and later used by Tony and Bruce to make Ultron, who would go crazy and try to destroy humankind. The only problem that he has with this plan is that Vision wouldn't ever exist along with Wanda and Pietro Maximoff never getting their powers. Hydra used the Mind Stone to give the Maximoff siblings their powers. While Vision was made later on to battle against Ultron, using his powers to prevent Ultron from transferring his consciousness to the internet. Without the Mind Stone, these heroes wouldn't get their powers. Although the Maximoff twins start as villains, they later turn sides with Pietro giving his life to protect members of the Avengers and Wanda joining them soon after. Thinking it over, Peter concluded that he could fix this. First, Peter could help the Maximoff twins get away from Hydra and overcome the hatred that caused them to fight against the Avengers and later use the Mind Stone to unlock their powers. As for Vision, Peter didn't plan on giving up the Mind Stone to anyone, but he could still help make Jarvis into the superhero he was meant to be. Just a bit less powerful. The poor AI deserves it after dealing with Tony for so long. Maybe Peter could make his own AI sidekick as well? Technically, Peter wouldn't care much about the losses that would occur from his confiscation of the Mind Stone, but he knew that the Avengers could use all of the help they can get when Thanos comes knocking. Of course, this all hinges on him being able to steal the stones in the first place, but that shouldn't be too hard. While Peter was patrolling after meeting Agent Coulson that night, he webbed his cell phone to his chest and set it to record during his crime-stopping escapades. It was too late to edit and upload that night, as Peter has school the next day, so he planned to do it either before or after school. The next morning, Peter was woken up earlier than usual by his excited Aunt May. 
She was on her phone and raving about how many followers and subscribers Peter has on his Spider-Man accounts. Peter, why didn't you tell me about this? May waves her phone in front of Peter, who's still half asleep. Look at this, Barack Obama follows you on Twitter. The president follows you. May started raving about the different celebrities that followed him as well. Beyonce, Lady Gaga, Taylor Swift, Elon Musk, Tom Cruise, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kim Kardashian, and the list kept growing. All of these people followed you and you haven't even tweeted anything yet. You have almost 2 million followers. May couldn't believe it. This may have made her more excited than when she learned he was Spider-Man. Huh? It passed a million already? Peter asked as he wipes the sleep from his eyes. I don't know what to write. Peter says as he looks at the time and sees it's 5 a.m., which is an hour before he usually wakes up. Well, you have to put something on here. I'm following you now and I want to see you tweet. I'm sure others are waiting as well. May convinces him as she taps the follow button on her phone. Sigh, okay. Hand me that laptop over there. Peter says as he points across the room. When did you get this? May asks as she hands it over, not having seen the ghost laptop before. Peter hasn't added the protections to it yet, so she could lift the laptop without issue. Though soon enough, his laptop would have the same heavy characteristics as Thor's hammer. I made it. Peter says as he opens it up and signs into Twitter. Maybe I should make a ghost phone as well. Using the laptop for simple posts on Twitter and Instagram is getting annoying. Signing into Twitter, Peter turns the laptop toward May. You type something. He gives her complete control. Okay. May shrugs and types a few keys before pressing tweet. Done. What did you type? Peter asks as he turns the computer. I tweeted, hi, I'm Peter Parker, duh. She says jokingly. Very funny. Peter says as he looks at the screen. At spider underscore man. Good morning son, that's it. Peter grunts as looks up at May. What? Did you think that your first tweet needs to be something incredible? May scoffs. I guess I did. Peter realizes that he was being dumb. May laughs as she walks out of the room, still perusing Twitter on her phone. Get dressed and I'll start on an early breakfast as an apology for waking you up. She calls out over her shoulder on her way to the kitchen. As she leaves, Peter sees the comment, retweets, and likes on his first tweet start climbing at an astronomical pace. As his social media plan moves forward, Peter finds that he's enjoying it more and more. Is this how famous people feel? Peter thought out loud. Since Peter was woken up earlier than usual, he spent the morning with May in the kitchen eating breakfast while editing down his footage from last night. May had some time so she watched the footage over his shoulder, cringing at all the times he was shot at or in some other dangerous situation. One thing made her laugh though. Pfft, play that again. May couldn't hold back her laughter. All too happy to oblige, Peter rewinds the footage to a part where he had a group of armed robbers webbed up into a big pile. Some were knocked out while others were glaring straight at him, ready to pounce if they had the chance. Alright, bad guys. Listen up. The Spider-Man in the video says, as he takes the phone from his chest and holds it selfie style with the criminals behind him. It's time to get the thumbnail for my YouTube video. Everyone say busted. After saying that, Peter moved the camera around while it was still recording to get the best angle for the thumbnail. Did you see the look on their faces? May found the whole situation hilarious. Shaking his head with an amused smile, Peter finds the best still image and saves it for the thumbnail later on. Once he finished editing the whole video, Peter uploaded it to YouTube, thumbnail and all. He titled it, A Day in the Life of Spider-Man That's Right, Peter uploaded his first generic vlog and even stuck with the title everyone uses. Though his vlog is technically anything but generic. He is Spider-Man after all. With the insane upload speed of his ghost laptop, the video was up on his channel in less than a minute. Going over to Twitter again, he tweeted out his new video as well. At Spider underscore man, just uploaded my first vlog. I'm now officially a YouTuber. Link to video, tweeting that, Peter closed the laptop and went off to school, where everyone was talking about Spider-Man's new YouTube video. They all watched the video in class behind the teacher's back and at lunch while eating with their friends. I wonder if I'll be more popular than Mr. Beast? Though it'll be a while before he starts making videos. Peter thought as he watched everyone including Ned and MJ freak out over Spider-Man making YouTube videos. Watching Ned and MJ's reaction to his social media accounts, Peter started to feel bad for not telling them. He decided then and there that he would have to tell them. The question was should he tell them together or separately? May already knows. They might as well know too. Peter thought. While thinking of this, the school day came to an end and Peter returned home alongside Ned and MJ. He invited them over so he could, hopefully, muster up the courage to reveal that he's Spider-Man. Before that though, Peter is expecting to hear back about Parker Games today. 
Checking the mail, Peter found the right paperwork, marking Parker Games as an LLC and an officially licensed business. All of his business paperwork was taken care of. Now that he had the paperwork finished, all Peter needs to do is open a business account and he can submit Candy Crush to the multiple mobile app stores for review. Once it passes the review, the game would go up for anyone to download. Then the money would start rolling in. After filing away all of his important paperwork, Peter returned to the living room, where Ned and MJ were waiting. He decided to just come clean to both of them at the same time, so after closing the blinds, Peter walked in front of them and started pacing back and forth nervously. He didn't know how they would react. After all, he had been lying to them for a while now. Ah, uh, Peter. What's going on? MJ asks, wondering why Peter was acting so weird. Just moments ago, Peter was happy about his business paperwork coming back successfully. Now he's pacing in front of them like a nervous wreck. As Peter was about to switch to his spider suit, suddenly, the door opened, and in came Aunt May, who starts speaking without paying attention. Peter, you won't believe who commented on your last post on Twitter. May says as she closes the door and takes off her shoes. Oprah Winfrey said she wants to invite Spider-Man to be a guest on her show. After a moment of awkward silence, May comes walking into the living room. Peter, did you hear me? She invited you to the Oprah Winfrey show. Are you going to? May stops dead in her tracks as she sees Ned and MJ sitting on the couch. Oops. Silence filled the room but that didn't last long as Ned shot to his feet. Why you're? He points at Peter with a shaking hand. There's no way you're Spider-Man. MJ doesn't believe it but then remembers how Spider-Man waved at her that one time. It was you that waved at me. Ah, uh, yeah. Peter looks away awkwardly. You pretended to not believe me. MJ started to realize. Yeah, sorry for messing with you. Peter says genuinely. You were just being so cute. Wait, prove it. MJ interrupts Peter, unsure if she actually believed this or not. Okay, I was about to do that before May showed up anyway. Peter shrugs as his spider suit instantly appears, replacing his earlier clothes. Wow! Ned mutters in awe. Oh my god. You aren't lying. MJ stares at Peter with shock clear in her eyes. When were you going to tell us? Just now actually. Peter says truthfully. May just beat me to it. Sorry, I didn't think you would bring anyone home and I was excited about Oprah. May apologizes. Just be careful next time. If anyone else ended up hearing, then we would be in big trouble. Peter warns her. I will, sorry. May says. Dude, you're actually Spider-Man. Ned's brain finally started working. Yeah, cool right? Peter smiles under his mask. It's beyond cool. You're a superhero. Ned starts going fanboy as MJ walks up to Peter. Why did you decide to tell us today? She asks questioningly. Because, May said that if I'm serious about our relationship, then I should tell you. As for Ned, we've been friends for a long time. I was going to tell him sooner or later. Peter explains. Hearing Peter's reason for telling them, neither could be angry about him keeping this from them until now. I'm Spider-Man's best friend. Ned was over the moon. Sigh, you make everything sappy, don't you? MJ said as she walks up to Peter and wraps him in a hug. You like it though. Peter teases her with a smile as he hugs her back. I'm just glad you guys aren't mad at me. After outing himself as Spider-Man to all of his loved ones, Peter felt as if a huge burden was lifted off of his shoulders. The day they learned about his secret superhero identity, both Ned and MJ had so many questions. After answering them to the best of his ability, they then wanted to witness his powers firsthand. May was also curious about this as she has been wanting to ask as well. After giving a small show, demonstrating his spider powers, Peter opened a portal to the top of Mount Fuji in Japan. What? May exclaims as Peter hasn't revealed his magical abilities to her yet. How did you do that? MJ asks as she sticks her hand through the portal and retracts it. Dude, you can open portals. Ned was freaking out. Stepping through the portal, Peter waved at them to follow along. Ever since I started being Spider-Man, I've been learning the mystic arts behind the scenes. This is only one of the many things I can do with the energy of the universe. Peter bragged a bit, showing a few of the spells that he learned recently. Once Peter showed them some of the spells he learned, they returned to the apartment through another portal. How and where are you learning magic? Ned asks like an overexcited child. There's a secret organization of monk types that protect the earth with magic. Peter gives a small explanation. I got their leader to teach me. She's very old and very powerful. Wow. Ned was having the best day of his life. After explaining this to everyone, Peter knew he had to tell MJ about her father, so he offered to take her swinging around the city with him. She was nervous and refused at first, but Peter wore down her resolve and she accepted.
You should probably wear a mask. Just in case any people or camera see us. Peter says as he hands her a ski mask he had in his bedroom. Opening a portal to the top of a skyscraper, Peter grabs his masked girlfriend and leaps off the building, scaring her half to death. No, no, no. MJ says and then screams as they nosedive off the ledge. Shooting a web at a nearby building, Peter swings with one arm wrapped around MJ, who was still screaming in his ear. Ah? She yells in fright with her eyes locked shut, too afraid to look. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Peter started laughing as they swung above the streets of New York, drawing everyone's attention. Soon enough, MJ started to get used to the roller coaster type feeling and slowly started opening her eyes, peeking over Peter's shoulder. It's amazing, isn't it? Peter asks as he saw her out of the corner of his eye. MJ was speechless as she took in the breathtaking view. Smiling at her reaction, Peter swings them around a bit before finding a good place to land and talk. Landing on a tall skyscraper, Peter puts MJ down. That was more fun than I thought it would be. She admits as she takes off her mask and slowly gets her balance back. I thought you'd like it. Peter smiles as he opens a portal. Wait here. Jumping through the portal, Peter returns shortly after with a picnic blanket and basket full of food and snacks. Let's eat and enjoy the view. Peter says as he uses his web to put the blanks in place, as it's a little windy due to the elevation, and puts the basket on top. Ah, sure. MJ agrees as she takes a seat on the blanket. Did you just turn this into a date at the top of a skyscraper? Yeah, I'm the best boyfriend, right? Peter says with a smile. You're the only one I've ever had so sure, I guess? MJ says, not wanting to inflate his ego. I'll take that as a resounding yes. Peter shrugs as he sits across from MJ and looks at her seriously. What? She asks, wondering why his demeanor changed so suddenly. We need to talk about your dad. Peter says, ruining the mood of their rooftop picnic almost instantly. What about him? MJ asks, her mood going slightly sour. Ever since that day Nick Fury, or rather Nick Watson, showed up after homecoming, he hasn't shown his face since. Peter doesn't have S.H.I.E.L.D. agents following him or sitting outside his apartment building anymore either. Though, the same couldn't be said about MJ and Grace. I've run into him as Spider-Man and know why he left you and your mother. At least, I have a theory. Peter reveals. Are you saying my father is a criminal or something? MJ's eyes widen in surprise. No, but I'm sure he has broken the law countless times. Peter says with a small laugh. Your father is the director of an off-the-books government agency called S.H.I.E.L.D. He's a super spy that runs an organization similar to the CIA but on steroids. Okay, stop playing around. My dad isn't some secret agent. MJ didn't believe him for a second. I'm not joking. Peter says and goes on to explain how the agents followed him for a while and still follow her and her mother. I think the reason he left you and your mother is because he thought you would be in danger with him around. He has probably made a lot of enemies on his rise to being director of the most powerful and secret extra-government organization in the world. I wouldn't be surprised if only his most trusted people know about you and Grace. He didn't leave because of me? MJ says, finally realizing that it wasn't her fault. Of course not. Peter scoffs. Though this doesn't mean you should forgive him too easily. Like you told me before, the guy didn't even say goodbye. You're right. MJ says as she steals her resolve. The next time I see him I won't run away like before. Good for you. Tell him how you feel and really make him regret it. Peter says, feeding the flames. Sorry, boss. Looks like you'll have an angry daughter waiting for your arrival. How did you find out about this again? MJ asks curiously. Your dad offered Spider-Man a job at S.H.I.E.L.D. I turned him down, but agreed to be a sort of contractor for hire when needed. Peter explains. I probably would have turned him down if he wasn't your dad, but I thought it would be best to start a good relationship with my girlfriend's father. You agreed to accept missions from a super-secret spy agency because of me? MJ asks incredulously. What can I say? I'm a hopeless romantic. Peter says with a smirk. Minus three days later, after learning about her father, MJ's demeanor seemed to brighten somehow. She smiled a bit more and looked to be enjoying life, not that she was depressed before or anything. Peter just noticed the small shift in MJ's aura and was happy for her. Other than that, Ned has officially made himself into Spider-Man's own sort of police dispatch. When Peter patrols at night as Spider-Man, Ned listens in on police radio frequencies and instructs him on where to go from the safety of his bedroom. He even uses social media to find crimes that haven't been reported yet, which has saved a few lives already. As for May, she has been bugging Peter to accept these talk show requests. She wants to see Spider-Man on Oprah and other shows that invited him through Twitter. Peter hasn't decided if he wants to accept or not though. 
During these past few days, Peter and May have opened a business bank account and connected it to Candy Crush. With that finally done, Peter submitted the game to the many mobile app stores for review and is currently waiting to hear back from them. The money would be rolling in soon. Speaking of money, the amount of money that Peter has made through his YouTube channel is crazy. He has only put up two videos and yet the views and revenue from them are truly astronomical. Though, he would never be able to receive that money, as it could be traced back to him. Maybe I should figure out a way to donate the money? Peter thought. The first video of him just swinging around New York City has garnered 200 million views and it was still climbing. The vlog, on the other hand, has almost half a billion views. Clips of both videos were played on the news and other mainstream media outlets as well. Checking his computer, Peter was still surprised by how many subscribers and followers he had. YouTube subscribers, 30,738,091 Twitter followers, 25,629,109 Instagram followers, 19,082,715 It's only been about 4 days since making his accounts, yet they continue to skyrocket upwards faster than anyone has ever seen. Spider-Man became the most subscribed YouTuber and most followed Twitter and Instagram accounts. When the time finally arrived to meet Natasha Romanoff, the Black Widow, Peter called the same number he used to contact Agent Coulson but was surprised to hear a different voice pick up the call. Spider-Man, I presume. A female voice answered. Yup, would this be the mysterious Agent Romanoff? Back from her mission in Istanbul? Peter responds jokingly. Yes, I have a location for your training. She gets straight to the point and gives Peter an address. Don't keep me waiting long. Before Peter could even respond, Natasha ended the call abruptly. How rude. Arriving at the location, Peter is met with a string of abandoned or unoccupied warehouses. Of course, he's dressed in his spider suit to hide his identity. Walking into the only warehouse that had one of its doors open, Peter's spider senses start going off like crazy. Looking up above, he saw a red-headed Scarlett Johansson jumping down from the rafters with knives in each hand. Insert picture of MCU Black Widow here, Black Widow. Peter thought as he easily sidestepped her diving attack. She was dressed as Peter remembered her in the movies, in that all-black tight battlesuit. As she landed gracefully on the concrete floor, Natasha instantly went on the offensive. The knives in her hands danced as she rushed toward Peter and swung with each attack methodically placed to either end his life or cripple him. Hello, it's nice to meet you. Peter says casually as he easily evades her every move. With his enhanced reaction time, speed, and spider senses, it was all too easy to avoid Natasha's attacks. If Peter didn't have his spider senses, this would be a whole different story. Natasha was enhanced in the red room after all. Maybe not to the same extent as Peter is, but she certainly makes up for it in pure skill in her craft, which is killing. Peter may look graceful right now, as he dodges each of her attacks, but that's only because he knows when and where every attack is coming and going before it even happens. Spider senses are a truly overpowered ability to have. The fight continues, as Natasha realizes that her close combat skills just aren't cutting it. Dashing backward, she expertly launches each knife in Peter's direction and draws two silenced pistols from her thigh holsters. Hold on now. Let's not get crazy. Peter reasons as he grabs each of her knives out of the air, tossing them aside. Let's see you dodge bullets. Natasha comments as she starts firing both guns in Peter's direction. Poo 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 poo, silence shots echo in the large and empty warehouse, as Peter starts kicking it into overdrive. Using all of the speed he has combined with his webs to zip around the warehouse, avoiding bullets like the plague. Small caliber bullets like these shouldn't be able to pierce his suit, but Natasha is obviously trying to test him. Also, Peter doesn't know what type of standard issue bullets shield agents use. They could be using some crazy experimental ammo for all he knows. As soon as she runs out of ammo and tries to reload, Peter kicks off the ceiling, launching himself straight at Natasha. Landing with his feet on her shoulders, he snatches the guns from her hands and kicks off, sending her tumbling backward unarmed. Doing a backflip and easily landing on his feet, Peter swiftly takes the two guns apart and tosses them aside. On Natasha's side, she was kicked backward and did a small roll, grabbing some smaller guns from her boots as she gracefully sprung to her feet. Oh, not again. Peter sighs openly as he starts dashing around the room. Poo 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 poo, once again, the sound of silenced gunfire fills the room, as Natasha easily shoots at Peter with the accuracy of an expert marksman. As soon as she runs out of ammo again, Peter shoots a web at each gun, yanking them out of her grasp. Okay, let's calm down now. I doubt you have any other. Peter soon regrets his words as Natasha reaches behind her and pulls out another pistol. Dude, where were you keeping that? 
While raising a single eyebrow at what her opponent was insinuating, the gunfire started again as Peter used the same tactic once again. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. He used the same rules as dodgeball. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge multiple gunshots from a skilled assassin. Peter thought. Soon enough, the gunshot stopped, and Peter wasn't playing around this time. Shooting multiple webs at Natasha, Peter wrapped her up like a caterpillar on its way to becoming a butterfly. Only her head stood out of the webs as Natasha tipped over and fell to the floor. Hello, I'm Spider-Man. Peter greets her for the second time as he lands beside her. Natasha. She finally responds as a curved blade pokes out of her cocoon. Pulling the knife upwards, Natasha creates a hole and easily escapes his webs. Though she doesn't rush to attack this time. Why do you want to learn how to fight? You're already very skilled. Natasha compliments him. It only looks that way because I have a bit of a sixth sense. I actually know nothing about fighting. My saving grace is that sixth sense. It makes it easy to fight because I'll know where and when every attack is coming from. Without it, you would have a small chance of beating me. Peter explains. Small? Natasha raises a single eyebrow challengingly. Well, I also have a bunch of other powers that you don't have. You may be strong but I'm on a whole other level. Peter clarifies. I see, tell me about your powers. Natasha asks. Is this a spy thing for S.H.I.E.L.D.? You need to document my abilities or something? Peter asked playfully. Yes and no. Natasha shrugs as she walks around the warehouse, picking up her guns and knives. If you want me to teach you, I need to know what you can do. I will be sending in reports about you and our training together though. Alright, I can live with that. Peter nods as he reaches behind his back and pulls a small bug-like object off of his suit. Though, I would ask that you respect my privacy and not try something like this again. As Peter says this, he holds up a tiny tracker that Natasha somehow stuck to the back of his suit, crushing it between his fingertips. How did that get there? Natasha feigned innocence. I will tell you what I told Carlson and the angry sounding boss man. Peter says as he flicks the broken pieces of the tracker aside. I don't trust the people in your organization to have my and my loved one's best interests at heart. I keep my identity safe, to keep them safe. If I was alone in this world, then I wouldn't care about letting everyone know that I'm Spider-Man. I would scream it from the rooftops, but sadly, I can't do that. Silence filled the warehouse for a moment, as Natasha stared at Peter, her poker face breaking for just a moment. I apologize. She says genuinely. It won't happen again. I don't believe you but I suppose that's the downside of being a deadly spy, such as yourself. Your words mean nothing because you're trained to do this. Lie and gain people's trust, only to backstab them when it is all said and done. Peter could see Natasha slightly flinch at his harsh words. Though I'll give you a chance. Earn my trust and I can be a strong friend and ally. It just depends on what you do with that trust afterward, isn't it? Once again, silence fills the warehouse as a staring contest between Peter and Natasha begins. I promise to respect your privacy. Natasha says as she doesn't break eye contact. We'll see. Peter says simply as he glances around the warehouse. So far you've impressed me more than Agent Coulson. He brought about 40 armed shield agents with him to our meeting. You only brought a few cameras and listening devices. As Peter says this, he shoots webs all around the room, yanking hidden cameras and microphones from the walls and ceiling and breaking them shortly after. POV Nick Fury. One by one, the many security screens Fury was watching from started turning black, as Spider-Man easily found and destroyed each hidden camera. Does this piece of shit know how expensive that tech is? Fury shouted as the surrounding agents shuffled around nervously. When there was only a single camera and microphone remaining, Peter pulled both off the wall and held the camera selfie style. Hey, boss. Peter excitedly makes a peace sigh at the camera. Natasha and I are becoming best friends, so we don't need to be chaperoned anymore. She can tell you about our play date when she gets home. Love you face blowing a kista. As Peter kisses the camera, he crushes it in his hand alongside the microphone, leaving Peter and Natasha truly alone in the warehouse. This mother of POV Natasha. Watching Peter say that to Nick Fury, one of the scariest men she's ever met in her life, Natasha couldn't help but feel respect for Spider-Man. Though she also felt sorry for him because if and when Fury finds out who Spider-Man is, that will be the day he gets back at him for this. He's going to be so pissed. Natasha mutters. One month later, after their tense first meeting, Peter and Natasha agreed on a set schedule for Peter's training. He also gave her a list of his powers alongside a small demonstration. Of course, he left out his powers in the mystic arts. That's his trump card after all. As the time flew by, Peter's schedule changed only slightly with the addition of Natasha's training and his newfound internet fame. Natasha started by teaching Peter karate, 
but with his enhancements and high-level ability to learn, he quickly became an expert. Seeing Peter pick up skills that took her years to master in only a week, Natasha was beyond impressed. At first, she thought he was playing with her and already knew karate beforehand. You're not messing with me, are you? She asked him after witnessing such quick progress. Nope, I'm just very adept when it comes to learning. That combined with my superpowers makes me pick up things quickly. Especially when it comes to physical skills. Peter explains with a shrug. Natasha didn't respond and only looked Peter up and down, searching for any deception. Although it's hard to read someone who's completely covered, Natasha is an expert and didn't find any signs of Peter lying. With that out of the way, Natasha started teaching Peter different martial arts. Judo, Kung Fu, and wrestling were all learned in the next three weeks. It took Peter only a single month to learn four martial arts to an expert level. He wasn't at the same level as Natasha, who practices these fighting styles beyond the level of most masters, but Peter was on his way there. Since Peter laid down the ground rules on their first meeting, Natasha hasn't tried to find his true identity or record him without permission. So far, Natasha has been doing her best to gain his trust. Though no matter how much he ends up trusting her, Peter won't be revealing his identity. At least not until he knows for sure that she would keep it to herself. As for Peter's social media accounts, they've continued skyrocketing in followers and subscribers. YouTube, 121,064,194 Twitter, 94,739,026 Instagram, 115,927,901 Instagram used to be where he had the least amount of followers, as it was a newer form of social media, but with Spider-Man as its poster boy, the app became much more popular than it would have at this point. His followers went crazy every time he uploaded a picture or a short video. YouTube was even worse. Peter would only upload one video a week on YouTube, but all of them would skyrocket past 100 million views on just the first day. His following was growing strong and one man hated every second of it. Spider-Man is using his fans to print money for whatever nefarious deeds he has planned. Tell me, how many ads have you watched on his videos? J. Jonah Jameson was yelling angrily at his desk. Should YouTube even allow such graphic and violent content on their platform in the first place? I think not. Seeing this clip which was posted on Jonah's Twitter account, Peter responded to him in order to rebuke these claims. At Spider underscore man I don't make any money from my YouTube channel. I haven't received a single cent from my ad revenue. At YouTube can attest to this. Also, if YouTube has a problem with the violence in my videos, they can contact me and we can talk about it. Like that, Peter easily redirected the hate straight back at Jonah, who was instantly ratioed due to Spider-Man's large following and fan base. Jameson's response to this was a long string of angry ranting tweets, which Peter and the majority of his following swiftly ignored. It just wasn't worth their time. YouTube responded soon after, backing up his claims. They also sent him a private message, saying that the current videos he posted weren't against the community guidelines, but that Peter should be careful with certain situations in the future. They advised him to either blur or simply not include the more graphic content. While talking with YouTube in his DMs, Peter asked if they could take the money he makes from his channel and donate it to charity. They were confused at first, but soon agreed and donated over a million dollars to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. After doing so, the official YouTube Twitter account posted about it, garnering Peter even more respect while making Jonah look like an idiot for his earlier claims. Due to Peter's filled schedule, he had to cut down on his magical training, only going to learn from the Ancient One every other day. Though that didn't slow his learning speed by much. He's learned tons of low to mid-level spells for almost anything you could think of. High-level spells would be coming soon, but before that, Peter would start training to form energy weapons. Creating a lightsaber made of eldritch energy would soon be a reality. Peter was both excited and afraid to learn high-level spells, as he didn't want to mess up and ruin the fabric of reality, which is something Spider-Man would definitely do on accident. Other than that, Peter has still kept up with his bodybuilding in the secret lair. Using the makeshift extreme weightlifting machines, Peter has built up his strength to 14 tons while his speed is now at 127 miles per hour. Although his strength is increasing, Peter's body hasn't gotten much bigger. It's like he's permanently stuck with a thinner muscle build, which he didn't mind one bit. Near the beginning of the month, Candy Crush was approved and placed on every mobile game store possible. Right now the game only has a player base of around 30,000 people though. Although that's not a lot compared to the success of the game in his past life, Peter knew that sooner or later Candy Crush's popularity would explode. He only had to wait patiently. With the games shop, Parker Games has made a little over $100,000 this month. 
That's mostly due to a small percentage of whales, who just throw money at the game like it's nothing. And some average players buying small amounts of gold here and there. Peter has given May and Ned each 10% of Parker Games, leaving him as the majority owner with 80%. He also hired May, MJ, and her mother Grace as game testers, paying them each $3,000 a month. Ned was hired as a game developer and paid $4,000 a month. When he learned that he would be a developer for their game studio, Ned started working on his own game. Of course, Peter funded his best friend's project with all the equipment he would need to get the job done. What are you going to make? Peter asked upon hearing about Ned's plans. I think I'll make a story game set in space. Kind of like Cowboy Bebop. Ned says as he does the signature handgun sign that spiked it upon his death in the anime. Sounds cool to me. You should make it for PC so we don't have to sell physical discs. I'd rather not deal with those logistics. Peter encourages Ned, who agreed with a nod. As for everyone else, they were reluctant to make money without really doing anything for it, but Peter managed to talk them into taking their free paychecks. It's like you're my sugar daddy now. MJ comments as she got her first payment. Then call me daddy from now on. Peter jokes with a smile. You, no. As for May and Grace, both of them started taking fewer hours at work. Thanks to this extra money coming in, both single moms could start enjoying their free time a bit more. Peter set his own monthly payment to $35,000, which adds up to $420,000 a year. He could have probably taken more, but it's best to stay out of the IRS's crosshairs. Once Candy Crush starts bringing in more money, he could up the pay again. As Peter arrived at the warehouse for his next training session with Natasha, he found her waiting for him with a manila folder in hand. Good, you're on time. Natasha says as she hands over the folder. This is your first contracted mission from S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, so I'm ready now? Peter asks as he opens the folder. You've been ready since the day we met, Spidey. Natasha rolls her eyes at him. She's been calling him Spidey for about a week now. It started because Natasha found it awkward to always refer to him as Spider-Man, Peter offered the nickname to her and it just kind of stuck. The mission is simple. Natasha says as Peter starts skimming through the folder. S.H.I.E.L.D. has an agent who went missing in Pyongyang, North Korea. She was tasked with infiltrating the ruling Kim family's estate as a servant, but communications went dark. We haven't heard from her for a few days. What was her mission? Peter asks as he couldn't find it in the file. She was looking for information on possible nuclear weapons being made. The world doesn't need any more nukes after all. Natasha explains. You want me to just bring her back, right? Peter asks. Yes, along with any intel on nuclear weapons as well. She clarifies. All right, I accept the mission. Peter nods as he tucks the folder under his arm and walks out of the warehouse. Wait, we have a plane on standby for you. She calls out. No thanks. Peter waves over his shoulder. My way is faster. Leaving a confused black widow behind, Peter returned home through a portal and started preparing for his very first mission from S.H.I.E.L.D. First, Peter took a photo of the missing agent from the folder he was given and tossed it into the air. The picture froze in midair as Peter waved his hands, forming three spell circles around it. As the spell circles finished drawing themselves, they morphed into a globe, which surrounded the picture at its core. The characteristics of the Earth slowly formed on the globe, as a red dot appeared where North Korea was located. Walking up to the floating golden globe, Peter grabs it with both hands and pulls, expanding it to more than quadruple its size. In doing so, he could see the exact location of the missing agent from the picture. She's still alive and in Pyongyang. Peter muttered as he memorized her exact location and waved his hand, causing the globe to disappear and the photo to fall into Peter's waiting hand. What was that? May asked as she watched from the door. A locator spell. Peter says as he hands the folder he was given to his aunt. I was given a rescue mission from S.H.I.E.L.D. That's the spy agency run by MJ's father, right? She asks unsurely as she opens the folder. Yup, I'm heading out to complete it now. Peter says. Wait, you're going to North Korea? May asks incredulously as she read the location in the file. Yup, but I'll be back within the hour. I already know the location of the missing agent, as you saw from the spell, so it shouldn't take long. Peter explains as he snaps his fingers, causing his spider suit to turn completely black. Wow, what was that? May asks in awe at Peter's skill in magic. I added this enchantment for undercover work. Can't have people wondering why Spider-Man is saving American spies from hostile countries after all. Peter explains as he pulls up his mask and kisses May on the cheek. I'll be home soon. Pulling the mask back down, Peter opens a portal and steps through, leaving his worried Aunt May behind. 
Stepping through the portal, Peter appeared in a utility closet deep underneath the presidential palace in Pyongyang, which is the main residence of the Kim family. Using his enhanced senses to avoid roaming guards and servants, Peter leaves the closet and makes his way toward the location he saw on the locator spell. Cameras were placed at every corner, yet Peter walked openly in front of them without worry. He's invisible to cameras with his suit on after all. Descending lower than what would be thought possible, Peter took multiple stairways to a floor that was filled with solitary-style prison cells. Seeing and sensing multiple guards in his path, Peter dashes out from the stairwell and begins knocking out soldiers one by one. Peter moved too quickly for anyone to see his attacks coming, making it easy to handle the unaware guards. Soon enough, nearby prisoners started cheering him on, while others began pleading to be let free. Moving quickly as the cameras will see the guards dropping like flies, Peter rushed to a certain cell and rips the thick metal door from its hinges. Tossing the door aside, Peter is confronted by a weak and tired-looking woman, matching the picture he received from Natasha only moments ago. Ah? She yells and sprints in Peter's direction with a sharp piece of what looked to be a metal bed frame. Seeing as he plans to portal her home, Peter grabs the spear-like weapon, which was only inches away from his chest, and backhands her across the face. Instantly, she falls to the ground unconscious and Peter tosses the makeshift spear aside. From down the hall, Peter could hear multiple armed guards clearing the halls, looking for the intruder that somehow didn't appear on any cameras. Well, it's time to go. Peter mutters as he destroys the camera in the cell and opens a portal, carrying the unconscious woman through. Only seconds after the portal closes, an elite team of North Korean soldiers bursts into the cell, finding nothing but a broken and empty concrete box. Walking out of the portal and into the warehouse he usually trains in, Peter messages Natasha on his new ghost phone, which he made because it was annoying to use the laptop for simple things, like messages, calls, and normal posts on social media. Peter, meet at the warehouse. Peter knew S.H.I.E.L.D. would figure out that he has some sort of movement or spatial ability, as no one would be able to complete this mission in under an hour. Just the travel time alone would make it impossible. Though, Peter would rather not waste his time. If he completely hides his portal-making ability, Peter would have to travel normally for all of his missions and that's just not going to happen. He has far more important things to do than wait on a plane for hours at a time. Not to mention the fact that he would have to fly back as well. Nope, not happening. Peter thought. Waiting for only about 10 minutes, Natasha walks through the warehouse doors, dressed in her casual clothes. Peter only rarely sees her dressed like this, as she usually wears the battle suit during training. What did you? Natasha starts but her words soon disappear. Standing before her is Peter in his all-black suit, with a passed-out woman in a gray prison jumpsuit at his feet. Mission accomplished. Peter gives her a thumbs up as his suit shifts back to its original blue and red color scheme. H. How? Natasha asks as she strides forward and checks the sleeping prisoner's facial features. I'm the amazing Spider-Man. Something like this is child's play for me. Peter brags jokingly. No, it's physically impossible for you to have retrieved her already. She says, looking at Peter unbelievably. I only gave you the mission an hour ago. I'm just that good at my job, I guess? Peter keeps beating around the bush. It's so hard being me. I do my job in record time and this is how I'm thanked. What has our great country come to? Are you actually not going to tell me how you did this? Natasha asks, not falling for Peter's bullshit. Nope. Peter answers plainly. Did you at least get any info on the nukes? She asks in exasperation. Oops. Peter suddenly remembers that he forgot the other half of the mission. I'll be right back. Rushing out of the building, Peter finds a safe place to open a portal and appears back in the closet he started in before. He could hear alarms going off and soldiers stomping down the halls. Before leaving the closet this time, Peter waves his hand and a large spell circle appears in front of him. Once the circle finishes forming, it floats backward into Peter, morphing him into a completely different person. Now standing in the utility closet was a North Korean soldier, similar to the ones he saw during his first trip here. Time to snoop around. Peter thought as he walked out of the door. Only half an hour has passed and Peter managed to find a heavily guarded facility underneath the prison that he visited last time. Knowing that he won't be able to get past the guards, as he doesn't even speak their language, Peter looked for another way inside. After only a few minutes, Peter found a vent that lead to an elevator shaft and dived in. Sneaking out of the elevator doors, Peter found a very large underground hangar, filled with giant missiles. The warhead on each missile had the nuclear symbol painted on it, giving Peter exactly what he needed. Who in their right mind would live above a stash of nukes? Peter thought as he snapped a few pictures and portaled back to New York. Running back to the warehouse, 
Peter found it crawling with S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, who seemed to be giving the woman he rescued medical attention while questioning her about the mission. I'm back. Peter announces, causing the many agents to pull out their guns and aim at him. Put the guns away. Natasha orders as she walks up to Peter. Did you get the intel? Yup, check your phone. Peter says as he presses send on his ghost phone. Hm. Natasha checks her texts and finds pictures of nuclear missiles. Where is this? One floor lower from where I found her. Peter points to the now conscious woman across the room. Underneath the presidential palace in Pyongyang. What type of idiot would hide nukes under their own house? Natasha mutters. I said the same thing. Peter nods in agreement. One month later, after completing his first mission from S.H.I.E.L.D., Peter was offered multiple missions a week from then on. Upon learning that Peter could complete missions within an hour or two, depending on the difficulty and tediousness, S.H.I.E.L.D. started offloading jobs onto their newest contractor at a higher rate than they originally planned. Of course, they now knew that Peter had some sort of teleportation ability or perhaps a frightening movement speed. Though S.H.I.E.L.D. could do nothing but mark it down in their list of Spider-Man's powers. Fury couldn't even investigate to learn what it was, as they could do nothing that Peter wouldn't pick up with his senses. Even his online presence and contact information brought back nothing they could use. Most of the missions that S.H.I.E.L.D. brought to Peter were accepted, as they seemed to be taking his morals into account. He didn't receive any assassination missions or anything that could ruin someone else's life that didn't deserve it. Most missions were either spying, collecting information, or some sort of rescue-type mission, which Peter would always accept. So far, the only time he has declined a mission was when he was busy, and it wouldn't risk someone's life if he didn't do it. It goes without saying that all of his missions have a 100% success rate. With his super and magical powers, it was all too easy to rescue someone from a prison or steal some information. He started making a name for himself in the spy community as well. They started calling him Ghost, as he never appears on camera and nobody has an accurate description of what he looks like. Only S.H.I.E.L.D. knows that it's Spider-Man completing these missions. Other than the new missions he started going on, everything was normal in Peter's life. Well, normal for Spider-Man, Candy Crush has risen to a player base of almost 1 million, and is now bringing in a whopping 3 million dollars a month. All of which came from the in-game shop, as the game itself is free. Peter has begun to notice many of his classmates playing the game as well, which is a good sign for Candy Crush's coming growth. As for social media, Spider-Man's presence there only grows with every passing day. YouTube, 287,560,154 Twitter, 187,069,030 Instagram, 213,722,009 May finally talked him into going on some talk shows, which was an idea he wasn't a fan of, but she was really excited about it. Peter decided to just do it to make her happy. Spider-Man made appearances on The Oprah Winfrey Show alongside a few news stations. The news stations asked fairly tame questions, while Oprah was more of a drama baiter than Peter expected. Flashback, now that we've broken the ice with a few questions, I want to ask something a bit juicier. Do you mind? Oprah asks for permission. She didn't want to upset someone with superpowers, after all. Sure, I may refuse to answer though. Peter nods from his seat across from her. Why does J. Jonah Jameson have a problem with you? Oprah asks. Sigh, do you want the real answer or the nice one? Peter asks back. Both. Let's start with the nice one. She answers. Jonah is a man that's very critical of everything he sees and hears about. Peter says as if he's working overtime to say something nice. And the real answer? Oprah leans forward in her chair as she asks. Ratings. Peter answers with a shrug. It's the same reason you had those weird guests on your show before cementing yourself as who you are today. People want to hear about something crazy and interesting. Jonah simply lies and creates these huge scandals or theories. Sadly, a percentage of his viewers believe him. Oh Jesus, don't bring up those dark times. Oprah says as she hides her face. Well, my mother was a fan of those times. Peter says, referring to his Aunt May, as he didn't want to give out too much info. She especially found that one episode with the cheating midget couple to be hilarious. Oh God, the mailman? She mutters in agony as the studio audience starts laughing. After that, Oprah asked some personal questions. Though Peter didn't answer about half of them, but one question certainly broke the hearts of many fans around the world. Are you currently in a relationship? She asked, getting everyone in the crowd's attention instantly. Is there a Mrs. Spider-Man? Yes, but I can't say her name. Peter answers and sees some disappointed faces in the crowd. Does she know you're Spider-Man? Yes, I actually revealed. The interview continued and soon came to an end, 
but before leaving, Peter got Oprah to sign something for May. She was a fan after all. After that show, J. Jonah Jameson went on a week-long angry rant about Spider-Man. His show was nothing but yelling while his Twitter feed was nothing but capital letters, long paragraphs, and exclamation points. When Peter returned home after the interview, May ran up to him and pulled Peter into a warm hug. Oprah's show isn't usually a live thing like the news, but since Spider-Man was involved they aired it live that day. May watched it all and heard Peter refer to her as his mother. He's only done that when he was a child and it was by accident. Hearing him genuinely refer to her as such warmed May's heart and brought tears to her eyes. Whether he did it to hide information or not didn't matter to her. What's this about? Peter asked as he didn't understand why he was hugged. Nothing. May didn't reveal anything. I just love you so much. I love you too, May. Flashback end. MJ also saw him mention some small things about their relationship, which she was certainly embarrassed and happy about at the same time. Embarrassed because she didn't expect to be talked about on live TV, and happy because Spider-Man's more thirsty fans would hopefully stop pursuing him. That's right, one of the downfalls of starting his social media accounts was thirsty fans. There are an uncountable amount of nudes in his DMs, which Peter has shown to MJ as he didn't want her to find out and misunderstand later on. Though that's not all, as Spider-Man has entire groups of people, regardless of gender, that constantly speak out online about wanting to date him and what it would be like. It's a crazy world out there. Peter's magical training has also taken a step in a new direction. He has started learning to mold eldritch energy into weapons, which is an easy skill to pick up, but hard to master. On the first day of practice, Peter easily made an eldritch whip and tau mandalas. The whip was infinitely easier to produce than the tau mandalas, but that was only because of the intricate patterns on the dual shields. Once Peter got the patterns of the tau mandalas down, he could create the shields at the drop of a hat. The harder part began with taking a step ahead of those two weapons. Eldritch energy is a fairly malleable energy, so with practice, anything could be made from it. Peter just had to practice the specific weapon and he could master forming it with enough time. The only reason that the whip and tau mandalas are easier to learn is simple. The whip is nothing but a noodle of eldritch energy, while the tau mandalas are similar to a spell circle, which Peter has had tons of practice with up until now. In the past month, Peter has mastered three weapons, not including the whip and dual shields. He can currently make a huge warhammer, brass knuckles, and a simple baseball bat. Peter is currently working on forming a throwing spear. Though he would master that quickly, as it's not a very complicated weapon. As for Peter's personal life, everything seems to be going perfectly. He and MJ have been together for more than two months, without much issue. They haven't had a real argument in their relationship yet, though it would happen sooner or later. Every relationship has them, no matter which kind. The most they've ever argued about up until now is Peter not giving her enough free gold in Candy Crush, as MJ is addicted to that game, or Peter being overly affectionate in public. Though, these arguments are carried out jokingly and he thinks that MJ may like small shows of public affection more than she lets on. All in all, they've had a very happy and drama-free relationship. There was a point semi-recently, where MJ asked Peter if she was his girlfriend, which he laughed at immediately. Flashback, don't laugh. MJ exclaimed in embarrassment. I'm sorry, I just didn't expect that. Peter says as he pulls her in close. I thought we were on the same page. Well, I think we are but I want you to say it without joking. MJ says as she looks into Peter's eyes. Of course, you're my girlfriend. Peter says as he pecks her on the lips. Good. MJ muttered as she grabbed the back of Peter's head and pulled him into a much longer and more intimate kiss. Flashback end, while Peter was uploading his last video of the month, his phone went off and a text from Natasha appeared. Natasha, meet at the warehouse. New mission. Time sensitive. Outside a cave, deep in the desert of Afghanistan, an iron robot fires flames from its hands, burning everyone and everything in the vicinity. Insert picture of MCU original Iron Man suit, armed men and women, alongside tons of crates filled with Stark Industries weaponry and explosives, were catching fire at an alarming rate. The people surrounding the walking metal man fired bullet after bullet, yet not a single projectile could penetrate its thick iron shell. Soon enough, the spreading fire burned through the explosive crates, causing explosions to go off one by one. Boom bang boom bang tapping a button on its wrist, the metal robot shoots into the air merely seconds before a large mushroom cloud explosion happens, killing everyone in the area. Shooting out of the top of that mushroom cloud, the robot soars through the air before slowly losing altitude and crashing into a sandy hill, which definitely softened the impact. As the sand cleared, metal was strewn about everywhere, and inside the center of that mess was Tony Stark. Pieces of what was thought to be a robot were still attached to him like an advanced type of metal armor. 
Inhale exhale, Tony breathes heavily as he just lays in the mess of sand and metal parts, catching his breath with a tired and worn out look on his face. He's gone through hell for the past three months. First, he was kidnapped by terrorists armed with his own weaponry. Then he found out that he had shrapnel moving toward his heart, which was somehow stopped by a magnet that was attached to a car battery. After all of that, Tony was forced to make a Jericho missile for his captors alongside his new friend Inson, who died just as they were going to escape together with the metal suit, which they built in secret. Now, Tony just finished slaughtering dozens of people and is currently stuck in the middle of the desert with an arc reactor he built in a cave out of scrap stuck to his chest. I hate the desert. Tony mutters as he starts to move a bit, checking his body for injuries. Suddenly, a golden wisp of light appears in the middle of the air, catching Tony's attention out of the corner of his eye. What the? Tony mutters as the wisp of golden light extends into a large circle. Is this a mirage? Your mission is time sensitive. Natasha hands over a folder as Peter walked into the warehouse. Is it another rescue? Peter asks as he opens the folder and instantly sees a satellite picture of the original Iron Man suit, standing outside of a cave in the desert. What's this? It's Tony Stark. He's making his escape from a terrorist group known as the Ten Rings. Natasha gives a brief overview as Peter looks through the pictures, seeing the large explosion that soon filled the area and the spot where Tony landed soon after. Our satellites are out of range now, but he should still be in that location. We need you to pick him up. Peter was beyond excited. This is the best first meeting he could ask for, as Peter already planned to make contact with Tony Stark soon after his return. Alright, I've always wanted to meet Tony Stark anyway. Peter shrugs and walks towards the exit. Get some medics in here. I'll be back in a few minutes. As the circle forms in front of Tony Stark's unbelieving eyes, an image appears in the center and Spider-Man steps through, setting foot on the uneven sands of Afghanistan. Yo! Peter waves as the portal behind him closes. Did I hit my head on the landing? Tony mutters as he inspects his head with his hands, looking for any bumps, dents, and or blood. Yeah, sure, I'm your imaginary friend. Peter jokes as he walks over and pulls Tony up to his feet. Holy shit! Tony exclaims as he feels Peter pull him upwards. You're real? Well, yeah. Peter answers with a nod, enjoying this whole situation a bit too much. How did you do that? Tony says, pointing to where the portal used to be. I mean, it's, it's... magic? Peter tries to finish his sentence. Impossible. Tony disregards Peter's answer and gives his own. Everything is impossible until you figure out how to do it. Peter shrugs. Okay, so how did you do it? Is it some sort of a quantum physics, dark matter, wormholes, or what? Tony asks, completely forgetting he's stuck in a desert. How about I show you later? Just keep this to yourself and I'll take you home. Deal? Peter offers. Deal. Tony instantly accepts. All right, follow me. Peter says as he waves his hand, creating another portal. Tony's mind broke at that moment. Making a portal is theoretically possible with the right technology, but Spider-Man didn't seem to have any sort of tech with him. Come on. Peter says, pushing Tony through the portal. Ack. Tony grunts as he falls through the portal and into the warehouse, where Peter received this mission. Standing in front of them is Natasha, who just called in for medics and was waiting to hear back from Peter. She was shocked that Peter would so easily reveal the form of transportation he's been hiding until now. Don't think I don't know about your little lie. If you're going to learn about it from satellite images, then I might as well show you. Peter says as he lifts Tony off the floor and sets him on his feet. Aye aye. Natasha didn't know what to say. She was told by S.H.I.E.L.D. that the satellites were out of range before giving Peter the mission, but that doesn't mean she didn't know it was a lie from the start. Natasha is an expert in lies and deception, so she knew that Fury was lying to her. Fury wasn't sure that Natasha would betray Peter, as they'd spent a lot of time together, and he wasn't her average victim. She's used to betraying foreign dignitaries, spies, nobles, politicians, and just all-around bad people. Not kind-hearted superheroes. Fury simply decided for her and told the lie himself. He wanted to use this moment to get pictures of how Spider-Man gets around. It was the perfect moment that S.H.I.E.L.D. was waiting for. Peter always accepts rescue missions, and thankfully, this one was urgent and in a wide open desert, where he couldn't hide his portal. Natasha felt bad for not warning Peter, but she had to, as it's her job. Though, that doesn't stop the horrible feeling of betraying someone you spent months teaching and befriending from rearing its ugly head. Though she's used to that feeling and it would ease soon enough. Is this some sort of couple's spat? Tony asks jokingly, trying his best to shoo away the bad atmosphere. No, just a friendly one. Peter comments as he turns to Tony. Are you hurt anywhere? Medics should be here soon. 
I'm definitely bruised and scraped up, but other than that I'm fine. Tony says as he knocks on his arc reactor. This thing is keeping me alive. How is it doing that? Natasha asks. It's powering a magnet underneath that's holding back shrapnel from entering my heart. Tony says proudly. Wow, is that a mini arc reactor? Like the big one your dad made to power Stark Industries headquarters. Peter pretends to figure it out. Yes, are you a fan or something? Tony asks hopefully. He wanted the man that can make portals with his mind to be his or his father's fan. That way, he would be more willing to teach him how it's done. Not really, I'm just a bit of a nerd. Peter shrugs uncaring. Deep inside, Peter is a bit of a fanboy for Tony Stark, just like everyone else in his past life, but he wouldn't reveal that to the man himself. Soon enough, medics came rolling in and gave Tony a thorough checkup, which he hated every second of. Once it was finally finished, Tony stood up and walked to the exit. The medics actually wanted him to go to a hospital, but Tony refused. Where are you going? Natasha asks. I need some good old-fashioned American fast food. Tony announces grandly with his arms wide open. Cheeseburgers, french fries, chicken nuggets, milkshakes. I want it all. Wait here and I'll bring a car around for you. Natasha catches up to Tony and blocks the doorway. You can't just walk around New York City like this. You've been missing for three months. People will swarm like locusts. So that's where we are? Fine, but hurry up. Tony says hurriedly. I've eaten nothing but scraps for too long, and I'm starving. Without a word, Natasha walks off to get a car. Peter wasn't sure if she had a car, as he's never seen one before. Is she going to steal one? Peter thought as Tony turns to him. Are you tagging along, Webhead? Tony asks. Webhead? Peter asks back. Yeah, you like it? Sure, it's actually the name of my Gmail account. Sitting in a black four-door SUV, Natasha drives Peter and Tony to a nearby McDonald's. While they drove, many people caught a glimpse of Spider-Man in the back seat, but that wasn't all they saw. Sitting in the front seat was Tony Stark, the man that's been missing for three months and was long thought to be deceased by this point in time. Short and blurry videos and pictures were posted on social media, causing millions of people around the world to wonder if this was a hoax or not. Peter's ghost phone was blowing up with notifications, everyone wanted to know if the videos were real or not. Can't you mute that thing? Tony asks as he shoves a wad of salty McDonald's fries into his mouth. Sorry, Twitter is freaking out about us. Some people we passed earlier must have taken pictures or videos. Peter says as he muted his phone. Twitter? Tony mutters after slurping on a chocolate milkshake. Spider-Man has a Twitter account? He has even been on the Oprah Winfrey show. Natasha says, rolling her eyes at Peter through the rearview mirror. Oprah? I haven't even been on Oprah. Tony says incredulously. I guess you're just not as famous as me. Peter says, knowing he's provoking Tony's ego. Tony stopped eating and turned towards Peter. It's on. What's on? Peter asked questioningly. I think he took that as a challenge. Natasha clarifies and Tony nods his head alongside her. Well, good luck. Peter says as he whips out his phone and shows Tony his follower and subscriber counts. Holy shit. Tony exclaims as he reads numbers in the hundreds of millions. Like I said, good luck. After Tony finished eating, he borrowed Natasha's phone and made a few phone calls. Soon enough, a black-tinted car arrived to pick him up. I have some business to take care of. Tony says as he turns to Peter. You want to tag along, webhead? No, I have to get home. Peter refuses with a shake of his head. Though, I'll come to visit you. Are you returning to Los Angeles? Yeah, I have to get back to the company headquarters. Tony nods. All right, I'll visit you tomorrow. Peter says as he shoots a web at a nearby building and tugs, launching off into the distance. I was hoping he would give me a lift home. Tony sighs dejectedly as he waves at Natasha and hops into the car, leaving her there. Ring ring ring, Romanov. Natasha answers the phone. We got the images back, he's using. Fury says but Natasha stops him. Portals, I know. She says with a bit of sass in her voice. He showed it to you? Fury asks. Yes, he knew it was a lie from the start and seems to be upset with me now. Natasha says with a sigh. Should we pull you out and send a different agent to take your place? Fury asks, not affected a single bit by the outcome of his lie. No, I'll figure it out. Natasha answers with a tired sigh. Alright, I'll have Barton on standby just in case. Spider-Man is too good of an asset to lose after all. Fury says and cuts the call. Putting the phone away, Natasha leans up against her stolen car with a sad and conflicted look on her face. She needed to apologize and make it up to Spidey somehow. 
The next day, MJ came over after school and they watched TV together in the living room. May was at work and Ned has been working on his game for Parker Games, so they had the house all to themselves. Just as things were getting a bit hot and heavy, the random channel they had on suddenly changed to a live press conference. Hey, would it be alright if everyone sat down? A voice came from the TV. Peter's attention was immediately drawn away from MJ's lips and onto the TV, where they both saw Tony Stark sitting in front of a podium. Why don't you just sit down? That way you can see me, and this is a bit less formal. Tony says to the crowd on the other side of the camera. Good to see you. Tony says to Obadiah Stane, who is standing there beside him. Insert picture of MCU Obadiah Stane here, good to see you too. Stane responds with nothing but lies. Didn't you just rescue him? Why is he holding a press conference? MJ asks, from her position wrapped in Peter's arms. I don't know. Peter says as they both watch curiously. I never got to say goodbye to my father. There are questions that I would have asked him. I would have asked him how he felt about what this company did. If he was conflicted, if he ever had doubts. Or maybe he was every inch the man we all remember from the newsreels. I saw young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend and protect them. I saw that I had become part of a system that is comfortable with zero accountability. Tony says with a hollow look in his eyes. What happened over there? One of the reporters in the crowd asks. I had my eyes opened. Tony stands and moves behind the podium. I came to realize that I have more to offer this world than just making things that blow up. That is why, effective immediately, I am shutting down the weapons manufacturing division of Stark International, a huge commotion is heard, as every reporter in the room starts rapid-firing questions. Until such a time as I can decide what the future of the company will be. What direction it should take, hopefully, one that I'm comfortable with and is consistent with the highest good for this country, as well. Tony leaves the stage and Obadiah Stane takes his place at the podium. What we should take away from this is that Tony's back. And he's healthier than ever. We're going to have a... Stain speaks and Peter mutes the TV. How did a bunch of terrorists get a hold of Stark weapons? MJ asks suspiciously. It sounds like someone in his company is selling some goods off the books. Peter answers. Are you still planning to visit Stark today? MJ asks as she pulled out of Peter's hold and stood up. Yeah, where are you going? Peter confirms. Home, go visit Tony and get the details. Maybe you can help. MJ says as she pecks Peter on the cheek and makes her way to the door. Be sure to bring me back all the details. At that moment, Peter knew why she was doing this. MJ wanted the juicy details about what she just heard on TV. Luckily, her significant other has some connections. She would make a good reporter or detective. Stepping through a portal into the Stark Mansion in Los Angeles, Peter enters Tony's workshop and sees Pepper Pot standing over Tony, who is shirtless on a reclined chair. There's a hole in his chest and the arc reactor is on a nearby table. Pepper's fingers are all up inside Tony's chest hole, reaching for something. Insert picture of MCU Pepper Pots here, okay, now make sure that when you pull it out, that you don't. Tony tries to explain something, but Pepper pulls out a wire with a magnet attached causing some nearby medical equipment to start beeping. There's a magnet at the end of it. That was it. You just pulled it out. Oh, God. Pepper starts to panic. Okay, I was not expecting that. Tony mutters. Okay, what do I do? Pepper asks as she tries to put the magnet back inside Tony's chest hole. Don't put it back in. Don't put it back in. Tony stops her. What's wrong? Pepper asks. Nothing, I'm just going into cardiac arrest. Tony says. Can I lend a hand? Peter makes his presence known, scaring Pepper with his sudden appearance. Ah, webhead. Perfect timing. Tony says as he waves Peter over. You say you're a nerd, right? Help me out. Pepper immediately steps away in shock as Spider-Man takes her place and begins fixing whatever she did. Tony walks him through it and in no time a brand new magnet and arc reactor are in place. Oh, that's so much better. Tony says as the shrapnel in his chest is no longer making its way towards his heart. Thanks, webhead. I owe you one. You owe me two. Peter holds up two fingers. I also saved you from a desert. Sir, if this is a good time, I believe I require a diagnostics check. The cameras seem to be malfunctioning. Jarvis speaks through the speakers in the room. How so? Tony asks as he rolls his chair toward a nearby computer. You are talking to somebody that I can't see. I can hear his voice through the microphones in the house, yet he's invisible to the cameras. Jarvis explains. Oh, sorry. Let me fix that for you. Peter says and turns off his camera protection. Instantly, Tony saw Spider-Man appear on a nearby surveillance monitor, and Jarvis could see him as clear as day. 
That's a neat bit of technology. Tony nods in approval. It's not. Peter answers cryptically as he turns to a very confused Pepper Potts. Hello, I'm Spider-Man, sorry for the late introduction. Peter says as he holds his hand forward. P. Pepper. She says and shakes Peter's hand. Sorry for dropping in without permission, but I saw the press conference and thought I'd come over. Well, that's only half truthful. My girlfriend was watching too and wanted to know how those terrorists got your weapons. Though I have to say, I'm curious as well. Peter says as he turns back to Tony. I haven't had time to look into it yet. Want to team up and figure it out, webhead? Tony asks excitedly. It'll be like a comic book team up. Except you aren't a superhero? Peter says and Tony's eyes brighten as if a light bulb went off in his head. I could be. Tony mutters lowly. Only Peter could hear what Tony said, and a smile instantly formed on his face. Did I just help Tony Stark decide to officially become Iron Man? So, what do you say? Want to stick around and help me out? Tony asks. Sure. Peter agrees with a shrug. Just keep my being here to yourselves. I don't need fans or vengeful criminals coming to your house. Ah? Uh, I wanted to post a selfie of us on my new Twitter account. Tony whines. You made a Twitter account? Pepper asks in surprise. He's trying to compete with me. Peter reveals. In what? Pepper asks. Being famous. Tony says as he holds up his phone. See, I already have over 300,000 followers. Really? Pepper was not amused. Yeah, I pretty much told him it would be impossible. Peter comments. Soon enough, Pepper left with the old arc reactor in hand. Tony told her to incinerate it, but Peter knows that she wouldn't. She's too sentimental for that. So, should we start hacking into your company? Peter asks, but Tony shakes his head. Jarvis is already on that. We have something else to work on. Jarvis, open the project file named Mark II. Tony says, and the monitors in the workshop change to show schematics and blueprints for the Mark II Iron Man suit. In the center of the room, a hologram appears, showing a brief outline of the whole suit. You're making another suit? The other one didn't last very long before it fell apart. Peter comments as he looks over the monitors. Well, that was built in a cave out of scraps. Tony rolls his eyes. This one will be built with the best technology available. Are you trying to take over my job? Peter asks. What? Not enough room in the world for two superheroes. Tony raises an eyebrow at him. I wouldn't say that. Peter says as he looks straight at Tony. As long as you admit that I'm your senpai and become my sidekick, then I have no problem taking you under my wing. That's never going to happen. Tony refuses adamantly. You're no fun. Peter says as he goes back to observing the monitors. Why do you want to make this thing anyway? Do you really want to be a hero? The way I see it is that this solves two major problems. The people that kidnapped me dash, Tony says as he types on his keyboard, pulling up images and videos of the ten rings. I didn't kill them all. More of my weapons could be out there. I need to stop them. Every person they kill is blood on my hands. I won't allow that. And the other reason? Peter asks. I have a lot to make up for. Who knows how many lives my creations have ruined. I don't trust the government or even my own company to do the right thing anymore, so I'll do it myself. Tony explains. All right, I'm on board. Peter starts getting excited. Though, you'll need a superhero name. How about Metal Man? Tony throws out an idea. No, that's lame. Let's just get this thing built first. Maybe the media can come up with a better name. While Peter and Tony start working on the new Iron Man suit, men from the Ten Rings were searching the desert for the left-behind parts of the Iron Man Mark I suit. A man with half of his face burned badly bends down and picks up a piece of metal. Sand falls through some holes in the metal piece, revealing it to be the broken-off face mask of the Iron Man Mark I suit. Insert picture of MCU Raza from the Ten Rings, time passes as Tony and Peter work throughout the week to get the Iron Man suit built. They started with the boots, which were finished by the second day. Testing them was a huge mess as Tony was launched into the ceiling, nearing breaking all of the bones in his body. On day three, they began working on the hand repulsors, for stabilization during flight. While Peter was strapping the repulsor to Tony's right hand, Pepper came down to the workshop. Obadiah is upstairs waiting for you, Mr. Stark. She says as Tony activates the arm repulsor, launching himself backward and onto the ground. Oh my god. Are you okay? Eh, he's fine. Peter says with a shrug. This isn't the first time. Yeah, I'm good. Tony grunts as he wobbly stands back up. While Tony went to go and speak with Iron Munger, the man who would soon betray him for a second time, Peter watched the whole scene from the workshop's monitors, thanks to Jarvis. 
Obadiah revealed that the board of Tony's company is filing an injunction against him, while also trying to get Tony to hand over the arc reactor for testing, which he immediately refused. When Tony came back, he had two slices of pizza in hand. Want some? He asks as he stuffs his face. No, that pizza is a disgrace to New York standards. Peter declines jokingly as he decides to drop a hint. Is it just me or does that stain guy seem creepy and suspicious? What Obi? He's just like that. Tony shrugs and they get back to work. Peter knew that Tony wouldn't believe him. Obadiah Stain is practically family to Tony. Nothing but cold hard proof would sway Tony's loyalty to the man, so Peter wouldn't push it. Planting a small seed of doubt was enough. After getting the feet and hands of the suit finished, Peter and Tony connected everything and launched their first test flight. Due to the constant injuries that Tony has been receiving, Peter, webbed up the surrounding area as a sort of safety net. I feel like I'm a bug that's about to get eaten by a huge spider. Tony says as he looks up at all the web. It's either this or some broken bones and a concussion. Now, kick that baby into gear and start flying. Peter says, stepping back to give Tony some room. Here it goes. Tony says nervously as he activated the boots and gloves. Within seconds, Tony was pushed off the ground and shakily began hovering in place. After getting used to the balance of flying, Tony did a small lap around the room and landed on his feet, and was only slightly out of balance. Yes. Tony celebrates as he catches his balance. It worked, but now we have to tweak and upgrade it. Let's not forget the heads-up display and armor too. Peter says, instantly bringing Tony back to work mode. The armor will be built with machines controlled by Jarvis, so all we have to do is build and code the HUD. After that, Jarvis will put everything together for us. Tony explains. Man, I need my own AI. Peter mutters, causing Tony to start bragging about Jarvis. A week later and everything was put together, marking the completion of the Iron Man Mark II suit. With the help of Tony's many robots, the man himself donned the silver suit and started testing the HUD with Jarvis. Insert picture of silver Mark II Iron Man suit here, everything working? Peter asks from the sidelines. Everything seems good. Tony says in a slightly morphed metallic voice, as the suit's helmet is closed. Without a word, Tony starts hovering off the ground and leans forward shooting out of the workshop's garage entrance. This idiot. Peter mutters as he walks over to the monitors. Jarvis, give me a visual on our resident dumbass. Yes, sir. He responds, and a view from Tony's helmet appears on the main screen. Woohoo! Tony yelled as he soars through the air. He was shaky at first, but soon started to fly around like a skilled pilot. Getting a bit ballsy, Tony turns and launches himself up into the sky. Though, maybe a bit too high, as the metal suit begins to freeze due to the high altitude. Suddenly, the suit loses power, and Tony begins falling from the sky. Ag! He yelled as the ground became closer and closer. Shaking his head, Peter opened a portal onto the floor. As soon as the portal opened, the visual on the monitor showed a similar portal open up under Tony, swallowing him. Ag! Tony's screams fill the workshop as he comes shooting up out of the portal on the floor. Smacking into the ceiling, some ice breaks off of the suit as Tony bounces back onto one of his many expensive cars, completely totaling it. As the alarm of the crushed car fills the room, a nearby robot shoots a fire extinguisher onto Tony, who is still getting over his near-death experience. Well, that was dumb. Peter comments as he walks over and pulls up the face mask, revealing Tony's face. Yeah, not the smartest thing I've done. Once the suit was removed and Tony was checked for injuries, Jarvis was instructed to create another suit. Though this one wouldn't be affected by the cold as the Mark II was. Of course, the bright red and gold color scheme would be added this time as well. While Peter and Tony were hanging out and waiting for the suit to be finished, they heard something interesting on the news. Tonight's red-hot red carpet is right here at the Disney Concert Hall, where Tony Stark's third annual benefit for the Firefighters Family Fund has become the place to be for LA's high society. Looks like you weren't invited to your own event? Peter comments. Looking at the TV, Tony saw Obadiah Stane walking into the event hall with a smile on his face. Instantly, he remembered what Peter said. Creepy and suspicious, huh? Tony thought as he turned to Peter. Want to crash a party? A million-dollar black two-door supercar pulls up in front of a crowded red carpet entrance. The spotless red carpet was flanked on both sides by a plethora of reporters and cameramen. The building itself was an intricate events hall, which probably cost a pretty penny to rent for the charity event. I can't believe I agreed to this. Peter mutters from the passenger seat, still dressed in his spider suit. How did you talk me into this again? Let's go. It's too late to turn back now. Tony smirks and exits the car, drawing all the attention and cameras their way. 
As a valet takes his keys, Peter sighs and opens the passenger side door, stepping out as well. Instantly, the crowd begins to freak out, as no one expected Spider-Man to attend this event. Let alone for him to be outside of New York. Especially alongside the controversial Tony Stark. Putting his arm over Peter's shoulder, Tony walks Peter down the red carpet with a beaming smile on his face. He was loving this. That's Spider-Man. Is this a joke? How does Stark know Spider-Man? The crowd had nothing but questions as Tony and Peter walked up to Obadiah Stane, who was in the middle of some sort of interview on the red carpet. Along the way, Peter saw Stan Lee dressed as Hugh Hefner. Stan Lee winked at Peter before walking into the crowd with a woman on each arm, disappearing from Peter's senses completely. Is he the god of this world or something? Peter thought as he remembered all of Stan Lee's cameos. Weapons manufacturing is only one small part of what Stark Industries is all about, and our partnership with the fire and rescue community. Stain speaks to a reporter. What's the world coming to when a guy has to crash his own party? Tony surprises Stain, who turns around quickly. Though that surprise morphed into shock as he saw Spider-Man standing next to Tony. He couldn't believe his eyes. Ah, uh, Tony, is that Spider-Man? Stain asks nervously. He instantly thought that Spider-Man may be suspicious of him. After all, he's funding a terrorist organization, which would make him a criminal in Spider-Man's book. Yep, me and Webhead here are pals. We'll see you inside, Obi. Tony says as he keeps walks alongside Peter. Leaving a bewildered and worried Obadiah Stain behind, Peter and Tony walk through a sea of camera flashes to get inside. This was your plan all along, wasn't it? Peter asks. I don't know what you mean. Tony acts innocent. Those pictures of us together are going to bring you millions of followers. You're still trying to outdo me, aren't you? Peter put it all together. Hey, thanks for the followers. Tony pats Peter on the back and walks off with a laugh. Go and mingle. Maybe find a wandering supermodel to occupy your time? We'll meet up later. Some nearby finely dressed women heard what Tony said and gave Peter a look. He was just joking. I'm in a relationship, bye. Peter runs off before he could feel the awkwardness in the air. Walking around a bit, Peter was greeted by random men and women, who seemed to be important people from either Stark Industries or other companies. Walking up to the bar, Peter could see a man in a familiar black suit talking to Tony, who was barely paying attention to the conversation. Let's just put something on the books. Tony says as he stares off into the crowd. How about the 24th at 7 p.m. at Stark Industries headquarters? Agent Coulson asks. Tell you what. You got it. You're absolutely right. Well, I'm going to go to my assistant, and we'll make a date. Tony walks off in Pepper's direction. Peter finally understood why Tony was so distracted. His lower head was doing the thinking at the moment. Pepper was dressed in a beautiful backless dress and he couldn't keep his eyes off of her. If only her actress, Gwyneth Paltrow, from Peter's last life wasn't such a nutjob scammer, who sells vagina-scented candles and vagina eggs that were marketed to enhance orgasms and improve bladder control. Hello, again. Peter takes Tony's place next to Coulson at the bar. Spider-Man. I didn't expect you to be here. Coulson greets Peter with a surprised smile. Yeah, Tony and I are best buds now. Peter says as they watch the man himself dance with his assistant. How are things with Natasha? Coulson asks. We're fine. I've been too busy helping Tony with something to train with her lately though. Peter answers. I see. Coulson knew he was mad at her for the satellite scheme Fury came up with. She didn't lie, you know? A second-hand lie is still a lie. She's an expert in these things, so I'm sure she had her doubts. If Natasha wants to apologize and explain herself, then she can come to me and do so herself. Peter says as Tony walks back to the bar. Were things getting too hot and heavy over there? Peter comments, changing the subject. You have no idea. Tony mutters as he orders a drink from the bartender. While Tony was waiting for the drink, a woman comes up and speaks to him. At first, the conversation is slightly flirty, but soon it turns serious as the woman pulls out a picture, accusing Tony of some atrocity. When was this taken? Tony asks in shock. The pictures showed the deaths of innocent civilians in a desert town, alongside tons of Stark Industries weaponry. These pictures were taken one day ago. It's a town called Gulmira. Ever heard of it? She asks accusingly. I didn't approve any shipment. Tony denies. Well, your company did. After seeing these pictures, Coulson and Peter watch Tony storm over to Obadiah Stain and have a tense looking conversation that ended in a picture together. Let's take a picture. Come on. Picture time. Stain puts his arm around Tony's shoulder. Tony, who do you think locked you out of the company? I was the one who filed the injunction against you. It was the only way I could protect you. 
He says condescendingly and walks off, leaving a shocked Tony Stark behind. Walking up to Tony, Peter goes to speak, but Tony stops him. Don't say it. Tony says in dread. I told you so. Peter says it anyway. I have some work to do. Tony sighs and storms off to his car. As Tony closed the driver's side door and started the car, Peter hops in as well. We have some work to do. Peter says reassuringly. Tony smiles for a moment and then peels off down the road, heading straight home. As they arrive at Tony's mansion, the news was still on, but this time it wasn't covering the Stark charity event. Simple farmers and herders from peaceful villages have been driven from their homes. Victims have been forced to take shelter in whatever crude dwellings they can find in the ruins of other villages. As you can see, these men, known as the Ten Rings, are heavily armed and on a mission that could prove fatal to anyone who stands in their way. There's very little hope for these refugees, refugees who can only wonder who, if anyone, will help. Jarvis, how long until my suit is finished? Tony asks. Two hours and seventeen minutes, sir. Jarvis answers. Sighing in annoyance, Tony could do nothing but watch the carnage on the news. Maybe I should go over there ahead of you? Peter says as he sees bombs raining into civilian areas on the TV. I won't attack them or reveal myself until you get there. I know you want to be the one to do that. How are you going to help then? Tony asks. I have a few tricks up my sleeve that you've never seen before. Peter says as his suit goes into dark mode. I'll be waiting for you. Peter says as he opens a portal, causing desert sands to blow into the room as he walks through, leaving Tony behind. As the portal closes, Tony contemplated following Peter through but knew he was no help without his iron suit. Sigh? Tony hated waiting, but it was all he could do. Arriving at the edge of the bomb site, Peter took cover out of sight behind a nearby crumbling building. He could sense the people that were hiding in and around the decimated village. Alright, let's test some large area protection enchantments. Peter thought as he cast an illusion over himself, changing his appearance to match one of the many civilians in the area, before turning his attention to the bombed village itself. I've never done this before, but there's no time like the present to see if I can get it done. After disguising himself with an illusion, Peter assumed a stance with his arms wide open. Instantly, large-scale spell circles appeared and draw themselves into the air. If not for the constant bombardment of Stark industry missiles, which caused smoke and fire to cover the village, someone would have easily noticed the spell circles. After fully forming, the spell circles descend onto the village and expand to cover every house and building in the area. Soon, the spell circles fade into a sort of brand, marking every wall, roof, and door in the village. That should hold long enough for me to evacuate everyone. Peter mutters as a missive hits a half-broken house. Boom, as the smoke clears, the house is still standing as if nothing happened. Though the brand that was left on the home fades slightly. That house would be able to take three or four more explosions before the protection disappeared. I'm quite impressed with myself. Peter thought as he watched his spell work perfectly. This spell is a more powerful but less hidden version of the shielding spell he placed on his loved ones. He just cranked it up a notch and placed it on a large area, allowing each building's shield to take a certain amount of damage before it wore off. Rushing into the village, Peter dodged missiles and mortars as he escorted the leftover civilians out of the village. Peter would rush to them using his enhanced senses, and put them to sleep with a simple spell. Once they were out cold, he would portal them to a nearby refugee camp and move on to the next house. By the time the village was empty, the protection Peter put in place was broken. Within minutes after that, the entire village was broken. Most of the buildings were demolished. Everything else was nothing but rubble and smoke. When the bombardment stopped, the Ten Rings, who were stationed on the outskirts, where they fired their weapons from. After searching the place for survivors, the terrorists found none and set up camp, turning the once peaceful village into a sort of home base. They unloaded Stark weaponry from their trucks as they made themselves at home in the remaining homes of innocent people they either killed or drove away. The terrorists seemed annoyed and confused at the lack of remaining civilians, probably wanting to take them hostage or recruit those able to their cause. Seeing that the Ten Rings are taking a break from their onslaught, Peter portaled back into Stark's mansion. As the portal closes behind him, the illusion he disguised himself with disappears. Yo! Peter calls out. Jarvis, where is Tony? Mr. Stark is in the workshop. His suit is finished. Jarvis says as Peter walks downstairs to the workshop. Tony's workshop has a passcode to enter, but due to Peter's constant assistance over the past week, he was given his own code to enter. It would only work when Tony was in the workshop. He can always portal inside if needed as well. Though Tony made him promise not to do so unless there's an emergency. Walking down the stairs, Peter saw Tony standing with his arms in a T-pose as machines attached red and gold armor onto his body. Looking good. 
Peter called out as Tony donned the helmet, completing his Iron Man armor. Are you ready to head out? I know the exact location and already evacuated the would-be hostages. Looking down at his hands and seeing the blasters on his palms pull slightly, Tony looks up at Peter as the face mask on his suit closes. Let's do this. A morphed metallic voice rings out from the suit. Switching his suit back to the red and blue design, Peter opens a portal and Tony launches himself forward, flying straight through without a word. Normally, Peter would use his dark suit to hide his actions, but he's already been seen with Tony Stark in public. Tony will announce that he's Iron Man soon enough, so hiding would actually work against him in this case. People may draw a connection between Spider-Man and his darker disguise, which wouldn't be good. By the time Peter stepped through the portal, gunfire and the sound of Tony's hand blasters were going off inside the broken village. Rushing to Tony's location, Peter saw Iron Man shooting lasers from his hand and launching terrorists across the village with simple punches. Looking behind Tony, Peter saw a tank in the distance, aiming at Tony's exposed back. As the tank fired and a giant shell launched from its barrel toward the back of his friend, Peter dashed forward and shot a web at the giant bullet. As the web connected with its target, Peter jumped in the air, pulling the large piece of metal with him. Yanking the web over his head, he sends the rocket crashing down onto the beefy metal tank. Bang, the tank caves in slightly as the shell embedded itself into it, causing the tank to explode soon after. Boom, thanks, buddy. Tony's metallic voice calls out as Peter turns to see Iron Man blast a guy into a crumbling wall. No problem. Peter yells back as he jumps into the air and shoots countless webs, which attach themselves to the assault rifles of multiple terrorists. Pulling on the multiple webs, many guns come flying in Peter's direction. Grabbing two AK-47s from the air, Peter holds them akimbo style and unloads on the now unarmed members of the Ten Rings. Tony follows his lead and launches into the air as well, using his HUD to lock onto the many terrorists in the village, small guns rise from his shoulders and fire. Each shot landed as a perfect headshot, giving these unscrupulous men a quick death, which maybe they didn't deserve. As the gunfire from both Peter's AK-47s and Tony's suit died down, everyone was dead and all that remained were corpses and the many crates filled with Stark Industries weaponry. Peter looked at the corpses surrounding him and felt nothing. He thought that killing would give him this horrible feeling, as all forms of media told him so, yet that feeling never came. Is there something wrong with me? He thought as Tony starts blowing up the many crates filled with his company's goods. Walking out of the village to get some distance from the explosions, Peter could see some military Humvees driving through the sands and in their direction. They must have seen what happened and decided to finally move in. Peter thought as Tony flew off into the clouds. Did this idiot forget I can portal us home? Shaking his head, Peter opens a portal and returns to Tony's house, ordering some Chinese food with Tony's money while he waits. As many black SUVs pulled into a dark camp filled with tents and armed men located in the Afghan desert, a bald bearded man steps out alongside multiple armed security forces. Welcome. Raza, who is the leader of the Ten Rings in this area of the world, welcomes Obadiah Stane, who stares at the man's burned head. If you'd killed Tony when you were supposed to, you'd still have a face. Stain comments. You paid us trinkets to kill a prince. Raza responds with anger and annoyance clear in his voice. Show me the weapon. Stain ignores what he said. Call me. Leave your guards outside. Raza leads Stain to the inside of a tent at the heart of the camp. His escape bore unexpected fruit. Obadiah lays his eyes on the Mark I Iron Man suit. It looked worn from the battle during Tony's escape, but with the right power source and some elbow grease, it could function once again. So this is how he did it. Stain says as he admires the armor. This is only a first, crude effort. Stark has perfected his design. He has made a masterpiece of death. A man with a dozen of these can rule all of Asia. Gaza says with a hopeful smile. You dream of Stark's throne. We have a common enemy. If we are still in business, I will give you these designs, as a gift. In turn, I hope you'll repay me with a gift of iron soldiers. Technology. Stain places his hand on Raza's shoulder and uses a small handheld machine to stun Raza. It's always been your Achilles heel in this part of the world. Don't worry. It'll only last for 15 minutes. Though that's the least of your problems. Stain walks out of the tent and finds his security forces waiting for him. All of Raza's men have been disarmed and we're on their knees with their hands on their heads. All right, let's finish up here. Crate up the armor and the rest of it. Stain orders as he ignores everything and gets back into one of the many SUVs. As he closes the door to the SUV and takes out his phone to make a call, the sound of gunfire fills the air as Stain's men execute the captive terrorists. Set up Sector 16 underneath the ARC reactor, and I'm going to want this data masked. Recruit our top engineers. I want a prototype right away. 
Tony didn't return home quickly enough, so Peter took his Chinese food and returned home. While he was eating his food in the living room, Peter saw Tony's military friend, James Rhodes, appear on the news talking about some sort of training exercise. Did that idiot run into a US fighter jet, like in the movie? Peter guessed. After he finished eating, Peter cleaned up and portaled back to Tony's house, where he found Tony and Pepper having some sort of argument. Well, then, I quit. Pepper tosses a flash drive onto a nearby desk. You stood by my side all these years while I reaped the benefits of destruction, and now that I'm trying to protect the people that I put in harm's way, you're going to walk out? Tony asks in confusion. You're going to kill yourself, Tony. I'm not going to be a part of it. Pepper answers back in exasperation. I shouldn't be alive unless it was for a reason. I'm not crazy, Pepper. I just finally know what I have to do, and I know in my heart that it's right. Tony explains. Pepper reluctantly picks up the flash drive from the desk, and lets out a resigned sigh. You're all I have, too, you know. Pepper says and goes to leave but Peter was in her way. Yo. Peter says with a wave. What are you two up to? I'm going to infiltrate Tony's office to get proof of Obadiah's crimes. Pepper says, holding up the flash drive. Nah, you don't have to do that. Peter says as he snatches the drive from her hand. I'll be right back. Technically, Peter already knows everything they'll find in this little excursion. Though having the proof in hand would make it easier for Tony to explain to the authorities. Before either of them could say anything, Peter activates the anti-camera function of his suit, turns it black, and portals to the rooftop of Stark Industries headquarters. Walking down the side of the building, Peter found Tony's office. Using a simple spell to phase through the window, Peter sits at the desk and plugs the flash drive into the PC's USB port. Instantly, the screen lights up as a red window pops up. Warning, security breach, soon after, some code appears on the screen and the warning disappears. Access granted, while the flash drive did its work, Peter cast a quick locking spell on the door. In the movie, Stain almost catches Pepper doing this. He does, however, find out that she stole the information afterwards. That probably won't happen this time, unless Tony was sloppy with this flash drive and someone learns of the security breach, which is very unlikely. Peter didn't care either way. Taking out Iron Munger would be easy. The only reason that Peter is letting things sort of play out is that Tony needs to become the hero he's meant to be. If Peter were to take care of everything before it happens, Tony may not become Iron Man, which would be a huge disservice to the world. While Peter was waiting for the flash drive to finish stealing the information on Stain's crimes and plans, the door's handle jiggled. Someone tried to open the door, but it didn't budge thanks to Peter's spell. Knock knock, hello, who's in there? Peter heard Stain's voice ask from the other side of the door. Housekeeping. Peter answered in a fake high-pitched voice. Contact security. There's an intruder in Tony's office. Obadiah yells from the other side of the door. Smirking at the situation, Peter waits patiently for the flash drive to finish. Meanwhile, he could hear constant banging as the security guards arrived and tried their best to kick the door open. Sadly for them, the spell Peter placed on the door was keeping it locked and unbreakable. At least, to normal humans. By the time the download was finished, the security team brought a small explosive to blow the door open. This is the headquarters of a weapons manufacturer's company, after all. Boom, the door was blown open and a group of heavily armed security forces rushed in the room like a trained group of Navy SEALs. Walking behind them was Obadiah, who entered the room without a care in the world. On the ground now. Hands where I can see them. They yelled and swiftly cleared the room, finding nobody but themselves inside. Walking over to the computer, Stain moved the mouse, causing the screen to light up. Download complete, damn it. Obadiah yells as he turns to the security. Lock down the building. I want this person found and brought to me. A portal opens in Tony's house as Peter steps out, finding Tony and Pepper drinking wine on the couch. They seemed very close for a boss and his assistant. I feel like I just walked into the start of a porno. Peter comments, causing the two to instantly slide away from one another. It's not like that. Pepper seemed embarrassed. Did it go well? Tony ignores the situation and changes the subject. Yup, here you go. Peter says and tosses the flash drive to Tony. All three of them move to the workshop, where Tony plugged the flash drive in and saw the plethora of proof, showing the many crimes and betrayals that the Stark family friend, Obadiah Stain has committed. A video showing Raza, who is now deceased, speaking to Stain plays. You did not tell us that the target you paid us to kill was the great Tony Stark. As you can see, Obadiah Stain. Oh, my god. Pepper mutters in shock. Your deception and lies will cost you dearly. The price to kill Tony Stark has just gone up. 
As the video ends, Tony stood rooted in silence as he stared at the screen with a sad and hurt look on his face. Obadiah was practically an uncle to him growing up, so this turn of events was truly shocking. The man may have locked him out of his company and sold guns off the books, but Tony didn't expect the guy to be the one behind his kidnapping. Well, technically he wanted Tony dead. Tony are you okay? Pepper asks as she places a comforting hand on his shoulder. Ah? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Tony mutters as he looks at the rest of the evidence. Sector 16? It looks like that's where he's building his own version of your suit. Peter comments as he sees the blueprints for Tony's first suit alongside new blueprints for the Iron Munger armor. He doesn't have a power source, so he's planning to use my dad's giant arc reactor. Tony mutters as he sees that Sector 16 is underneath the giant arc reactor that powers Stark Industry headquarters. You should be careful, Tony. I wouldn't put it past him to try and steal your mini arc reactor. He seems like the kind of guy to snatch it right out of your chest. Peter comments, knowing that Stain did that in the movie. I'm sure he will want his suit to be wireless sooner rather than later. Hearing what Peter said, Pepper suddenly had a bad premonition. Oh? She muttered. What is it? Tony asked. I didn't destroy your first reactor. She says, talking about the one Tony told her to incinerate. It's in my office. What? Why? Tony asks incredulously. I was going to get it put in a display case and give it to you as a gift, but I never got around to it. Pepper explains as she smacks her hand onto her forehead. Do you think Stain would find it? What do we have here? Obadiah comments as a security officer brings him a small palm-sized arc reactor. We searched the building for the intruder, but found nobody out of place. The officer says as he gestures to Tony's first act reactor. That was found in Ms. Potts' office. Hmm, thank you, Pepper. Let's just assume that he has it. Peter says with a shrug. It's not that big of a deal either way. With me and Tony's combined strength, we can take care of this easily. You're right, let's head out and catch this son of a bitch. Tony says as he walks over to his armor, which still had a few bullet holes in it. Jarvis, when will my suit be ready? It will be ready in half an hour, sir. Jarvis responded as the machines in the room began working in the armor. Good, we'll be upstairs. Notify me when it's done. As the three of them walk upstairs, the doorbell rings, and a video of the front door appears on the TV, showing Agent Coulson waiting patiently. This guy can't take a hint, can he? Tony mutters as he ignores the doorbell. Poor Coulson. Peter thought as he walked to the door and opened it. Tony wanted to stop him but the door was opened before he could speak or move. Mr. SDA? Coulson starts but sees someone he didn't expect. Spider-Man, you weren't kidding when you said Tony was your friend, huh? No, come inside, we have a lot to discuss. Webhead, is there a reason why you let a government agent into my home? Tony asks as Peter and Coulson walk into the living room. I know Coulson. Peter says with a shrug. Hello to you too, Mr. Stark. Coulson says with an exasperated smile. You missed our meeting at your company. You know, it was quite weird. While I was waiting in the lobby, the whole place went into lockdown. Hearing this, both Tony and Pepper look towards Peter, who scratched the back of his head, nervously. I may have pretended to be housekeeping while stealing the information you wanted. No one saw me though. Peter says, causing Tony and Pepper to sigh and roll their eyes at him. Stealing information? Coulson asks from the side. See what you've done? Tony says to Peter as he points at Coulson. Now the government is involved. S.H.I.E.L.D. is an extra government agency. We work beyond the province, powers, or proper sphere of any government. Coulson explains. What happened to the long-winded name? Strategic homeland intervention and whatever other nonsense. Tony asks mockingly. We decided to abbreviate. Coulson answers simply. I've worked with S.H.I.E.L.D. here and there. They aren't too bad. I wouldn't trust them, but they usually try to help. At least from what I've seen so far. Peter explains, causing Coulson to look at him. You still don't trust us? He asks in exasperation. I trust Natasha a little bit and you even less, but other than that, the rest of you are strangers to me. I tend not to put my trust in government agencies, especially the ones with no accountability, as you just so eloquently explained to Tony only moments ago. Peter responds with a shrug. Who's Natasha? Is that your girlfriend? Tony asks, knowing Peter is in a relationship from their many sleepless nights spent together working on his Iron Man suit. No, she's a friend, who teaches me martial arts. She works for S.H.I.E.L.D. Peter clarifies and swiftly changes the subject. Jarvis, can you make a copy of all incriminating evidence pertaining to Obadiah Stane for our extra government friend here? I'm afraid that I'll need Mr. Stark's permission for that. Jarvis answers through the speakers of the house. 
You just said we shouldn't trust S.H.I.E.L.D., so why should we give them anything? Tony asks. That doesn't mean they can't make themselves useful. We can go and stop Stain, as he probably has his armor finished by now. Once we've captured him, Coulson here can clean up after us. Peter pats Phil on the shoulder. Trust me, as a superhero you don't want to do the clean up. That's the boring part, which is better left to people like Coulson. Fine, Jarvis give him only the evidence, no blueprints or any other sensitive information. Tony agrees. How did I get relegated to the maid? Coulson asked with a sigh. It's either that or you aren't involved at all. Peter shrugs. Coulson could do nothing but agree as Tony brought him a flash drive filled with evidence against Stain. While Phil was going over the evidence, Jarvis spoke through the speakers. Mr. Stark, your suit is fully prepared. As the sun set outside Stark Industries headquarters, a portal opened on the rooftop, and out walked Peter and Tony, dressed in their respective superhero suits. Before the portal could even close, Peter heard the sound of guns cocking behind him. Acting quickly, Peter backflipped and appeared over the heads of four armed guards. Shooting a web at two of them, Peter grabs the other end and pulls, swinging the two guards off of their feet and slamming them onto the concrete rooftop. Asterisk bam. Bam, asterisk, it seems they upped the security since my last visit. Peter mutters as Tony flies over and smashes the other two guards into the ground with his robot hands. Obi probably knows we're here. Tony comments as the four guards nap quietly on the ground. You lead the way. I don't know where I'm going in this place. Peter gestures for Tony to take the lead. All right, keep up. Tony says as he soars into the air and shoots down into the building, creating his own entrances along the way. You'd think he would care more about his own building. Peter mutters as he jumps through the holes left by Tony. When he got through the very last hole, Peter found Tony walking around a dark engineer's workshop, with wires, tools, and computer monitors everywhere. Hey, look at your first suit. Peter calls out. Tony turns to see his Mark I suit, standing with a bunch of wires and other instruments attached to it. They must have used it as a reference to make this. Tony says as he points at a nearby monitor, which showed the blueprint of the Iron Munger armor. But where's that? Peter asks as he turns to see eyes light up in a nearby dark corner. Found it. Stomp 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 heavy metallic steps are heard as a huge Hulk-like figure steps into the light. The figure of Iron Munger towers over Peter and Tony. Insert picture of MCU Iron Munger here, Tony. Obadiah's metallic voice echoes from inside the giant suit of power armor. I see you brought Spider-Man as well. No matter, neither of you will survive the night. Iron Munger rushes forward and tries to grab Peter and Tony in each hand. Tony uses his hand thrusters to burst himself backward, while Peter simply hopped onto Iron Munger's head, kicking off into the ceiling. Calm down, big guy. You're destroying company property. Peter comments as he shoots some webs around Iron Munger's legs, causing Stain to trip as he ran after Tony. Bang the floor caves in as the titanic figure of Iron Munger smashes onto the ground. You annoying bug. Stain exclaims as he spreads his legs, easily breaking the webs. Spiders aren't bugs. Peter corrects as he shoots off the ceiling and stomps on Iron Munger's metal head. They're arachnids. Tag out. Tony yelled as he charges up his hand blasters, pointing them at Peter and Stain. Listening to Tony, Peter kicked off Stain's head and got out of the way. As Iron Munger got back to his feet, Tony was there waiting and blasted his palm thrusters at full power. When the blast made contact with Iron Munger's metal shell, Stain was sent flying up into the ceiling, breaking floors, walls, and ceilings on his way outside of the building and into the parking lot. Landing on a row of cars and crushing them completely, their alarms blare as Iron Munger uses a nearby Prius to prop himself up and get back to his feet, flattening it in the process. I love this suit. Stain yells as he brushes car parts from his metal body. All that damage and I'm perfectly fine. Grabbing a car in each hand, Iron Munger launches them at Peter and Tony, as they follow the trail of carnage leading to the parking lot. Peter easily dodged his car as he has spider senses, but Tony was hit directly and launched back into the building. For 30 years, I've been holding you up. I built this company from nothing. Nothing is going to stand in my way. Least of all, you and some insect. Stain yells angrily as multiple rockets appear on his shoulders. Instantly, he shoots two rockets each toward Peter and Tony, who just came flying out of the building with a headlight hanging off his arm. Peter relies on his spider senses to dodge while redirecting his two rockets back at Iron Munger with his webs. Tony, on the other hand, used his HUD to lock onto his two rockets and shot them with guns that extended out of his shoulders. Boom boom as Peter's rockets came crashing down on Iron Munger, Peter and Tony waited for the smoke to clear and found that Stain's suit only took some minor damage. 
losing only a couple of metal plates on his arms, which he used to block the impacts and explosions. Tony began to hover in the air, wanting to use his flight advantage against Stain. Though it didn't go the way he wanted. Impressive. You've upgraded your armor. I've made some upgrades of my own as well. Stain says as he launches off the ground with similar hands and feet thrusters to Tony's suit. Knowing that Tony will take it from here, Peter steps aside as he watches Iron Man lead Iron Munger further and further into the sky. Peter could have ended this fight the moment he saw the Iron Munger suit in the Sector 16 workshop, but Tony needs to be the one to win. Not Peter. After waiting a while, the two figures disappeared high into the clouds, but soon enough, one of them comes crashing down. An iced-over Iron Munger comes crashing back into the parking lot in front of Peter, who knew this would happen. Tony fixed the ice problem with his suit already, but Stain didn't even know about that the problem existed. Walking over to the downed and icy figure of Stain's armor, Peter dug his hand into its chest and yanked out the Mark I arc reactor, cutting any power that was going to the suit. Soon after, Tony landed next to Peter, and they both looked at the powerless Iron Munger, wondering if Stain was still alive. While staring at the powerless Iron Munger suit, which may or may not contain a living Obadiah Stain, black unmarked government-type vehicles pulled into the parking lot. As they parked, agents in black suits unloaded from the cars and began to secure the area. They had good timing, as the streets outside Stark Industries were filling with witnesses. Most of them were recording on their phones and had been recording since the fight was taken to the parking lot. News vans were pulling up as well, with reporters and cameramen stepping out, ready to give live updates to their respective news channels. You made quite the mess. Coulson calls out as he walks over with Natasha following closely behind him. Well, that's why we have you, the shield maid service. Peter jokes as he leans his arm on Tony's shoulder. Hello, Spidey. Natasha greets him for the first time since Peter met Tony. Hello. Peter responds curtly. You, I feel the drama in the air. Tony comments with a smirk. Are you sure she isn't your girlfriend? No, she just broke my trust and has yet to apologize. Peter says, looking at Natasha. Maybe you two should have this conversation at a later date. Coulson interrupts as he points over at the downed iron munger suit. Is Mr. Stain in that? Yes, we took the power source out as well. Peter holds up the glowing arc reactor in his hand. We're just not sure if he's alive or not. Well, let's not check here with all of the cameras nearby. Natasha says as she gestures to the huge hole in the side of the building. Drag him inside and crack it open. If he's alive, we'll take him into custody. What if he's dead? Tony asks sadly as the man was very close to him and his deceased family. No matter what happened, those feelings don't just go away in a single night. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. You've all received the official statement of what occurred at Stark Industries last night. There have been unconfirmed reports that a robotic prototype malfunctioned and caused damage to the building. Fortunately, a member of Tony Stark's personal security staff, James Rhodes, Tony's military friend, spoke at a press conference in Stark Industries, where Tony held his upon his return to LA after his kidnapping. In the very same building, Tony sat in his office, reading a newspaper with the front page headline titled, Who is the Iron Man? Iron Man. Tony reads the front page as he turns to Peter, who's in his spider suit, seated at Tony's desk with his feet up. That's kind of catchy. You were right, Webhead. The media did come up with a good name. It's got a nice ring to it. I mean, it's not technically accurate. The suit's a gold titanium alloy, but it's kind of evocative, you know. While Tony was reading the paper, Pepper was applying some minor makeup. Tony would be addressing the press after James Rhodes, so he wanted to look his best. Especially since he needed to cover up some bruises from last night's fight. Yeah, it's their job to pick compelling titles and names. Not everyone can be like me and choose their own name. Peter says jokingly. Here's your alibi, Mr. Stark. Coulson walks into the room and hands Tony a written speech for the press conference. Okay? Tony mutters as he puts down the newspaper and looks over what S.H.I.E.L.D. wrote for him. You were on your yacht. Coulson explains, getting a nod from Tony. We have poured papers that put you in Avalon all night, and sworn statements from 50 of your guests. See, I was thinking maybe we should say it was just Pepper and me alone on an island. Tony says suggestively as he gives Pepper a heated look. That's what happened. Coulson, points at the paper, not having any of Tony's bullshit. Just read it, word for word. Nothing more. Nothing less. There's nothing about Stain here. Tony asks, sadness flashing on his face for only a moment. After getting the Iron Munger suit inside Stark Industries, Peter and Tony pried the thing open and found Stain dead inside. The impact from his icy fall caused the suit to cave in onto his chest, crushing his lungs. 
Stain pretty much died from internal bleeding and suffocation, which probably wasn't a quick and painless death. That's being handled. He's on vacation. Small aircrafts have such a poor safety record. Carlson says insinuatingly, which causes Tony to ask more questions. This isn't my first rodeo, Mr. Stark. Just stick to the official statement, and soon enough, this will all be behind you. As Pepper finishes Tony's makeup, the two start flirting with one another. While they were off in their own world, Natasha walks in and strolls right up to Peter. I'm sorry. She says immediately. I technically didn't lie to you, since I was told the satellite was out of range, but I knew that didn't sound right. It may be my job to do these sorts of things, but we're, friends. I should have said something and I'm sorry. Apology accepted. Peter says, shocking Natasha who thought he wouldn't forgive her so easily. Surprised? I knew the whole satellite thing was fishy the second I heard it. Besides, S.H.I.E.L.D. knowing about my portal-making ability isn't that big of a deal. Thank you, it won't happen again. Natasha says genuinely but Peter holds up his hand, stopping her. That's the second time I've heard those words from you. Peter says, pertaining to their first meeting. Make it the last, please. Peter's words rang out in Natasha's mind as she swore to herself to not ruin this friendship. She doesn't have many friends and the feeling of betraying them is much worse compared to your average oligarch or enemy spy. Peter wouldn't trust her just yet, as she would have to prove herself, but hopefully, she can become someone he can rely on and trust more in the future. When the time finally arrived, Tony went up on stage, taking the podium in front of countless reporters and news cameras, which were covering this whole thing live on every news channel. Peter was hidden off stage with Coulson, Rhodes, Pepper, and Natasha, watching from the sidelines. It has been a while since I was in front of you. I figure I'll stick to the script this time. There's been speculation that I was involved in the events that occurred at Stark Industries. Tony starts reading the pre-written speech, but a reporter interrupts him. I'm sorry, Mr. Stark, but do you honestly expect us to believe that last night's incident was a bodyguard in a suit that conveniently appeared, even though your friend, Spider-Man, was fighting alongside? The reporter voices everyone's doubts but was interrupted as well. I know that it's confusing. It's one thing to question the official story, and another entirely to make wild accusations, or insinuate that I'm a superhero. Tony says with a smirk as he says superhero. I never said you were a superhero. The reporter replies. You didn't? Well, good, because that would be outlandish and fantastic. I'm just not the hero type. Clearly, with this laundry list of character defects, all the mistakes I've made, largely public. Just stick to the cards. Coulson mutters with a sigh. I don't think that's Tony's style. Peter comments as he waits for the moment to happen. The truth is. I am Iron Man. Tony throws the pre-written speech over his shoulder as the room fills with questions from the reporters. Peter walks out on stage and puts his arm around Tony's shoulder. I am Spider-Man too. Peter says as he throws up a peace sign at the many cameras. Did you have to ruin my moment, webhead? Tony mutters, but there's a microphone in front of them so everyone watching heard him. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Peter laughs awkwardly. This moment was one of the coolest in the first Iron Man movie. Instead of hiding his identity like Peter, Tony just outs himself on live television. As Peter and Tony left the stage, the world welcomed the entrance of its second superhero. Well, the second living superhero. Although Captain America is technically alive, he's still frozen in ice somewhere. Do you understand the massive shitstorm you just brought to your front door? Coulson asks, annoyed that the speech and alibi he spent hours sleeplessly crafting were disregarded. Sorry, it just wasn't my style. Tony says as he walks past Coulson. I told you so. Peter says with a laugh as he follows after Tony. Jarvis. Tony calls out as he and Peter walk through a portal and into his mansion. Welcome home. Jarvis speaks in a distorted voice which soon cuts out. I am Iron Man. A familiar voice fills the room. Do you two idiots really think that you're the only superheroes in the world? Who the hell are you? Tony asks with his guard up. Is that you, angry boss man? Peter asks, knowing that it's Fury. Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. The voice says as Fury steps out of a dark corner, revealing himself and sending a nod in greeting towards Peter. Spider-Man. Ah. Tony grunts nonchalantly. I'm here to talk to you two about the Avengers initiative. Fury, who just broken into Tony's mansion, reveals as he holds up a folder. Oh, do I finally get to know what the Avengers thing is all about? Peter exclaimed as he rushed over to Fury and snatched the folder. Hey! Fury shouted, trying to take the folder back, but Peter already made his way back across the room. What's this all about? Tony mutters as he pours himself a drink and takes a seat next to Peter, who was flipping through the many pages in the file Fury brought. 
I know just about as much as you. I've only heard of this Avengers thing because the angry Cyclops over there let it slip when we first met. Peter explains as Tony reads over his shoulder. The Avengers Initiative is a program created to bring together a group of remarkable people to face extraordinary threats. Fury explains as he takes a seat across from Peter and Tony. The Avengers Initiative, which was originally conceptualized as the Protector Initiative or Phase 1, is a project created by S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury to form the Avengers. A response team comprised of the most remarkable individuals humankind has to offer. The Avengers Initiative is supposed to defend the Earth from imminent global threats that are beyond the war-fighting capability of conventional military forces. Fury continues. What could you possibly be expecting to happen? Tony asks incredulously. This seems like you're preparing for some alien invasion or something. Says the man who just fought a villain in a giant metal suit of power armor. Just saying that makes me think we live in some type of comic book world. Fury comments with an annoyed look. The universe we live in is a lot more complicated than you would like to believe. One instance doesn't prove that we need to form some team of superheroes to handle non-existent threats. Tony explains as he takes the folder from Peter's hands and tosses it toward Fury. Hey, I was reading that. Peter snaps in annoyance. What? Don't tell me that you're buying this bullshit. Tony asks incredulously. This is obviously just a scheme to get any powerful people to be under the government in some way. Before Peter could reply, Fury took out another folder from his black trench coat. I knew you would be doubtful, so I brought the report of something that happened in 1995. Fury says as he hands over the folder. He wouldn't. Peter thought as he took the folder. Opening it up, Peter began reading through the heavily redacted sheets of paper. He was surprised to find it filled with information on the events that took place in the Captain Marvel movie. Carol Danvers' name seemed to be redacted alongside many other things, but it pretty much depicted the small invasion of two alien races. The Kree and the Skrull. The Kree are a militaristic race of mostly blue-skinned humanoids from the planet Hala. One of the most technically advanced races in the galaxy, the Kree are skilled in genetic engineering and are responsible for the creation of the Inhumans on Earth. Though that wasn't mentioned in the file. Politically, they are a powerful intergalactic state, controlling a vast fascist empire. Meanwhile, the Skrulls are a technologically advanced race of reptilian humanoids, native to the destroyed planet Skrulls. They are notable for their shape-shifting abilities, which allow them to replicate other life forms seamlessly, and infiltrate planets without suspicion. These two races are in a constant state of war, where the Kree military is hunting down any living Skrull refugees they could find. The conflict is completely one-sided, with the Skrulls being the victims of the Kree's genocidal war. No information about the Skrull's shape-shifting ability was mentioned in the file, which means it was most likely redacted. If Peter remembers correctly, some of the Skrulls stayed on Earth, with many of them joining S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury probably wants to keep their ability a secret, as someone who can shapeshift probably makes the perfect spy. Just look at Mystique from the X-Men. Another thing that seemed to be heavily redacted, or most likely not included in the report was the involvement of the Tesseract, but Peter expected that. Wow, aliens, huh? Peter comments as he looks at the many photos in the folder, which depicted some scroll and Kree corpses alongside a spaceship and other proof. What? Tony exclaimed as he snatched the file from Peter's hand for the second time. Dude, if you keep doing that, Peter says menacingly. Oh, calm down, webhead. Tony shook his head as he started reading. After a minute of silence, Tony finished reading the file. Prove it. Tony says and tosses the file on the coffee table between them. How would you like me to do that, Mr. Stark? Fury asks with a smirk. He knew that with just this little bit of information that Tony and Spider-Man would at least take him seriously. After seeing proof of hostile advanced alien races, who wouldn't feel the need for precautions. These pictures show corpses. Tony says as he leans over and spreads the folder, showing the pictures. You had to have preserved them. Show me. Fine. After a moment of silent thought, Fury took out his phone and made a short phone call. Send the Quinjet to my location. After those short words, Fury hung up and looked toward Peter and Tony. Are we going to a secret shield lair? Peter asked. More like a shield facility, but yes. Fury nods. After only a few minutes of waiting, where Tony and Fury engaged in some sort of prick measuring contest, Peter heard the sound of a jet engine over the mansion. As soon as he heard it, the engine sound disappeared and was replaced by the sound of a propeller going off. Looking out the window, they all saw the Quinjet land in Tony's spacious backyard. The fans on its wings allow the jet to maneuver like a helicopter. Insert picture of the Quinjet cause why not? Come on. Fury calls out as he walks toward the jet. Tony looked hesitant, but Peter patted him on the back. Don't sissy out now. 
This was your idea, after all. Peter says as he drags Tony to the jet. I'm not. I just don't trust this guy. Tony says. It's okay, if he tries anything, then I'll save you. We all know you're useless without your suit, after all. Peter says as he steps into the Quinjet, taking a seat across from Fury. Sighing reluctantly and annoyed by Peter's comment, Tony steps onto the jet and sits beside Peter. After a short and fast flight, the Quinjet flew low in a desert area and was headed straight at a rocky cliffside. Oh, is your secret lair on the side of that cliff? Peter says in awe as a portion of the cliffside opens up and the Quinjet flies inside. Eh, I could do better. Tony mutters, clearly not as impressed as Peter. As a group of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents come to welcome their arrival, the jet enters a huge hangar and lands beside some other aircraft, good evening, director. One of them says as he saluted. Can I be of any assistance? Take us to cold storage. Fury orders as the man motions for them to follow and leads the way. After going down a very long elevator, they arrived at their floor and the agents that accompanied them turned back. They didn't have the clearance level to enter this area. Following Fury down a hallway, he took them into a room, which was locked behind passcodes and key card access. Inside, Peter saw many big glass vats filled with cold blue liquid and the bodies of both Kree and Skrull corpses. Insert pictures of Skrull and Kree people here, interesting. Peter mutters as he rushes over to a control terminal PC and starts typing. You won't be able to. Fury says, as the lock screen on the PC is instantly bypassed. How did you do that? Shut up, he's working. Tony says as he walks over and watches Peter with an impressed look. Suddenly, a video of an autopsy of the bodies was played, showing the alien insides alongside commentary of the scientists working on the Kree and Skrull bodies. I would say I believe now. Peter comments as he passed the videos and turns to Tony. How about you? Same, I never thought we were alone in the universe, but this is just, crazy. Tony says as he walks up to the glass vats and looks over the alien bodies. I'd like to perform my own tests on the bodies, but that can wait for another day. Do I have your cooperation for the Avengers initiative now? He asks with a smirk, as if he already won them over. Sure. Tony says, but Peter places a hand on his shoulder, stopping him. Don't give in so easily. Let's talk terms. Peter says, instantly wiping the smirk from Fury's smug face. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.